STORY XIII. OF THE BEST BRITISH SHORT STORIES OF 1922. THIS IS A LIBRIVOX RECORDING. ALL LIBRIVOX RECORDINGS ARE IN THE PUBLIC DOMAIN. FOR MORE INFORMATION OR TO VOLUNTEER, PLEASE VISIT LIBRIVOX.ORG. RECORDING BY DAVID WALES. THE BEST BRITISH SHORT STORIES OF 1922. BY VARIOUS. STORY XIII. THE LIE. BY HOLLOWAY HORN. From the Blue Magazine, 1922. The hours had passed with the miraculous rapidity which tinctures time when one is on the river, and now overhead the moon was a gorgeous yellow lantern in a grayish purple sky. The punt was moored at the lower end of Glover's Island on the Middlesex side, and rose and fell gently on the ebbing tide. A girl was lying back amidst the cushions, her hands behind her head, looking up through the vague tracery of leaves to the soft moonlight. Even in the garish day she was pretty, but in that enchanting dimness she was wildly beautiful. The hint of strength around her mouth was not quite so evident, perhaps. Her hair was the color of oaten straw in autumn, and her deep blue eyes were dark in the gathering night. But despite her beauty, the man's face was averted from her. He was gazing out across the smoothly flowing water, troubled and thoughtful. A good-looking face, but not so strong as the girl's, in spite of her prettiness and enormously less vital. Ten minutes before he had proposed to her and had been rejected. It was not the first time, but he had been very much more hopeful than on the other occasions. The air was softly, embracingly warm that evening. Together they had watched the lengthening shadows creep out across the old river. And it was spring still, which makes a difference. There is something in the year's youth. The sap is rising in the plants. Something there is, anyway beyond the sentimentality of the poets. And overhead was the great yellow lantern gleaming at them through the branches with ironic approval. But in spite of everything, she had shaken her head, and all he received was the maddening assurance that she liked him. I shall never marry, she had concluded. Never. You know why. Yes, I know, the man said miserably, Carruthers. And so he was looking out moodily, almost savagely, across the water when the temptation came to him. He would not have minded quite so much if Carruthers had been alive, but he was dead, and slept in the now silent salient where a little cross marked his bed. Alive, one could have striven against him striven desperately, although Carruthers had always been rather a proposition. But now it seemed hopeless. A man cannot strive with a memory. It was not fair, so the man's thoughts were running. He had shared Carruthers' risks, although he had come back. This persistent and exclusive devotion to a man who would never return to her was morbid. Suddenly, his mind was made up. Olive, he said. Yes, she replied quietly. What I am going to tell you I do for both our sakes. You will probably think I'm a cad, but I'm taking the risk. He was sitting up, but did not meet her eyes. What on earth are you talking about? she demanded. You know that, apart from you, Carruthers and I were pals. Yes, she said, wondering. And suddenly she burst out petulantly, What is it you want to say? He was no better than other men, he replied bluntly. It is wrong that you should sacrifice your life to a memory, wrong that you should worship an idol with feet of clay. I loathe parables, she said coldly. Will you tell me exactly what you mean about feet of clay? The note in her voice was not lost on the man by her side. I don't like telling you. Under other conditions I wouldn't. 
but I do it for both our sakes." "Then, for goodness' sake, do it!" "I came across it accidentally at the Gordon Hotel, at Brighton. He stayed there, whilst he was engaged to you, with a lady whom he described as Mrs. Carruthers. It was on his last leave." "Why do you tell me this?" she asked after a silence. Her voice was low, and a little husky. "Surely, my dear, you must see. He was no better than other men. The ideal you have conjured up is no ideal. He was a brave soldier, a darned brave soldier, and, until we both fell in love with you, my pal. But it is not fair that his memory should absorb you. It's... it's unnatural." "'I suppose you think I should be indignant.' There was no emotion of any kind in her voice. "'I simply want you to see that your idol has feet of clay,' he said, with the stubbornness of a man who feels he is losing. "'What has that to do with it? You know I loved him.' "'Other girls have loved,' he said bitterly. "'And forgotten. Yes, I know,' she interrupted him. "'But I do not forget. That is all. But after what I have told you, surely, you see, I knew, she said, even more quietly than before. You knew? Yes, it was I who was with him. It was his last leave, she added thoughtfully. And only the faint noise of the water and the wistful wind in the trees overhead broke the silence. End of story 13 Story 14 of The Best British Short Stories of 1922 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales The Best British Short Stories of 1922 by Various STORY Fourteen, A GIRL IN IT by Roland Kinney From The New Age, 1922 I was just cooking a couple of two-eyed steaks when Black Mick walked in, and noting the look in his eyes, and being for some reason in an expansive mood, I offered him a sit-down. After comparing notes on the various possibilities of the district with regard to job-getting, we turned on to a discussion of the relative moralities of begging and stealing. But in this, I found, Mick was not vitally interested. Both were too deeply immoral for him to touch. For Mick was a worker. He liked work. Vagrancy to him made no appeal. To settle down was his one definite desire. But Jobs refused to hold him, and the road gripped him in spite of himself. So the problem presented itself to him in an abstract way only. To me there was a real... but let that go. Mick's respectability was uncanny. He could speculate on these things as if they were matters affecting none of us there. In that fourpenny doss house he remained as aloof as a god, and in some vague way the calmness of the man in face of this infringing realism for a time repelled me. We cleaned up my packet to the last shred and crumb, and I found a couple of fag-ends in my pocket. We smoked silently. Mick's manner gradually affected me we became somehow mentally detached from the place in which we sat. We were in a corner of the room, at the end of the longest table, and so incurious about the rest of the company that neither of us knew whether there were two or twenty men there. For a while Mick was absorbed in his smoke, and then I saw him slowly turn his head to the door. It was a languid movement. His dark eyes were half-veiled as he watched for the entrance of some one who fumbled at the latch. Then, in an instant, as the face of the newcomer thrust forward, Black Mick's whole personality seemed to change. 
his eyelids lifted, showing great glowing eyes staring from a cold set face. His back squared, and the table, clamped to the floor, creaked protestingly as his sprawled legs were drawn up and the knees pressed against the under part. A second only he stared, then slung himself full forward. The newcomer was a live man, quicker than Mick. The recognition between the two was apparently mutual, for as Mick vaulted the table, the other rushed forward, grabbed the poker from the grate, and got home on Mick's head with it. Before I could get near enough to grip, the door again banged and our visitor had disappeared. There was a girl in it, said Mick to me when we took the road together a fortnight later, and that was as far as he got in explanation. It was enough. I could read men a little. To Mick, women, all women, were sacred creatures. In the scheme of nature, woman was good and man was evil. Passion was a male attribute, an evil fire that scorched and burned and rendered impotent the protesting innocence of hapless femininity. So we tramped. One public works after the other we made, always with the same result, no chance of a take-on. Often we got a lift in food, ale, or even cash from some gang where one of us was known, but that was all. Everywhere the reply to our request for a job was the same, full up, and then we made Liverpool. My favorite kip in Liverpool was Bevington House in the Scotland Road district, but on this occasion I had news that Twin Toes, an old mate of mine, had taken in that night at a private doss house and the probability was that he would not only give us a lift, but would be able to tell us pretty accurately what was the state of the labor market. It was a rotten kip. Four men were squabbling over the frying pan when we entered, and over against the far wall sat an old crone crooning an Irish song. The men were of the ordinary dock rat type, scraggly built, unshaven, with cunning, shifty eyes. The woman had an old, browned green kerchief round her head, and a ragged shawl drawn tightly round her breasts. One side of her face had evidently been burned some time, and the eye on that side ran continually. "'Got any money, dearie?' she said to Mick. "'No, mother,' Mick replied gently, taking her hand. "'Is there a fellow here called Twintoes?' No blurry youth to me of no money, and she went on with her damnable singing, like a lost soul wailing for its natural hell. The boss came in from the kitchen. Twin toes? Damned funny moniker. Never heerd it, he said. But there's a bloke asleep upstairs as calls hisself Brum. Maybe it's him. It was. Twin toes lay in his navvy clobber on a dirty bed drunk, dead to the world. We could not rouse him. What a kennel, said Mick. There's a smell about it I don't like. There was a smell, not the common musty smell of cheap doss houses, something much worse than that. You pay your fourpence and takes your choice, I said, with an intended grandiloquent sweep of my hand towards the dozen derelict beds. We selected two that lay in an alcove at the end of the room farthest from the door, and turned in. In a few minutes we were both asleep. Suddenly I woke. A clock outside struck one. There was no sound in the room but the now subdued snoring of twin toes. I was at once wide awake, but I lay quite still, breathing as naturally as possible, keeping my eyes more than half closed, for I felt some sinister presence in the room. A new pollution affected the atmosphere. Bending over me was the old crone. Downstairs she had seemed aimless, shapeless, almost helpless, an object of disgusting pitifulness. Now, dark as it was, and unexpected as was the visit, 
I could at once see that she was as active and alert as a monkey. On going to bed I had put my boots under my pillow and thrown my coat over me, keeping the cuff of one sleeve in my hand. A practiced claw slipped under my head and deftly fingered the insides of my boots. Blank. The coat pockets were next examined. Blank. Still I dog-slept. The wrinkled lips were now working angrily, churning up two specks of foam that shone white in the corners of the mouth. The running eye rained tears of rage down her left cheek, and the other one glowed and dulled, a winking red spark in the gloom, as she looked quickly up and down the bed. Her left hand hung down by her side, the arm tense. Then, as she slipped her right hand under the clothes in an effort to go over the rest of me, I gave a half-turn and a low sleep-moan to warn her off. At once the left hand shot up over my head, the lean fingers clutching a foot of lead pipe. Again I tried to appear sound asleep. With eyes tight shut I lay still. I dared not move. One glimpse of that tortured face had shown me that I could hope for nothing. The utter folly of mercy, or half-measures, was fully understood. Yet effort was impossible. I was simply and completely afraid. The lead pipe did not, however, meet my skull. Hearing a slight scuffle, I peeped out to find that there were now two figures in the gloom. The boss had crept up, seized the hag's left arm, and was pointing to the door. She held back, and in silent pantomime showed that Mick had not been gone over yet. With her free hand she gathered her one skirt over her dirty skinny knees and danced with rage by the side of my bed. She looked like the parody of some carrion creature seen in the nightmare of a starving man. The most terrible thing about her was her amazing silence. The mad dance of her stockinged feet on the bare boards made no sound. The boss loosened his hold on her wrist, but took away the lead pipe from her, and she slipped over to Mick. Again those skinny claws went through their evolutions with uncanny silence and effect, whilst I lay, every muscle taut, ready to spring up if occasion required. My nerve had returned, and now that the piece of lead pipe was in the hands of the less fiendish partner of this strange concern, I was ready to wade in. But she found nothing, and Mick slept on. We were too poor to rob, but this only enraged her the more. Her fingers twisted themselves into the shawl at her breast, and she silently but vehemently spat at Mick's head as she moved away. For half an hour I tried in vain to sleep, and then the boss again appeared. This time he bore a huge bulk of patched and soiled canvas, part of an old sail, which he hung from the ceiling across the middle of the room, thus shutting off twin toes, Mick and myself, from that part where was the door on to the stairs. He was not noisy, but he made no attempt to keep the previous death stillness of the house. As the boss descended the stairs, a surprising thing happened, and Mick awoke. Girlish laughter rippled up the stairs. God Almighty, said Mick, what's that? Again it came, and with it the gurgling of the old woman. It was impossible and incredible, that mingling in the fetid air of those two sounds, as if the babble of clear spring water had suddenly broken into and merged with the turgid roll of a city sewer. Mick sat up. But this is bloody, he said. Wait, was all I replied. We waited. Mick slipped out of bed carefully opened his knife, and made a few judicious slits in the veiling canvas. My senses had become abnormally acute. 
I seemed to hear every shade of sound within and without the house. I could sense, I imagined, the very positions in which sat the persons in the kitchen below. Even Twintoes was affected by the tense atmosphere. He murmured in his sleep and seemed somewhat sobered, for his limbs took more natural positions on the bed. The darkness was no longer a bar to vision. By now I could see quite clearly, and so, I believe, could Mick. The old woman was mumbling to the girl. "'That's all right, me there. Have a drink of this. We'll all fix you up right.' She had again dropped into the low, uncertain voice of aimless senility. The girl remained silent. Glasses clinked. The boss, I could hear, walked up and down the kitchen, busy with some final work of the night. A confused murmur came from another corner, but I could not distinguish the words. The dock rats were apparently discussing something. Again that ripple of sound ascended the stairs, but this time there was an added note of apprehension. It broke very faintly but pitifully before dying away to the sound of light footsteps. Half a dozen stairs were pressed, then came a stumble, and a girlish ah! She recovered herself as the hateful voice from behind said, All right, my dear, and older, surer feet felt the stairs and pushed on behind the girl. Through the veiling canvas and the old walls I seemed to see the pair ascending. A few seconds more, and a slight form rounded the jamb of the door. The girl's eyes blinked in the walled twilight of the room. She hesitated on the threshold, but only for a second. The touch of a following frame impelled her forward. Her uncertain foot caught against a bed leg, and a white hand gripped the steadying rail. Long-nailed claws laced themselves in the fingers of her other hand, and the old woman half drew, half twisted her, into sitting down on the edge of the bed. They began to talk quietly. I examined them more closely. The old crone still played the part of ancient childhood, mumbling words of little import and obscenely fingering the girl's arms, head, and waist. Some instinct led her to veil her eyes from the girl, for from those differing orbs gleamed all the wickedness of her mangled and distorted soul. Fountains rained from her left eye, whilst the right again held that sinister glow. The girl was half drunk, and, I fancied, drugged. She swayed slightly where she sat. She wore a small hat of a dark velvety material, a white loose blouse, and what seemed a dark blue skirt. Round her neck hung an old-fashioned link of coral beads. Her brow was low but broad, and her hair, brushed back from the forehead, was bunched large behind, but not below the head. Her roving eyes, gradually overcoming the clinging gloom of the place, were dark brown and unnaturally bright. Half open in an empty smile, her lips disclosed white but somewhat irregular teeth. Seen plainly in such surroundings, she was, to me, a pitiable and undesirable creature. I did not like the looks of her now. The mental image formed on the sound of her laughter was infinitely preferable to the sight of her. She was, I fancied, some servant girl of a romantic nature. I was right. I don't care, she was saying, I'll never go back. Trust me, had enough, slavery for four bob a week, tain't good enough. They said if I couldn't be in by off past nine, I'd find the door locked, and I did. They can keep it locked. It's all right, you go to sleep here with me. We'll put you to rise, you'll have a lovely dress tomorrow, and a good time. Wait till you see the young man will find you tomorrow. Now g go to bed. Those twining fingers ceased toying with the girl's hair, 
and deftly slipped a protecting hook from an all-too-easy eye in the back of the girl's blouse. Three years I've been a slavery for those stuck-up pigs,' said the girl in a subdued mutter, and then she went on to recount, quaintly and in a half-incoherent jumble, the salient facts of her life. I glanced at Mick. He was leaning forward, peering through another slit. His face had its old set look, stern, condemnatory. Twice I had had to reach out and grip his wrist. He wanted to interfere. I was waiting. I knew not for what. As the muttering proceeded, the busy fingers of the old woman loosened the clothes of the indifferent girl, who soon stood swaying by the side of the bed in her chemise. Deftly the dirty quilt was slipped back, and the girlish form rolled into the creaking bed. The muttering went on for a few minutes whilst the old woman sat watching the flushed face and the tumbled hair on the pillow. The girl's right arm was thrown carelessly abroad over the quilt, the shoulder gleaming white in the deeper shadow thrown by the old woman who sat with her back to us, looking down intently at this waiting morsel of humanity. If we had not seen her before, we could have imagined her to be praying. Mick, for the first time since their entry into the room, suddenly looked over at me. The same thoughts must have flashed through both our brains. What was wrong? Was anything wrong? Surely the affair was quite simple, and the canvas screen, violated by Mick's knife, had expressed the needed attempt at decency. The muttering died down, and the room was hushed to strained silence, to be broken soon by a furtive pad on the stairs. Mick and I were again alert, staring through the canvas slits. The boss now appeared, followed by one of the dock rats. They glanced at the bed, and then looked inquiringly at the old woman. Oh, Solomon should fork out a termer for this, she said, in low but clear tones. But it's got to be a proper job. Then to the boss, and pointing to the screen, indicating the position of our beds, You lamming idiot, didn't I tell you? You should have took their bits and out of them. The dock rat was tiptoeing about the bed like a starved rodent outside a wire-screened piece of food. His glance shifted from that gleaming shoulder, hunched up over the slim neck to the heavy face of the boss, and then to the old woman, returning quickly to the form on the bed. "'Who's going to do it?' asked the old crone of the boss. Y "'You or Bill?' And she drew down the clothes, exposing the limp, sprawled limbs of the sleeping girl. The boss did not reply. He simply took a half-stride back, away from the bed. The dock rat's eyes gleamed. He had noted the movement. He ceased his tiptoeing about and looked at the boss. What's my share? Blimey, your share? returned the boss in a hoarse whisper, then pointing to the waiting, half-naked form. That! In their contemplation of their victim, they were so absorbed that they apparently forgot entirely the three of us bedded on the other side of a hanging sail. Mick and I were staggered. We looked at each other, realizing at the selfsame instant the whole purpose of this curious conference. By some subtle and secret processes of the mind, again there seemed to be a change in the atmosphere of the room. Its sordid dinginess was no longer present to our consciousness. There was new life, heart, and vigor, and in some curious way our mentality seemed merged together. No longer puzzled, we were vibrant with a common purpose. I was angry and disgusted. Mick was moved to the inmost sanctuary of his Celtic being. He manifested the last degree of outrage and insult, of agonized anger. 
for the moment we were cleansed of all the pettiness and grossness common to manhood, inspired only with a new-born worship of the inviolable right of the individual to the disposal of its own tokens of affection and life. And this new spirit of ours pervaded the room. The girl moaned in her drunken sleep. Twin toes turned restlessly in bed, and the lines of his face sharpened and deepened. Something was killing the poison in both. Even the trio about the girl were momentarily moved by some new sensation. Mick's accustomed recklessness of action was gone, and he was cool and prepared to be calculating. We slipped on our boots, and I moved over to Twinto's bed. I touched his arm. Mumbling curses, he opened his eyes. "'It's Mac,' I whispered, leaning over, and looking steadyingly into his face. "'What the hell?' he began, but I managed to silence him. Once accustomed to the gloom, his eyes took in the strangeness of the situation, and painfully swallowing the foul nausea of his drunk, he calmly and quietly pulled on his boots. The old woman had again covered up the still sleeping girl, and engaged the boss in a wrangle about money. "'You'll bloody well swing yet,' said the boss irrelevantly. "'Maybe, but that don't alter it. I wants my full share, and I means to have it.' Dispassionately the dock-rat eyed them both, and hoped for the best for himself. We had ceased to exist for them. "'Gone?' asked the dock-rat as the others moved towards the stairs. They looked at him, but did not reply. So far as we were aware, though we had forgotten the entire world outside that room, there had been complete silence downstairs. But now we could hear movement. The other dock-rats were evidently awake and waiting. As the foot of the boss fell on the top stair, the spell seemed to fall from Mick. He glared fixedly at the dock-rat who stood by the girl's bed. "'I'll tear his guts out,' said Mick, with appalling certainty of tone. The old woman heard it. The lead pipe again in her fist, like a cornered rat she whipped round. Mick did not wait. Full at the canvas he sprang. His Irish impulsiveness overcame caution, and in a moment he was wrapped in the hanging sail, the old woman battering the bellying folds. The dock-rat's head was knocking at the wall, twin-toes cursing rhythmically, and shutting off his breath with fingers of steel. My left eye was half-closed, and the boss's knuckles were bleeding. The girl, awake and utterly confounded, blinked foolishly and silently, weakly trying to fix her eyes on some definite point in the tangled thread of palpitating life that surged about her. "'Look out! Drop him!' I shouted to Twin Toes as I swung in, furious but with some care to the face of the boss. Twin Toes did not heed. He staggered across the room under a blow from one of the new arrivals, but he did not lose his hold. He was a hefty man, entirely reliable, indeed almost happy in such an affair. As number two Doc Rat tried to follow up his blow, Twin Toes swung number one around in his way. Then, changing his hold, taking both the man's shoulders in his hands, he drew back his head as a snake does, and butted his man clean over one of the beds. His face a pitiful pulp, number one was definitely out of it. Ordinarily the boss would have been much too much for me. But now fate favored me. He was considerably perturbed about the possible outcome of the row and its effect on his business. I was intent only on the fight. With a clean left-hand cut I drove him over, tore a quilt from a bed, and flung it over his dazed head, then swung round to where the lead pipe was still flailing. I was concerned for Mick. Seizing the old woman's shoulders, I flung her back from Mick and the sail. He would have cleared himself, but his legs were somehow mixed up with the foot of the bed, and she occupied his attention too much. 
The hag raised the lead and rushed, and for the only time in my life I hit a woman. Without hesitancy or compunction, only revolted at the thought of such contact with such matter, I smashed her down. The boss and Mick freed themselves together and embraced each other willingly. Twintoes was playing skittles with the remaining dock rats. There was surprisingly little noise. No one shouted. There was no howling, hounding on of each other. All but the girl were absorbed in the immediate business of giving or warding off of blows. Dress quick, I said to the girl. The fight had shifted to the center, and her bed had remained unmoved, herself unmolested. In wondering silence she obeyed. Quicker, quicker! I enjoined, with a new brutal note in my voice. The reaction had set in. I could cheerfully have shoved her down the stairs and flung her garments after her. The kip was hidden away in a dark alley, the history and reputation of which were shudderingly doubtful, but there were police within dangerous hailing distance. The girl's lips began to quiver. Supposing she broke down and raised the court by hysterical howling. Don't breathe a sound, or we'll leave you to it, I threatened. She shrank back, gave a low moan, and clutched my coat. I tore her hand loose and turned away in time to floor the boss by an easy blow on his left ear. The fight was finished. We wasted no time but descended the stairs and passed out through the court into the street. There were signs of life in the gloomy court, though no one spoke or molested us. The street was dead silent. Mick's arms and shoulders were a mass of bruises from the lead pipe, but his face was clear. Twin toes was all right, he said, but craving for a wet. I alone showed evidence of the struggle. My eye was unsightly and painful, and my left wrist was slightly sprained. The girl sobbed quietly. Oh, oh, she cried repeatedly, whatever's to become of me? She irritated me. Shut up, I said at last. You'll be all right. She snuffed unceasingly. I looked across at Mick. She walked between us, twin toes on my right, and at once I saw the outcome of it all. Stop it, blast you! I shook her shoulder. My pal is the best, biggest fool that ever raised a fist. He's silly enough for anything decent. And then, with the voice of conviction, born of absolute certainty of mind, he'll never chuck you over. He'll marry you some time, you fool. And he did. End of Story 14 Story 15 of The Best British Short Stories of 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. The Best British Short Stories of 1922 by Various. Story 15 The Backstairs of the Mind by Rosamund Langbridge from the Manchester Guardian, 1922. Patrick Deasy described himself as a philosopher, psychologist, and humorist. It was partly because Patrick delighted in long words, and partly to excuse himself for being full of the sour cream of an inhuman curiosity. His curiosity, however, did not extend itself to science and belle it concerned itself wholly with the affairs of other people. At first, when D.C. retired from the police force with a pension and an heiress with three hundred pounds, and time hung heavy on his hands, he would try to satisfy this craving through the medium of a host of small flirtations with everybody's maid. In this way, he could inform himself exactly how many loaves were taken by the Sweeneys for a week's consumption, 
as compared with those which were devoured by all the Cassidys, for whom the bottles at the presbytery went in by the back door, and what was the real cause of the quarrel between the twin Miss McInernys. But these were but blackbird scratchings, as it were, upon the deep soil of the human heart. What Deasy cared about was what he called the secrets of the soul. Never met a man, he was wont to say, with no backstairs to his mind. And the quieter, decenter, respectabler, innocenter a man looked, like enough, the darker those backstairs. It was up these stairs he craved to go. To ring at the front door of ordinary intercourse was not enough for him. When D. C. invested his wife's money in a public house, he developed a better plan. It was the plan which made him ultimately describe himself as a humorist. He would wait until the bar was deserted by all but the one lingering victim whom his trained eye had picked out then rolling that same eye about him as though to make quite sure no other living creature was in sight he would gently close the door of the bar parlour pick up a tumbler breathe on it polish the breath lean one elbow on the bar look round him once again and setting the whisky bottle betwixt his customer and himself with a nod which said help yourself he would lean forward with the soft, indulgent grin of the human man of the world, and begin. Now, don't distress yourself, my dear man, but as between friends, certain delicate little facts in your past life have come inadvertently to me hearing. Sometimes he would allude to a certain document, or incriminating facts, or certain letters. He would ring the changes on these three according to the sex and temperament with which he had to deal. But always, whatever the words, whatever the nature or sex, the shot would tell. First came the little start, the straightened figure, the pallor or flush, the shamed and suddenly lit eyes, and then... Who told you, Mr. D.C., sir? Or, where did you get the letter? Ah, now that would be telling, D.C. would make reply. But twas from a certain person whom perhaps we need not name. Then the whiskey bottle would move forward like a pawn in chess, and the next soothing words would be, Hell, Help yourself now. Don't be shy, me dear man and your secret is safe with me. Forthwith the little skeleton in that man's cupboard would lean forward and press upon the door, until at last the door flew open and a bone or two, and sometimes the whole skeleton, would rattle out upon the floor. He had played this game so often that almost at first sight he could classify his dupes under the three heads into which he had divided them, those who demanded with violent threats, which melted like snow before the sunshine of John Jameson, the letter or the name of the informant, those who asked after a gentle sip or two how the letter had come into his hands, and those who asked immediately if the letter hadn't been destroyed. As a rule, from the type that demanded the letter back, he only caught sight of the tip of the secret's ears. From those, they were nearly always the women, who swiftly asked if he hadn't destroyed the letters, he caught shamefaced gleams of the truth. But those who asked between pensive sips how the facts or the letter had come his way, these were the ones who yielded Deasy the richest harvest of rattling skeleton bones. Indeed, it was curiously instructive how John Jameson laid down a causeway of gleaming stepping-stones, so that D.C. might cross lightly over the turgid waters of his victims' souls. At the words, accompanied by John Jameson, a certain dark page of your past history, uh, help yourself, me boy, has been inadvertently revealed to me, 
but is for ever sacred in me breast." It was strange to see how, from the underworld of the man's mind, there would trip out the company of misshapen hobgoblins and gnomes, which had been locked away in darkness, maybe, this many a year. Well, how would I get the time to clane the childer and to wash their heads, and I working all the day at curing stinking hides? Twas herself should have got it, and herself alone. Or, no, I never done it, for all me own mother sworn I did. I only give the man a little push, that way, and he fell over on the side and busted all his veins. Or, well, and wouldn't you draw two pensions yourself, Mr. D.C., if you'd a wife with two hands like a sieve for yellow gold? But there were some confessions, haltingly patchy and inadequate, but hauntingly suggestive, which D.C. could neither piece out on the spot, nor yet unravel in the small hours of the night. There was one of this nature which troubled his rest long. Well, the way of it was, you see, he put it up the chimbley, but when the chimbley sweepers come, he transferred it in his waistcoat to my place, and I dropped it down the well. They found it when they let the bucket down, but I wasn't his accomplice at all. Twas only connivance with me. When he had spoken of the chimney and the well, Deasy concluded at once it was a foully murdered corpse. But then again you could not well conceal a corpse in someone's waistcoat, and gold coins would melt or be mislaid amongst the loose bricks of a sooty chimney. Deasy had craved for corpses, but nothing so grim as that had risen to his whiskey bait until he tried the same old game on Mrs. Garrity. What subtle instinct was it that had prompted him to add to the first unvarying words, but all that is now past and over and safe beneath the mouldering clay. At these last words, the widow Garrity knew well the barrier was down that fences off one human soul from another. All the same, she shook her trembling head when Deasy drew the cork. At her refusal, Deasy was struck with the most respectful compassion. Until that hour he had never known one single lacerated soul decline this consolation. And to look at me, she wept forthwith, would you think I could shed a drop of ruddy gore? No, ma'am, returned Deasy. To look at you, you'd think, ma'am, you could never kill a fly. And respectfully he passed the peppermints. Sometimes, the widow muttered, I hears it and it bawling at me dreams a night, and the two bright eyes of it and the little clay-cold feet. Deasy knew what was coming now, and he twitched in every vein. And she, so white-haired and so regular at church, and the black bonnet on the head of her, and all. It was the only little one she had, went on the widow, bowed almost to the bar by shame, and it always perched up on her knee, and taking food from her mouth, and she nursing it again her face. But I had bad teeth in me head, and I couldn't get me rest, with the jaws aching, and all the whiles it screeching with a croup. Twould madden you. All the same, Deasy whispered, Maybe it wasn't your fault. Twas maybe your man egged you on to do the shameful deed? Oh, it was so, said the widow. Let you get up and cut its throat, says he, and then we will be shut of the damn screeching thing. Then you got the knife, ma'am, prompted D.C. It was the bread knife, she answered, with the ugly notches in the blade. And I stole in the back way to her place in the dead hours of the night, and I had me apron handy for to quench the cries, and when I caught it be the throat, didn't it look up at me with the two bright, innocent eyes? And what did you do with the body, he asked. I dug a grave in the shine of the moon, she answered, and I, I put it in by the two little cold gray feet. This touch of the gray feet laid a spell on Deasy's hankering morbidity. What turned the feet gray? he whispered. 
"'Nature, I suppose,' replied the white-haired widow. She drew her shawl about her shrinking form before she turned away. "'Twas never found out from that hour to this who done it,' muttered the widow Garrity. "'But may the divil scalp me if I touch one drop of chicken tea again.'" End of Story 15 Story 16 of The Best British Short Stories of 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. The Best British Short Stories of 1922 by Various. Story 16 The Birth of a Masterpiece by Lucas Mallet. From the Storyteller, 1922. Looking back on it from this distance of time, it began in the early and ended in the middle eighties, I see the charm of ingenuous youth stamped on the episode, the touching glamour of limitless faith and expectation. We were, the whole little band of us, so deliciously self-sufficient, so magnificently critical of established reputations in contemporary letters and art. We sniffed and snorted, noses in the air, at popular idols, while ourselves weighted down with a cargo of guileless enthusiasm only asking opportunity to dump itself at an idol's feet. We ached to burn incense before the altar of some divinity, but it must be a divinity of our own discovering, our own choosing. We scorned to acclaim ready-made, second-hand goods. Then we encountered Pogson, Heber Pogson. Our fate, and even more perhaps his fate, was henceforth sealed. He was a large, sleek, pink creature, slow and rare of movement, from much sitting bulky, not to say squashy in figure, mild-eyed, slightly jovial, and, for no other word to my mind, so closely fits his attitude, resigned. A positive glutton of books, he read as instinctively, almost as unconsciously, as other men breathe. But he not only absorbed, he gave forth, and that copiously, with taste, with discrimination, now and again with startlingly eloquent flights and witty sallies. His memory was prodigious. The variety and vivacity of his conversation, the immense range of subjects he brilliantly labored, when in the vein, remain with me as simply marvelous. With us he mostly was in the vein and vanity apart, we must have composed a delightful audience, generously censor-swinging. No man of even average feeling but would be moved by such fresh, such spontaneous admiration. Thus, if our divinity melodiously piped, we did very radiantly dance to his piping. Oh, Heber Pogson enjoyed it! Never tell me he didn't revel in those highly articulate evenings of monologue, gasconade, heated yet brotherly argument, lasting on to midnight and after, every bit as much as we did. Anyhow, at first. Later he may have had twinges, been sensible of strain, though never, I still believe, a very severe one. In any case, nature showed herself his friend, his savior, if also, in some sort, his executioner. When the strain tended to become distressing for him personally, very simply and cleverly she found a way out. A background of dark legend only brought the steady glow of his, and our, present felicity into richer relief. We gathered hints of caught in passing, smiling allusion to, straightened and impecunious early years. He had endured a harsh enough apprenticeship to the profession of letters in its least satisfactory because most ephemeral form, namely journalism, and provincial journalism at that. 
This must have painfully cribbed and confined his free ranging spirit. We were filled by reverent sympathy for the trials and deprivations of his past, but at the period when the members, numbering a dozen, more or less, of our devoted band trooped up from Chelsea and down from the Hampstead Heights to worship in the studio library of the Church Street Kensington House, Pogson was lapped in a material well-being altogether sufficient. He treated us, his youthful friends and disciples, to very excellent food and drink partaking of these himself, moreover, with evident readiness and relish. Those little help-yourselves stand-up suppers in the big, quiet, comfortably warmed and shaded room revealed in him no ascetic tendency, though, I hasten to add, no tendency to unbecoming excess. Such hospitality testified to the soundness of Pogson's existing financial position as did his repeated assertions that now at last, praise heaven, he had leisure to do worthy and abiding work, works through which he could freely express his personality, express in terms of art his judgments upon and appreciations of the human scene. We listened breathless, nodding, exuberant approval for weren't we ourselves, each and all of us, mightily in love with art and with the human scene? And hadn't we, listening thus breathlessly to our amazing master, the enchanting assurance that we were on the track of a masterpiece? Not impossibly a whole gallery of masterpieces, since Heber Pogson had barely touched middle age as yet. For him there still was time fiction, we gathered, to be the selected medium. He not only meant to write, but was actually now engaged in writing a novel during those withdrawn and sacred morning hours when we were denied admittance to his presence. We previsaged something tremendous, poetic, yet fearlessly modern, fixed on the bedrock of realism, a drama and a vision wide, high, deep, spectacular, yet subtle as life itself. Let his confrères, French and Russian, not to mention those merely British-born, look to their laurels when Heber Pogson blossomed into print. And, preciously inspiring thought, he was our Pogson. He inalienably belonged to us, since hadn't we detected the quality of his genius when the veil was still upon its face? Oh, we knew, bless you, we knew. We'd the right to sniff and snort noses in air at contemporary reputations because we were snugly awaiting the disclosure of a talent which would prick them into nothingness like so many bubbles, pop them like so many inflated paper bags, knock them one and all into the proverbial cocked hat. Unfortunately, youth, with a fine illogic, though having all the time there is before it, easily waxes impatient. In our eagerness for his public recognition, his apotheosis, we did, I am afraid, hustle our great man a little. Instead of being satisfied with his nocturnal coruscations, they, brilliant as ever, let it be noted, we just a fraction resented the slowness of his progress, began ever so gently to shove that honored bulky form behind and pull at it in front. We wanted the tangible result of those many sacred and secret morning hours during which his novel was in process of being formed and fashioned, gloriously built up. Wouldn't he tell us the title? enlighten us as to the theme, the scheme, thus allaying the hunger pangs of our pious curiosity by crumbs, ever so small and few, dropped from his richly furnished table. With exquisite good humor he fenced and fainted. Almost roguishly he would laugh us off and launch the conversation into other channels, holding us, after the first few vexatiously outwitted seconds, at once enthralled and delicately rebuked. But at last, in the late spring, as far as I remember, of the second year of our devotion, 
there came a meeting at which things got pressed somehow to a head. Contrary to custom, feminine influence made itself felt. And here I pause and blush, for it strikes me as so intimately characteristic of our whole relation, in that earlier stage at least, that I should have written all this on the subject of Heger Pogson without making one solitary mention of his wife. She existed. Was permanently in evidences, or wasn't it rather in eclipse, as a shadowy parasitic entity perambulating the hinterland of his domestic life. She must have been by some years his junior, a tall, thin, flat-chested woman, having heavy yellowish-brown hair, a complexion to match, and pale, nervous eyes. Her clothes hung on her as on a clothes-peg. She affected vivid greens, as was the mistaken habit of Victorian ladies possessing the colouring falsely called auburn, but clouded their excessive verdure to neutrality by semi-transparent over-draperies of black. Harry Lessingham, in a crudely unchivalrous mood, once described her as without form and void, adding that she had a mouth like a fish. These statements I considered unduly harsh, yet admitted her almost miraculously negative. She mattered less, when one was in the room with her, than anything human and feminine which I, so far, had ever run across and I was at least normally susceptible, I'm very sure of that. As a matter of course, on our arrival at the blessed house in Church Street, we one and all respectfully greeted her, passed, to put it vulgarly, the time of day with her. But their intercourse ceased. At some subsequent instant she faded out, whether into space or into some adjacent connubial chamber I had no notion. I only realized, when the act was accomplished, that we now were without her, that she had vanished, leaving behind her no faintest moral or emotional trace. But on the occasion in question she did not vanish. We fed her at supper, and still she remained, in the interests of social propriety as we imagined since for once the Pogson Symposium included a stranger, an eminently attractive lady guest. Harry Lessingham had begged to bring his sister with him. He told me of this beforehand, and I rejoiced. Lessingham had long been dear to me as a brother, while that Arabella should only be dear to me as a sister was, just then, I own, among the things I wished least. I craved, therefore, to have her share our happy worship. She had a pretty turn for literature herself. I coveted to see her dazzled, exalted, impressed. It would be a fascinating spectacle. Before I slept that night, or rather next morning, I recognized her coming as a disastrous mistake, for she had received insufficient instruction in ritual in the suitable forms of approach to so august a presence as that of our host. She played round him, flickering, darting, like lightning round a cathedral tower, metal-tipped. Where we, in our young male modesty, had but gently drawn or furtively shoved, she tickled the soft sedentary creature's ribs as with a rapier point. And, to us agitated watchers, the amazing thing was that Pogson didn't seem to mind. He neither rebuked her nor laughed her off, but purred, veritably purred, under her alternate teasing and petting like some big sleek cat. At last, with a cajoling but really alarming audacity, she went for him straight. Of course, dear Mr. Pogson, Harry has told me all about your wonderful novel, she said. I am so interested, so thrilled, and so grateful to you for letting me join your audience tonight. But I want quite frightfully to know more. Speaking not only for myself, but for all who are present, may I implore a further revelation? Pray don't send us empty away in respect of the wonderful book. 
It would be so lovely while we sit here at your feet." She, in fact, sat by his side, her chair placed decidedly close to his. "If you would read us a chapter " "A chapter is impossible?" Her charming, pliant mouth, her charming, dancing eyes, her caressing voice I won't swear even her caressing hands didn't, for a brief space, take part all wooed him to surrender. "Well, a page, then. A paragraph? Ah, don't be obdurate! The merest sentence! Surely we may claim as much as that. Picture our pride, our happiness!" She enclosed us all in a circular and sympathetic glance, which ended, as it had started, by meeting his mild eyes, lingering appealingly upon his large, pink countenance. Pogson succumbed. No, he wouldn't read, but since she so amiably desired it, more than anything in all my life, with the most convincing and virginal sincerity, he thought he might rehearse a passage which wasn't, as he gladly believed, altogether devoid of merit. He did rehearse it and we broke into applause the more tempestuous because suspicion of a chill queerly lay upon us a chill insidious as it was vague disturbing as it was wasn't it we silently quite violently hoped so ridiculously uncalled for after all that passage is thundering good you know Harry Lessingham announced, as though arguing with himself, arguing himself out of that same invidious chill an hour later. Arabella had refused a hansom, declaring herself excited, still under the spell, and so wanting to walk. Leaving the Church Street house, the three of us crossed into Camden Grove, with a view to turning down Camden House Road, thus reaching Kensington High Street. It was out of sight of the average, packed with epigram, worthy of all we've ever believed or asked of him. It takes a master of technique, of style, to write like that. Beloved brother, which of us ever said it didn't? Arabella took him up sweetly. Slender, light-footed, the train of her evening gown switched over her arm, beneath her flowing orange and white-flowered satin cloak, she walked between us. Why, it was good to the point of being inevitable. One seemed, I certainly did, to know every phrase, every word which was coming. None could have been other, or been placed otherwise than it was. And that's the highest praise one can give to anybody's prose, isn't it? One jumped to the perfect rightness of the whole, a rightness so perfect as to make the sentences sound quite extraordinarily familiar. This last assertion dropped as a bomb between Lessingham and myself. By the way, the girl presently said, as our awkward silence continued, has either of you happened to read or re-read Meredith's Egoist just lately? Lessingham stopped short, and in the light of a neighboring gas lamp I saw his handsome boyish face look troubled to the point of physical pain. What on earth are you driving at? What do you mean, Arabella, that Pogson is a plagiarist? Don't eat me, Harry, dearest, if I incline to use a shorter, commoner expression. A thief? An unconscious one, no doubt, she threw off quickly, fearful of explosions, possibly, in her turn. He may have been betrayed by his own extraordinary memory. But this is horrible, horrible, Lessingham cried. All the names, though, were different. Arabella appeared to have overcome her fear of explosions. Her charming eyes again danced. Exactly, she said. That was the peculiar part of it, the thing which riveted my attention. He had, I mean the names of the characters and places were different, were altered, changed. Lessingham stood bareheaded in the light of a gas lamp. 
he ran the fingers of his left hand through his crisp, fair hair, rumpling it up into a distracted crest. I could see, could almost hear, the travail of his honest soul. Loyalty, faith, and honor worked at high pressure to hit on a satisfactory explanation. Suddenly he threw back his head and laughed. Why, of course, he cried, it's as clear as mud. Pogson wasn't betrayed by anything. He did it on purpose. Don't you understand, you dear goose, you very much too clever by half, dear goose? It was simply his kindly joke, his good-natured little game. And we, like the pack of idiots, which, compared with him, we are, never scented it. You pestered, yes, Arabella, most unconscionably pestered him to read an excerpt from his novel. And to pacify you, he quoted a page from Meredith instead. Harry Lessingham tucked his hand under the folds of the orange and white-flowered cloak, and taking the girl affectionately by the elbow, trotted her down the sloping pavement towards Kensington High Street. All the honors of war rest with Pogson, he joyfully assured her. You made an importunate, impertinent demand for bread. He didn't mean to be drawn, but was too civil, too tender-hearted to put you off with a stone, so slyly cut you a slice from another man's loaf. Does it occur to you, my sweet sister, you've been had, very neatly had? If it comes to that, Miss Lessingham, by no means stands alone, I interrupted. We've all been had, as you so gracefully put it, very neatly and very extensively had. For though I trusted Lessingham's view was the correct one, trusted so most devoutly, I could not but regret the discomfiture of Arabella. Her approach to our chosen idol may have slightly lacked in reverence, she may indeed in plain english have cheeked him but she had done so in the prettiest airiest manner pogson's punishment of her indiscretion if highly ingenious still struck me as not in the best taste for was it not at once rather mean and rather cheap to make so charming a person the subject and that before witnesses of a practical joke if, after all, it really was a joke. That insidious, odious chill, which earlier prompted my tempestuous applause, as I woefully registered, hung about me yet. Unquestionably, Arabella Lessingham's visit to Church Street showed more and more, when I considered it, as a radical mistake. From it I date the waning of the moon of my delight in respect of both Pogson and herself. I had bowed in worship equally sincere, though diverse in sentiment, before each, and to each had pledged my allegiance. To have them thus discredit one another represented the most trying turn of events. For a full month I cold-shouldered the band, abjured the shrine, and avoided the lady. Then, while still morose and brooding, my trouble at its height, a cousin in the third degree, rich, middle-aged, and conveniently restless, invited me to be his travelling companion. We had taken trips together before. This one promised fields of wider adventure, nothing less than the quartering of southern Europe, along with nibblings at African and Asiatic Mediterranean coasts. It was the chance of a lifetime. I embraced it. I also called at the house in Church Street to make my farewells. I could do no less. I have used the word resigned in describing Pogson. Today that word notably covered him. Our friend appeared depressed, yet bland in his depression, anxious to mollify and placate rather than reproach. His attitude touched me. I hardly deserved it after my neglect, to which, by the way, he made no smallest reference. But as I unfolded my plans, he increasingly threw off his depression and generously entered into them. Would have me fetch an atlas and trace out my proposed itinerary upon the map. It included names to conjure with. 
These set wide the flood gates of his speech. He at once enchanted and confounded me by his knowledge of the literature, art, history of Syria, Egypt, Italy, Greece, and the Levant. For the next three quarters of an hour I had Pogson at his best. And, oh, how vastly good that same best was! Under the flashing multicolored light of it, he routed my suspicions, put my annoyance and distrust to flight. As he leaned back in the roomy library chair, filled to veritable overflowing by his big, squashy, brown velvet jacketed person, Pogson had put on flesh of late, put it on sensibly, as I remarked, even during the few weeks of my absence, he reconquered all my admiration and belief. As I rose to depart, ah, you fortunate youth, he thus genially addressed me, thrice fortunate youth, in your freedom, your enterprise, your happy elasticity of flesh and spirit. What won't you have to tell me of things actually seen, of lands, cities, civilizations, past and present, and the storied wonder of them when you come back? And what won't you have to read to me in return, dear master, I echoed, eager to testify to my recovered faith? By then the book will be finished, on which all our hopes and affections are set ten times more precious, more illuminating than anything I have seen, will be what I hear from you when I come back. But as I spoke, surely I wasn't mistaken in thinking that for an agitating minute the pinkness of Pogson's large countenance sickly ebbed and blanched. And while my attention was still engaged by this disquieting phenomenon, I became aware that Mrs. Pogson had joined us. Silently, mysteriously, she faded, the term holds good, into evidence, as on so many former occasions she had silently, mysteriously faded out. Dressed in one of those verdant gowns so dolorously veiled in semi-transparent black, she stood behind her husband's chair. Her eyes met mine. They were no longer nervous or in expression vague, but oddly aggressive, challenging, defiantly alight. Oh, yes, she declared, by then Heber will have completed his great novel without doubt. When uttering his name, she laid a thin, long-fingered hand upon his rounded shoulder, and to my little short of stupefaction, I saw Pogson's fat, pink hand move up to seek and clasp it. On me this action, hers soothing, protective, his appealing, welcoming, produced the most bewildering effect. I felt embarrassed and abashed, an indecently impertinent intruder upon the secret places of two human hearts that any such intimate and tender correspondence existed between this so strangely ill-assorted couple I never dreamed. I uttered what must have sounded wildly incoherent farewells, and fled. Of the ensuing eighteen months of foreign travel, it is irrelevant here to speak. Suffice it that on my return to England and to Chelsea, the earliest news which greeted me was that Arabella Lessingham had been now five weeks married, and Heber Pogson a fortnight dead. Lessingham, dear good fellow, was my informant, and minded acquainting me, so I fancied, only a degree less with the first item than with the second. For some considerable time, he told me, Pogson had been ailing. He grew inordinately stout unwieldy to the extent of all exertion, all movement causing him distress. Suffocation threatened if he attempted to lie down, so that latterly he spent not only all day, but all night sitting in the big library chair we knew so well. If not actually in pain, he must still have suffered intolerable discomfort. But he never complained, and to the last his passion for books never failed. 
we took him any new ones we happened to run across, as you'd take a sick woman flowers. To the end he read. And wrote, I ask? That I can't say, Lessingham replied. There were things I could not make out, and I couldn't question him. It didn't seem to be my place, though I had an idea he'd something on his mind to speak of which would be a relief. It worried me badly. I felt sure he wanted to tell us, but couldn't bring himself to the point. He talked of you. He cared for you more than for any of us. Yet, I may be all wrong, it seemed to me he was glad you weren't here. Once or twice, I thought, he felt almost afraid you might come back before, before it was all over, you know. It sounds rather horrible, but I had a feeling he longed to slink off quietly out of sight, for he did not dread death. I'm certain of that. What he dreaded was that life had some trick up her sleeve which, if he delayed too long, might give him away put him to shame somehow at the last. And Mrs. Pogson? Lessingham looked at me absently. Oh, uh, Mrs. Pogson? She's never interested me. She's too invertebrate. But I believe she took care of Pogson all right. Next day I called at the house in Church Street. After some parley I was admitted into the studio library. Neither in Mrs. Pogson nor in the familiar room did I find any alteration, save that the green had disappeared from her dress. She wore hanging, trailing, unrelieved black, and that a piece of red woolen cord was tied across from arm to arm of Pogson's large library chair, forbidding occupation of it. This pleased me. It struck the positive, the in a way aggressive note which mrs pogson had once before so strangely unexpectedly sounded in my presence i said the things common to such occasions as that of our present meeting said them with more than merely conventional feeling and emphasis i praised her husband's great gifts his amazing learning his eloquence the magnetic charm by which he captivated and held us Finally I dared the question I had come here to ask, which had burned upon my tongue, indeed, from the moment I heard of Pogson's death. What about the novel? Might we hope for speedy, though posthumous, publication? We were greedy. The world should know how great a literary genius it had lost. Was it ready for press, as, did she remember, she had assured me it would certainly be by the time I came back? Mrs. Pogson did not betray any sign of emotion. Her thin hands remained perfectly still in her crepe-covered lap. There is no novel, she calmly told me. There never has been any novel. Heber did not finish it because he never began it. He did not possess the creative faculty. You were not content with what he gave. You asked of him that which he could not give. At first he played with you. It amused him. You were so gullible, so absurdly ignorant. Then he hesitated to undeceive you. In that I admit he was weak. But he suffered for his weakness. It made him unhappy. Oh, I, how I have hated, how I still hate you! for I saved him from poverty, from hard work. I secured him a peaceful, beautiful life till you came and spoilt it. All the money was mine, she said. End of Story 16《Story 17 of the Best British Short Stories of 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. The Best British Short Stories of 1922 by Various. 
Story seventeen Genius by Eleanor Mordaunt from Hutchinson's Magazine and the Century Magazine, nineteen twenty one, nineteen twenty two. Part one. I have written before of Ben Cohen with his eternal pouring and humming over the scores of great masters, of the timber yard at Canning Town, forever changing and forever the same, devouring forests with the eternal wind like rush of saws, slide of gigantic plains, practical and chill, wrapped in river fogs, and yet exotic with the dust of cedar, camphor, paragoric. In those days Ben Cohen was wont to read music as other boys read their penny dreadfuls, avidly, with the imagined sounds like great waves forever a rush through his soul. In the very beginning it was any music, just music. Then for a while Wagner held him. Any Wagnerian concert, any mixed entertainment which included Wagner, it seemed as though he sniffed them upon the breeze, and he would tramp for miles, wait for hours, biting cold, sleet, snow, mud, rain, all alike disregarded by that persistence which the very poor must bring to the pursuit of pleasure, the capture of cheap seats. Once ensconced, regardless of hard, narrow seats, heights, crowds, his passion of adoration and excitement took him shook him, tore him so that it was wonder his frail body did not split in two, render up the soul coming forth as Lazarus from the sepulchre. It was indeed, if you knew little Ben Cohen, him, himself, difficult to realize that his body had anything more to do with him than the yellow drab waterproof which is a sort of uniform, a species of charity, covering a multitude of sins of poverty, shabbiness, threadbareness, had to do with the real Jenny Bly. And yet Ben Cohen's body was more completely his than one might have imagined. Jenny could, and indeed did, slough off her disguise on Sundays or rare summer days. But Ben and that self which was apart from music, that wildly beating heart, pulsing blood, flooding warmth, grateful as the watchman's fire in the fog-sodden yard, that little fire over which he used to hang, warming his stiffened hands, were, after all, amazingly one. The thing surprised him even more than it surprised anyone else, above all when it refused to be separated from his holy of holies, crept, danced, smiled its way through the most portentous scores a thrilling sense of Jenny Bly, all crotchets and quavers, smiles and thrills, quaint homeliness, sudden dignity. By the time he first met Jenny he was clear of Wagner, had glanced a little patronizingly at Beethoven, turned aside and enwrapped himself in the sombre splendor of Bach, right away from the world. Then, harking back with a fresh vision, a sudden sense of the inevitable, had anchored himself in the solemn, wide-stretching harborage of Beethoven. It was like a return from a long-lost voyage, tearing round a world full of beauty and interest, and yet at the same time full of pettiness, fuss, annoyance, a homecoming beyond words. There was a sense of eternity, a harmony, which drew everything to itself, smoothing out the pattern of life, the present life and the life to come, so crumpled that up to this time he had had no real idea of the meaning of it. All at once everything was immensely right, with Jenny as an essential and inevitable part of the rightness. He felt this so strongly that he never stopped to wonder if other people felt it as plainly as he did. Apart from all this, he was bound by the inarticulateness of his class. His Jewish blood lent him a wider and more picturesque vocabulary than most, and yet it stopped at any discussion of his feelings. We have an idea that what we call the common people are more communicative on such subjects than we are, but this is not so. They talk of their physical ailments and sensations, 
but they are deeply shy upon the subject of their feelings. Ben's mother would discuss the state of her insides, the deaths of her relations and friends, his own birth down to the smallest detail. But she would never have dreamt of telling her son that she loved him, desired his love, hungered for his coming, grieved at his going. Ben himself put none of his feelings for Beethoven into words, above all to his mother. She would not have understood him if he had. He said nothing of Jenny, either, save as a girl he'd met, a girl he was going to bring home to tea, but she understood that without any words. That was courting, part of the business of human nature, much like the preparation of meals. It was odd, coming to think of it, might have been ridiculous, save that ridicule was the sort of thing which could find no possible lodgment with Ben, that his determination to devote his whole musical life to Beethoven, to interpret him as no Englishman had ever done before, should have been synonymous with his sacred, heady, and yet absolute determination to marry Jenny Bly. Jenny worked in the jam factory, and there was something of the aroma of ripe fruit about her, ripe strawberries, raspberries, plums, damsons. She was plumpish and fresh, very red lips and very bright eyes, reddish-brown, the color of blackberry leaves in autumn, with hair to match. Her little figure was neat, her small hands, with their square-tipped fingers, deft and quick in their movements. There was something at once rounded and clear-cut about everything she did. A seafaring admirer used to say that she was a bit short in the beam, but a daisy fur carrion sail. And that was the idea she gave, so well balanced, so trim, going off to work in her wide white apron on those rare mornings when she shook off the yellow mackintosh. Ben saw her like that for the first time crossing the lee just below the timber yard with its cranes like black notes zigzagging out over the river, which had for once discarded its fog. It was a day of bright blue sky, immense, rounded, silvery clouds, fresh and clean, with a wind which caught up the white apron and billowed it out for the sheer fun of the thing, showing trim ankles, the turn of a plump calf, such as Ben Cohen had never even thought of before, the realization of which was like wine freshly tasted, red, fruity, running through his veins, mounting to his head. He had known that women had legs. His mother, the laundress, suffered from hers, complainingly devoted woman as she was, swollen with much standing, and them thar dratted veins, stocky legs, with loose folds of stocking. As to thinking any more of a woman's legs than of the legs of a table, the idea had never even occurred to him. But there you are. It is the unexpected that happens, the sort of thing which we could never have imagined ourselves as doing, thinking, feeling. The temptations we have recognized, struggled against, are nothing. But there comes a sort of wild, whistling wind from nowhere, much the same as that wind about Jenny's skirts, white apron, and our life is like a kaleidoscope, suddenly shaken up and showing a completely fresh pattern. Who could have thought it, who, that Ben Cohen, dreamer, idealist, passionate, pure, the devotee of art, would have fallen in love with Jenny Bly's legs, or rather a pair of ankles, and a little more at that side where the wind caught her skirt, before he had so much as a glimpse of her face. Just over the bridge she stopped to speak with another girl who worked in his own counting-house. As Ben hurried up to pass them before they separated, really see her, this other girl recognized him, flung him a friendly hello, and was answered in the same fashion. As he moved on he heard her, was meant to hear, knew that he was meant to hear, from the pitch of the voice. Clever ain't no word for it! There ain't no tune as— The end of the sentence was lost, but he knew the sort of thing, knew it by heart, had spent his time running away from it. 
Now, however, he was grateful, more grateful still when he met Miss Ankles again, and she herself, regarding Florry Hines' eulogy as a sort of introduction, smiled, moved on a step, and herself tossed a hello over one shoulder. Ben's thin, olive-tinted face was flushed as he drew forward to her side with his odd stoop, his way of ducking his head and raising his eyes, dark and glowing. He took Jenny's dinner basket, and she noticed his hands, large and well-shaped, with long fingers, widened at the tips. Florrie had said that he was a sheeny, but there was nothing of the Jew about him apart from his coloring, his brilliant dark eyes, unless it were a sort of inner glow, an ardor curbed by his almost childlike shyness, lack of self-confidence in everything apart from his music, that something at once finer and more cruelly persistent, vital, than is to be found in the purely Anglo-Saxon race. Though Jenny liked what she called a pretty tune, she knew nothing whatever of music, understood less, and yet almost from that first moment she understood Ben Cohen, realizing him as lover and child. Understood him better, maybe, then than she did later on, losing her sureness for a while, shaken and bewildered, everything blurred by her own immensity of love, longing of fearing that she did not understand, feeling out of it. But that was not for some time to come. In the meanwhile she was like a dear little bantam hen with one chick, while Ben himself was content to shelter under her wing until it grew upon him that, loving her as he did, loving his mother, realizing what it meant to be a mother in thinking of Jenny herself with a child, his child, in her arms, it was up to him to prove himself for their sakes, to make them proud of him and his music, without the faintest idea of how proud they were already, lift the whole weight of care from their shoulders. The worst of it was, he told them nothing whatever about it. The better sort of men are given to these crab-like ways of appearing to move away from what they intend to move towards. It simply seemed as though he were forgetting them a little, then more and more, elbowing them aside to clear the way for his beloved music. He was no longer deprecating, appealing, leaning upon them. Each woman thought of him as her child, and when his love made a man of him, they realized the hurt, nothing more. He overdid it, too, as genius does overdo things was brusque, entirely immersed in his great scheme. Sometimes he even laughed to himself over this. They don't know what I'm up to, he would declare to himself with a sense of triumph. He had never even thought of his music in the money sense before, but as his love and ambition for the two women grew upon him, he was like a child with a new toy. He would not only make a great name, he would make an immense fortune. His mind blinked, dazzled at the very thought. He moved with a new pride and also, alas, a new remoteness. His health had broken when he was about seventeen. His bent shoulders still showed that old drag upon the chest, and he was away in a sanatorium for a year. When he came back he was cured. It was young Sayre, the junior partner in the timber business, who had sent him away, and it was he who, when Ben returned, paid for lessons for him, so that he learnt to play as well as read music. From that time onward he had always stuck to the firm, working in the tally sheds, paid out of his earnings for the use of a room and a piano for practicing upon so many hours each week completely happy and contented. He had never even thought of leaving the business until he realized his immense love for Jenny, and through her for his mother, the necessity of doing something big. What did sacrifice matter? What did it matter being poor, hungry, shabby? 
What did anything matter, just for a while? There was so little he wanted. Meals were a nuisance. His eyes were so dazzled by the brilliance of the future, set upon a far horizon, that he forgot the path of the present, still beneath his feet. If his mother had not set food before him, he would scarcely have thought of it. But all the same, he ate it, and money had to be earned by some one or other. His mother had never let him know the actual pinch of poverty. She wore that shoe upon her own foot. He had no more idea than a child of the cost of mere daily necessities, and during the last few years, between his work and hers, they had been comfortable enough. "'We can hang on for a bit,' he said, when he spoke of leaving the woodyard, and she answered, almost with triumph, that she had hung on well enough before he'd earned aught but a licking. At first she was proud of reshouldering the entire burden. It made him more entirely hers. He could not do without her. Even with Jenny he could not do without her. But she had not been a young woman when Ben was born. She was old now, and tired, with that sort of tiredness which accumulates heaps up, and which no single night's rest can ever cure. The tiredness which is ready, more than ready, for a narrower bed, eternal sleep. Hold on till after the concert? Sorry for meself if I couldn't. The concert, that was the goal. There was a public hall at Clapton where Ben had chanced on some really good music, just one night of it, and quite by chance, and this, to his mind, ennobled the Claptonites. There was the place in which to start the revolutionizing of the musical world. Besides, and here he thought himself very canny, by no means a Jew for nothing, there were fine old houses at Clapton, and where there were such houses there must be rich people. When the date was actually arranged, he practiced for the best part of the day. While he was at home he read music. He lived in a maze of music. He never thought of advertising, collecting his public. He even avoided his old friends, his patrons at the timber-yard, overcome by agonies of shyness at the very thought of so much as mentioning his concert. Quite simply, in a way he did not even attempt to explain to himself, he felt that the world of London would scent it from far off. As to paid clacks, presentation tickets, patrons, advance agents, all the booming and flattery, the jam of the powder for an English audience, he had no idea of the existence of such things. Beethoven was wonderful, and he had found out wonderful things about him. That was enough. When the angel Gabriel blew the last trump, there would be no need to invite the dead to rise. Neither was there any need to invite the really elect to his concert. Not to hear him, Ben Cohen, but to hear Beethoven as he ought to be heard. That's how he felt. During those weeks of preparation for the concert, his mother worked desperately hard to keep their home together without his earnings, while Jenny helped. At first that had been enough for her, too, to help. But later... Throughout those long evenings, when, already tired from her work at the factory, she had stood sorting, sprinkling, folding, ironing, the two women got to a state where they scarcely dared to look at each other. Just a passing glance, a hardish stare, but no looking into. If he had but once said, I can't bear you to work so hard for me, everything would have been different, the fatigue wiped out. But he didn't. He didn't even know they were working for him, working beyond the limit of an ordinary working woman's working day, hard enough in all conscience. Men can't not be expected to notice things the way we do. That's what they told themselves. They did not say even this much to each other. But far, far away, out of sight, out of all actual knowledge, 
was the fear which neither of them would have dared to realize, a vague horror, a sort of ghost. He don't care. He's changed. And, indeed, this is how it appeared. All through that time he wore an odd look of excitement, triumph, pleasure, which lifted him away from himself. There was a sort of lilt in his very step. His eyes shone, his cheeks were flushed. When he cleared a pile of freshly ironed starched things from the end of a table, so as to spread out a score upon it, laid them on the floor where the cat padded them over with dirty feet, and his mother railed at him, as she still did rail, on any subject apart from this of not caring, he glanced up at her with bright amused eyes, his finger still following the black and white tangle of notes, looked at Jenny and laughed, actually laughed. "'You great oaf!' cried Mrs. Cohen, and could have killed him. Up at four o'clock next morning, re-washing, starching, ironing, she wretched with sick fatigue and something more. That sense of giddiness, of being hit on the head which had oppressed her of late. It was as though that laugh of Ben's had stuck like a bone in her chest, so sharp that she could scarcely draw breath, driven all the blood to her head. And yet it had been full of nothing but triumph, a sort of tender triumph, almost childish delight. He was going to do wonders, wonders, open a new world to them. He was so dazzled by his own work, dreams, by all he had in store for them, that he did not even see them, themselves, worn with toil, realize the meaning of it, the reason for it. In any case he would have laughed, because they had no idea how near it was to an end. That concert, it would be like nothing so much as opening a door into a new world, where they need never so much as soil a finger, floating around, dressed in silk, feeding from off the finest china, sleeping upon down. Manlike, his eyes were fixed upon the future. No two women had ever been loved as they were loved. All this work, this washing and ironing, it resembled nothing more than the opening scene in an opera, a sort of prelude for the sake of contrast. They would see Oh, yes, they would see. It was like that old childish, shut your eyes and open your mouth. But they, they were bound in the close-meshed straight waistcoat of endless toil, petty anxiety. The days and hours heaped in front of them obliterated all possible view of the future. In the beginning they had been as excited as he was over the thought of the concert. He must wear a rosette, no, a flower in his buttonhole, and white kid gloves. As he moved forward upon the platform, he must bow right and left, and draw them off as he bowed. This was Jenny's idea. It was Jenny who made him practice his bows, and it was Jenny who borrowed a dress suit from a waiter friend, while it was his mother who got up the borrowed shirt to go with it stiff and shining, who polished his best boots until they looked near as near like patent. All this had been done close upon a fortnight before. Jenny was a good girl, but if she was not there to see to things, Jenny might fail with a bubble on the shirt-front. No amount of meaning well was of any use in getting up a stiff shirt as it ought to be got up. Better have it all ready, a case o' anything happenin'. That was what Mrs. Cohen said to herself, with a dull dread at the back of her mind, a feeling as though every next day were a Friday. Her face had been oddly flushed of late, with a rather fixed and glassy look about the eyes. Jenny thought of this, on her way to the concert, alone, for by some ill fate, his nearer vision blurred in that golden maze of the future, Ben had fixed his concert for a Friday. This Friday, always a bad day, bad in itself, bad for everyone, like an east wind, worst of all for a laundress, 
not so depressing as a Monday, but so hurried, so overcrowded, with all the ironing and folding, the packing of the lots, all small, into their separate newspaper parcels, the accumulated fatigue of a whole week. Some demon seemed to possess her clients that week. They had come in with a collar here, a shirt there, an odd pillow-slip, tablecloth, right over Thursday. She was working until after twelve o'clock that night, and so was Jenny, up before dawn next morning, though no one save herself knew of this. Whatever they do, they shan't not keep me from my Ben's concert. That was what she said, with the vision of motors blocking the road in front of the little hall. But she had been a laundress best part of a lifetime, before she discovered herself as the mother of a genius, and it had bit into her bone. She could not get finished, and she could not leave the work undone. Someone's got to earn a living. That was what she said, embittered by fatigue, the sweat pouring down her face, beaten to every sensibility, apart from her swollen feet, by the time that Jenny called in for her, soon after six. She had longed to go, had never even thought of not going. But by now, apart from her physical pain and weariness, she was alive to but one point, her whole being drawn out to a sort of cone with an eye at the end of it, and far, far away at the back of her brain, struggling with impenetrable mists, but one thought, if she scorched anything, she would have to replace it. When Jenny found that it was impossible to move her, she made her own way up to Clapton alone, for Ben had to be at the hall early. There were certain matters to arrange, and he would try over the piano. Her efforts with Mrs. Cohen had delayed her. She was driven desperate by that cruel malice of inanimate things. Every bus and tram was against her, whisking out of sight just as she wanted them, or blocked by slow crawling carts and lorries. There was a tight, hard pain in her heart, like toothache, round which her whole body gathered, pressing, impaled upon it, a sense of desperation, and yet at the heart of this, like a nerve, the wonder if anything really mattered. Ben had promised to reserve seats for his mother and herself, but had he? Had he? Would she find the place blocked by swells with their hard stare? duchesses and such like, glistening in diamonds. In her mind's eye she saw billows of silk, slabs of black cloth and shining white shirt-fronts, hundreds and hundreds of them, and Ben bowing, bowing to them as she had taught him to do. For some time past he had been so far away, so detached, that she was haunted by the fear that if she put out a finger to touch him it might go through him, as though he were a ghost. At times she had caught him, held him to her in a passion of love and longing, but even then, with his head against her heart, his lips, or some pulse or nerve, had moved in a wordless tune, the beat of time. If only he had still seemed to need her, nothing, nothing would have mattered. But he didn't. He needed no one no one. He seemed so frail, she had made sure that he wanted looking after, but he didn't. A drunkard might have fallen down in the street, needed fetching, supporting, exhorting, a bully come home with a broken head. But it seemed as though Ben were, in reality, for all his air of appeal, sufficient to himself, moving like a steady light through the darkness, unstirred by so much as a breath of wind. Overcome by anxiety, she got out of the tram too soon. It had begun to rain, a dull, dark night, and there was a blur of misty light flooding the pavement a little way ahead. That must be the hall. She was afraid of overshooting the mark. Those trams had such a way of getting going just as one wanted to be out of them. But the light was nothing more than a cinema, and she had a good quarter of a mile to walk in the wet. The cruel wet. 
just like it to be wet on this night of all nights. Even her optimism was gone. She kept on thinking of Mrs. Cohen, her flushed face and oddly glazed eyes. The queer stiff way in which she moved held her head. For once she was angry with Ben. Em and his crowds, Em and his fine ladies, Em and his motor cars. After all, she did overshoot her mark. On inquiry for the hall, she was told that she had passed it, and was obliged to retrace her steps. End of Story 17, Part 1story seventeen of the best british short stories of nineteen twenty two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by david wales the best british short stories of nineteen twenty two by various story seventeen genius by eleanor mordaunt from Hutchinson's Magazine and The Century Magazine, 1921-1922. Part 2 No wonder she had passed it, with all she had expected at the back of her mind. The strip of pavement outside was dark, with not so much as a single taxi in sight. The door half shut, the dreary vestibule badly lighted, empty, smelling of damp, the sodden-looking sketch of a man in the pay-box seemed half asleep, stretched, yawned when she spoke, pushing a strip of pink paper towards her as she gave her name. For two, he poked out a long neck and peered round the edge of the box like a tortoise from its shell. The other lady was it not able to come to-night, answered Jenny with dignity, and the beast grinned, displaying a wreckage of broken teeth. "'Ain't not what you might call a crowd anyway,' he remarked. She could have killed him for that. She realized the white face of a clock, but she would not look at it. She was early, that was it. Look how she had hurried. No wonder that she was early. And great ladies were always late. She had learnt that from the Daily Mail stories. Two and two make four, them too late and me too early,' she said to herself, with a gallant effort after her own brisk way of taking things, a surer tap of heels on the stone floor, as she turned towards a swing door to her left, pushed it open, and was hit in the face by what seemed like a thick black curtain. A dim, white-gloved hand was thrust through it and took her ticket. Mind you don't fall. No good wasting the lights until they come, if ever they does come exhorted and explained a voice out of the darkness, for, after all, it was not a curtain, but just darkness. At first Jenny could see nothing. Then, little by little, it seemed as though different objects crept forward, one by one, like wild animals from their lair. Those white patches, the hands of two white-gloved men, holding sheaves of programs, she realized one between her own fingers, whispering together. There was the platform, the great piano sprawling over it, and in front of this rows and rows and rows, and rows upon rows, of empty seats. She looked behind her. They had argued long over the question of places for herself and his mother. The very best, that's what Ben had said, but they fought against this, fought and conquered, for the best seats meant money. What's a seat, more or less, I'd like to know? Money, all money! Old Mrs. Cohen had been firm upon this point. Still, there were a great many seats yet further back, and all empty. A little raised, seeming to push themselves forward, with the staring vacuity of an idiot. More seats overhead in a curving balcony rising above each other as though proud of their emptiness. It would have been impossible to believe that mere vacant places could wear so sinister as well as foolish an aspect. An idiot, but a cruel idiot, too. 
the whole thing one cruel idiot of the sort that likes to pull legs from flies. There was a clock there also. For a long while Jenny would not allow herself to look at it. But something drew her, until it became an unbearable effort to keep her eyes away from it, to look anywhere else, and at last she turned her head, stared sharply, defiantly, as though daring it. It was five and twenty minutes to nine. Five and twenty minutes to nine, and the concert was to have begun at eight. Five and twenty minutes to nine, and there was no one there, no one whatever. The clock hands dragged themselves on for another five minutes. Then one of the men disappeared behind the scene, came back, speaking excitedly, gesticulating with white hands. We're to turn on the light. He swears as he won't give it up. He's going to play. Going to play? Well, I'll be blowed. Going to play, and with nothing here but that. Jenny saw how he jerked his head in her direction. So she was that. She, Jenny Bly, and so far gone that she did not even care. As the lights went up, the hall seemed to swim in a sort of mist. The terracotta walls, the heavy curtains at either side of the platform, those awful, empty seats. Jenny spread her skirt wide, catching at the chair to either side of her, stretching out her arms along the backs of them. She had a wild feeling as though it were up to her to spread herself sufficiently to cover them all. She half rose. Perhaps she could hide more of that emptiness if she moved nearer to the front. That was her thought. But no, she mustn't do that. This was the place Ben had chosen for her. She must stay where she was. He might look there, miss her, and imagine that there was nobody, nobody at all, that even she had failed him. If only she could spread herself, spread herself indefinitely, multiply herself, anything, anything to cover those beastly chairs, sticking out there, grinning, shaming her man. Then she had a sudden idea of running into the street, entreating the people to come in, was upon her feet for the second time when Ben walked on to the platform. For once he was not ducking or moving sideways. He came straight forward, bowed to the front of him, right and left, drew off his gloves, and bowed again. Mingling with her agony of pity, a thrill ran through Jenny Bly at this. He remembered her teaching. He was hers, 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 after all, hers, more than ever, hers. The borrowed coat, far too big for him, rose in a sort of hood at the back of his neck. As he bowed, something happened to the center stud of his shirt, and it disappeared into an aperture shaped like a dark gourd in the whiteness. But for all that, Jenny felt herself overawed by his dignity, as any one would have been. There was something in the man so much greater than his clothes, greater than his conscious, half-childish self. Jenny's hands were raised to clap, but they dropped into her lap, lay there, as, with a face set like marble, Ben turned and seated himself at the piano. There was a moment's pause while he stared straight in front of him, such a pause that a feeling of goose-flesh ran down the back of her arms. Then he began to play. Jenny had not even glanced at her program. She would have understood nothing of it if she had, but it gave the Sonata Opus Three as the opening piece. Ben, however, took no notice of this, but for some reason he could not have explained, flung himself straightway into the third item, the tremendous Hammer Clavier. The sounds flooded the hall, swept through it as if it were not there, obliterating time and space. It was as though the heavenly host had descended upon the earth, sweet, wonderful, and yet terrible, with a sweep of pinions, deep-drawn breath, Two Balkane and his kind, deified, and yet human in their immense masculinity and strength. 
Jenny Bly was neither imaginative nor susceptible to sound, but it drew her out of herself. It was like bathing in a sea whose waves overpower one, so that, try as one may to cling to the earth, it slips off from beneath one's feet, shamed, beaten. She had a feeling that if it did not stop soon she would die, and would yet die when it did stop. Her heart beat thickly and heavily, her eyes were dim, she was bewildered, lost, and yet exhilarated. It was worse than an air raid, she thought, more exciting, more wonderful. The end left her almost as much exhausted as Ben himself. The sweat was running down his face as he got up from his seat, came forward to the front of the platform, and bowed right and left. Jenny had not clapped. She would as soon have thought of clapping God with his last trump, but Ben bowed as though a whole multitude had applauded him. By some chance, the only direction in which he did not turn his eyes was the gallery. Even then he might not have seen a single figure seated a little to one side, a man with a dark overcoat buttoned up to his chin, who clapped his two thumbs noiselessly together, drawing in his breath with a sort of whistle. "'That's the stuff,' he said. "'That's the stuff to give em. After a moment's pause, Ben turned again to the piano. This time he played the Sonata Pathétique in C minor, opus 13, then the Sonata Walstein in C major. Between each he got up, moved forward to the edge of the platform, and bowed. At the end of the Sonata, opus 3, by rights the first on the program, during the short interval which followed it he straightened his shoulders with a sort of swagger, utterly unlike himself, swung round to the piano again, and slammed out, God save the king. He played it through to the very end, then rose, bowed from where he stood, stared round at the empty hall, a dreadful, strained, defiant smile stiffening upon his face, and sinking back upon his stool, laid his arms across the keyboard with a crash of notes, burying his head upon them. In a moment Jenny was out of her seat. There were chairs in her way, and she kicked them aside, raked one forward with her foot, and scrambled onto the platform, then catching a sideways glimpse of the empty seats, bent forward and shook her fist at them. Beasts! Pigs! Ah, you! The attendants had disappeared. The stranger was lost in shadows. There was nobody there but themselves. It would not have mattered if there had been. All the lords and ladies, all the swells in the world, would not have mattered. The great empty hall, suddenly friendly, closed, curving around them. Jenny dropped upon her knees at Ben's side, and flung her arms about him with little moans of love and pity, slid one hand beneath his cheek with a muffled roll of notes, raised his head, and pressed it against her heart. There, my dear, there, my love, there, there, there. She laid her lips to his thick, dark hair in a passion of adoration, loving every lock of it, and then, womanlike, picked a white thread from off his black coat, clasped him afresh with joy and sorrow, like runnels of living water pouring through and through her. There, 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 there. He was too much of a child to fight against her. All his pride was gone. Oh, Jenny, 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 he cried. Then, in an extremity of innocent anguish, amazement, they didn't come. They don't care. They don't want it. Jenny, they don't want it. Don't you worry about them, their blighters, my darling, selfish pigs. They ain't not worth a thought. Don't you worry about them. But Beethoven. Don't you worry about Beethoven, neifer. Ain't no better nor he oughter be. Take my word for it. Letting you in like this here. There, 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 my dear. 
They clung together, weeping, rocking to and fro. Well, said the man in the gallery, I'm jiggered, and crept out very softly, stumbling a little because of the damp air, which seemed to have got into his eyes and made them smart. As the lovers came out into the little vestibule, clinging to each other, they did not so much as see the stranger, who stood talking to the man in the box office, but went straight out into the rain, with their umbrellas unopened in their hands. "'A good thing, as the all-people insists upon payment in advance,' remarked the man in the box office. The other gave him a curious, half-contemptuous glance. "'I'd like to hear you say that in a year's time.' "'Why?' because that chap will be able to buy and sell a place like this a hundred times over by then. Queen's Hall, Albert Hall, I know. It's my business to know. There's something about his playing. that something different they're all out for. It took a long time to get back to Canning Town. Even Jenny had lost her certainty, her grasp of the ways of buses and such things. She felt oddly clear and empty, like a room swept and garnished, with the sense of a ghost in some dim corner of it, physically sapped out. Ben clung to her. He said very little, but he clung to her, with an odd, lost air, the look of a child who has been slapped in the face and cannot understand why. She was so much smaller than he, like a diminutive, sturdy steam-tug, and yet if she could have carried him, she would have done so. As it was, she threw her whole heart and soul into guiding, comforting, thinking of a hundred things at once, her soft mouth folded tight with anxiety. How to prevent him from feeling shamed before his mother? How to keep the troubles away from her? Though at the back of her own mind was a feeling, and she had an idea that it would be at the back of old Mrs. Cohen's also, of immense relief of some load gone, almost as though her child had been through a bad attack of scarlet fever, or something which one does not take twice. With all this there was the thought of what she would step out and buy for their supper if the fried fish shop were still open, all she would do and say to cheer them. As for Ben, the Hammerclavier was surging through his brain, carrying the empty hall with it, those rows upon rows of empty seats, swinging them to and fro, so that he felt physically sick, as though he were at sea. Quite suddenly, as they got out of the last tram, the rain ceased. At the worst it had been a mild night of velvety darkness and soft airs, the reflection from the lamps swimming in a haze of gold across the wet pavement. But now, just as they reached the end of his own street, the black sky opened upon a wide sea of pinkish amber, and a full moon sailed into sight. At the same moment, Ben's sense of anguished bewilderment cleared away, leaving in its place a feeling of incalculable weariness. To be back in his own home again, that was all he asked. You'll stay the night at our place, Jenny. Yes, I promised your mother. Her brow knitted, and then cleared again. Ah, well, that was all over. Ben would go back to his regular job again, they would get married, then there would be her money, too. No need for old Mrs. Cohen to do another hand's turn. Plenty of time for her to rest now, all her life for resting in. Your mother, as she spoke, Ben remembered for the first time, actively remembered, for of course it was his mother that he meant when he thought of home, she wasn't there, Jenny. She wasn't there. She was very busy, hadn't not finished her work. Something beyond Jenny's will stiffened within her. So he had only just realized it. She tried not to remember, but she could not help it. The flushed face, the glassy eyes, the whole look of a woman beaten, with her back against a wall, condemning Ben by her very silence, desperate courage. Work? Yes, work. Jenny snapped it, hating herself for it, drawing him closer and yet unable to help it. Why? began Ben, and then stopped, horrified. 
At last he realized it. Perhaps it ran to him through Jenny's arm. Perhaps it was just that he was down on earth again, humble, ductile, seeing other people's lives as they were, not as he meant to make them. Tonight, workin? All night, one the same as another. But why? he began again, stopped dead, loosed his own arm and caught hers. All this while workin' like that. She works too hard, Jenny. Look here, she works too hard. And I, this damned music. Look here, Jenny, it's got to stop. I'll never play a note again. She shall never do a hard stroke of work again. Never, never. Not so long as I'm here to work for her. All my life, ever since I can remember, washing and ironing like, like the very devil. He pulled the girl along with him. That was what I was thinking all the time, to make a fortune so that you'd both have everything you wanted, a big house, servants, motors, silk dresses, and all the time letting you both work yourselves to death. But this is the end. No more of that. To be happy, that's all that matters. Sort of everyday happiness. No more of that beastly washing, ironing. It's the end of that, anyhow, when I'm back at the timber yard. He was like a child again, planning. They almost ran down the street. No more of that damned washing and ironing. No more work. True. How true. The street door opened straight into the little kitchen. She was not in bed, for the light was still burning. They could see it at either side of the blind, shrunk crooked with steam. There was one step down into the kitchen, but for all that the door would not open when they raised the latch and pushed it, stuck against something. Some of those beastly old clothes. Ben shoved it, hailing his mother. Mother! Mother! You've got something stuck against the door. Odd that she did not come to his help, quick as she always was. After all, it gave way too suddenly for him to altogether realize the oddness, and he stumbled forward right across the kitchen, seeing nothing until he turned and faced Jenny, still standing upon the step, staring downward with an ashy white face, wide eyes fixed upon old Mrs. Cohen, who lay there at her feet, resting, incomprehensibly resting. They need not have been so emphatic about it all. No more beastly washing, no more work. For the whole thing was out of their hands, once and for all. She had fallen across the doorway, a flat iron still in her hand, the weapon with which she had fought the world, kept the wolf from that same door. All the strain gone out of her face, a little twisted to the left side, and oddly smiling. One child's pinafore was still unironed. The rest were folded, finished. They raised her between them, laid her upon her bed. It was Jenny who washed her, wrapped her in clean linen. No one else should touch her. Ben, who sat by her with hardly a break, until the day that she was buried, wiped out with self-reproach, grief, desolate as any child, sodden, with tears. He collected all his music into a pile, the day before the funeral, gave it to Jenny to put under the copper, a burnt offering. If it hadn't been for that, she might be here now. I don't want ever to see it again, ever to hear a note of it. That was what he said. Jenny went back to the house with him after the funeral. She was going to give him his tea, and then return to her own room. In a week they were to be married, and she would be with him for good, looking after him. That evening, before she left, she would set his breakfast, cut his lunch ready for the morrow. By Saturday week they would be settled down to their regular life together. She would not think about his music, pushed it away at the back of her mind, over and done with, would not even allow herself the disloyalty of being glad, and yet was glad, deeply glad relieved, despite her pride in it, in him, as though it were something unknown, alien, dangerous, like things forbidden. Two men were waiting at the door of the narrow slip of a house. 
the tall thin one with his overcoat still buttoned up to his chin, and another fat and shining with a top hat, black frock coat, and white spats. About that concert, said the first man, we were thinking that if we could persuade you to play, put in the other. There was no one there, interrupted Ben roughly. His shoulders were bent, his head dropped forward on his chest, poking sideways, his eyes sullen as a child's. I was there, put in the first man, and I must say impressed. Very deeply impressed, added the other. But once again Ben brushed him aside. You were there, at my concert? Jenny, standing a little back, for they were all three crowded upon the tiny doorstep, saw him glance up at the speaker with something luminous shining through the darkness of his face. At my concert? And you liked it? You liked it? Like is scarcely the word. We feel that if you could be persuaded to give another concert, put in the stout man blandly, and would allow— I shall never play again. Never, never, cried Ben harshly. But this time the other went on imperturbably. Allow us to make all arrangements, take all responsibility, boom you, see to the advertising, and all that. We thought if we were to let practically all the seats for the first concert go in complimentary tickets, get a few good names on the committee, perhaps a princess or something of that sort as a patroness, a strong clack. Of course, playing Beethoven, playing him as you played him the other night, grand, magnificent, put in the first man, realizing the weariness, the drop to blank indifference in the musician's face. The Hammer Clavier, for instance. It was magical. Oh, yes, yes, that, that. Ben's eyes widened, his face glowed. He hummed a bar or so. Was there ever anything like it? My God, was there ever anything like it? Jenny, who had the key, squeezed past them at this, and ran through the kitchen to the scullery, where she filled the kettle and put it upon the gas ring to boil, looked round her for a moment, with quick darting eyes, like a small wild animal at bay in a strange place, then drew a bucket full of water, turned up her sleeves, the skirt of her new black frock, tied on an old hessian apron of Mrs. Cohen's with a savage jerk of the strings, and, dropping upon her knees, started to scrub the floor, the rough stone floor. Men, traipsin' in and out, muckin' up a place. She could hear the murmur of men's voices in the kitchen, and through it that traipsin' of other men struggling with a long coffin on the steep, narrow stairs. On and on it went, the agonized remembrance of all that banging, trampling, the swish of her own scrubbing brush, the voices round the table where old Mrs. Cohen had stood ironing for hours and hours upon end. Then the door into the scullery was opened. For a moment or so she kept her head obstinately lowered, determined that she would not look up. Then, feeling her own unkindness, she raised it and smiled upon Ben, who stood there, flushed, glowing, and yet too shamefaced to speak, smiling involuntarily as one must smile at a child. Well, that, that music stuff, I suppose it's burnt, he began, fidgeting from one foot to another, his head bent, ducking sideways, his shoulder to his ear. Her glance enwrapped him, smiling, loving, bittersweet. Things were not going to be as she had thought. None of that going out regularly to work, coming home to tea like other men. None of that safe sameness of life. At the back of her calm was a fierce battle. Then she rose to her feet, wiped her hands upon her apron, stooped to the lowest shelf of the cupboard, and drew out a pile of music. There you are, my dear. I didn't not burn it, a cause, well, I suppose as I sort of knowed all the time as you'd be wantin' it. Children. Well, one knew where one was with children, real children. But men, that was a different pair of shoes altogether. 
something you could never be sure of, unless you remembered, always remembered, to treat them as though they were grown up. Think of them as children. Now you take that and get along back to your friends and your plan and let me get on with my work. It'll be dark and tea time on us afore ever I've time to so much as turn around. That woman, said the fat shining man, as they moved away down the street, greasy with river mist, hang it all, where in the world are we to get a taxi? Commonplace little thing, a bit of a drag on him, I should think. Don't you believe it, my friend. That's the sort to give em, someone who will sort of dry nurse em, feed em, mind em. That's the wife for a genius, the only sort of wife. Mark my word for it. End of Story 17, Part 2story 18 of the best british short stories of 1922 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by david wales the best british short stories of 1922 by various story 18 the devil to pay by max pemberton from the storyteller 1922 to say that the usually amiable Ambrose Cleaver was in the devil of a temper would be merely to echo the words of his confidential clerk, John, who, looking through the glass partition between their offices, confessed to James, the office boy, that he had not seen such goings-on since old Ambrose, the founder of the firm, was gathered to his father's. "'There won't be a bit of furniture in the place presently,' said he and I wouldn't give tuppence for the cat when he's finished kicking her. This comes of the women, my boy. Never have nothing to say to a woman until you've finished your dinner and lighted your cigar. Many a good business have I seen go into the bankruptcy court because of a petticoat before lunch. You keep away from em if you want to be Lord Mayor of London, same as Dick Whittington was. James did not desire particularly to become Lord Mayor of London, but he was greatly amused by his employer's temper. "'Never heard such language,' said he, and him about to marry her. Why, he almost threw them jewels at her head, and when she told him he must have let the devil in by accident, he says as he was always glad to see her friends. They'll make a happy couple, surely." John shook his old dense head and would express no opinion upon the point. Misfortunes never come singly, said he. Here's that Count Florian waiting for him in the anteroom. Now that's a man I can't abide. If anybody told me he was the devil, I'd believe him soon enough. A bad un, James, or I don't know the breed. An evil man who seems to pollute the very air you breathe. James was not so sure of it. He give me half a crown for fetching of a cab yesterday, and told me to go to the music hall with it. He must have a lot of money, for he never smokes his cigars more than halfway through, and he wears a different scarf-pin every day. That's what comes of observation, Mr. John. I could tell you all the different pairs of trousers he's worn for the last three weeks, and so I'm going to make my fortune as the advertisements say. Mr. John would not argue about that. The bell of the inner office now tinkled, and that was an intimation that the Count Nicholas Florian was to be admitted to the Holy of Holies. So the old man hurried away, and, opening the sacred door with circumspection, narrowly escaped being knocked down by an enraged and hasty cat, glad to escape that inferno at any cost. "'You rang, sir?' Ambrose Cleaver, thirty-three years of age, square-jawed, fair-haired, a florid complexion, and with a wonderful pair of clear blue eyes, admitted that he did ring. "'And don't be so damned slow next time,' he snapped. "'I'll see the Count Florian at once.' The old man withdrew timidly, while his master mopped up the ink from the pot he had broken in his anger. "'Enough to try the devil himself!' was the sop that argument offered to his heated imagination. 
She knows I hate Deauville like poison, and of course it's to Deauville she must go for the honeymoon. And she looks so confoundedly pretty when she's in a temper. What wonderful eyes she's got! And when she's angry the curls get all round her ears, and it's as much as a man can do not to kiss her on the spot. Of course, I didn't really want her to have opals if she thinks they're unlucky, but she needn't have insisted that I knew about it and bought them on purpose to annoy her. Good God! I wish there were no women in the world sometimes. What a splendid place it would be to live in, and what a fine time the men would have! For, of course, they are all the daughters of the devil, really, and that's why they make life too hot for us. Mr. John entered at this moment, showing in the Count, and so a very cheerful argument was thus cut short. Ambrose pulled himself together, and suppressing, as best he could, any appearance of aversion from the caller who now presented himself, he sat back in his chair and prepared to hear the tale. Count Florian was at that time some fifty-nine years of age dark as an Italian, and not without trace of an Eastern origin. Though it was early in the month of May, he still wore a light Inverness cape of an ancient fashion, while his patent leather boots and his silk hat shone with the polish of a well-kept mirror. When he laughed, however, he showed ferocious teeth, some capped with gold, and in his eyes was a fiery light not always pleasant to behold. A chilly morning, he began. You have no fire, I see. You find it so? queried Ambrose. Well, I, I thought it quite warm. Ah, said the Count, you were born, of course, in this detestable country. Do not forget that where I live there are people who call the climate hell. And he laughed sardonically, with a laugh quite unpleasant to hear. Ambrose did not like such talk and showed his displeasure plainly. "'The climate is good enough for me,' he said. "'Personally, I don't want to live in the particular locality you name. Have a cigar, and tell me why you called. The old business, I suppose? Well, you know my opinion about that. I want none of it. I don't believe it is honest business, and I think that if we did it, we might all end in the dock. So you know my mind before we begin.' The Count heard him patiently, and did not seem in any way disturbed. "'There is very little business that is honest,' he said. "'Practically none at all. Look at politics, the church, art, the sciences. Those who flourish are the impostors, while your honest men are foolish enough to starve in garrets. If a man will undertake nothing that is open to the suspicion of self-interest, he should abandon all his affairs at once and retire to a monastery, where possibly he will discover that the prior is cheating the abbot and the cellarer cheating them both. You have a great business opportunity, and if anybody suffers it is only the government, which you must admit is a pure abstraction, suggesting chiefly a company of undiscovered rascals. The deal which I have to propose to you concerns a sum of half a million sterling, and that is not to be passed by lightly. I suggest, therefore, that at least you read the documents I have brought with me, and that we leave the matter of honesty to be discussed by the lawyers. He laid upon the table a bundle of papers as he spoke, and lighted a cigarette by lightly rubbing a match against the tip of the fourth finger of his left hand. Ambrose felt strangely uneasy. A most uncanny suspicion had come upon him while the man was speaking. He felt that no ordinary human being faced him, and that he might, in very truth, be talking with the devil. Nor would this idea quit him, despite its apparent absurdity. "'You must have great influence, Count,' he remarked presently, "'great influence to get such a valuable commission as this.' The Count was flattered. "'I have servants in every country,' he said. "'The rich are always my friends. The poor often come to me because they are not rich. Few who know me can do without me. Indeed, I may say that but for such men as I am the world would not go on. I am the mainspring of its endeavour.' 
and yet when I met you it was on the links above La Tourbie. The Count laughed, showing his glittering teeth as any carnivorous animal might have done. Ah, I remember. You met me when I was playing golf with a very saintly lady. Latterly, I hear, she has ceased to go to church and taken to bobbed hair. Women are strange creatures, Mr. Cleaver, but difficult, very difficult sometimes. I have had many disappointments with women. You find men easier? Indeed, there are few men who are not willing to go to the devil if the consideration be large enough. A woman, on the other hand, is too often a victim of her emotions. She will suffer eternal torment for the man she loves, and she will cheat for him. But for the rest of us, nothing, positively nothing at all. She is neither honest nor dishonest. She merely passes us by." "'Ah!' exclaimed Ambrose, a little wearily. "'I wish I could think that about my fiancée. She's just been up. That's why you find me upset. I bought her opals, and of course she wants diamonds. You see, I forgot she wasn't born in October." The Count nodded his head in sympathy. "'I must have a little talk to her. I am sure we shall be good friends. Miss Kitty Palmer, is it not? Forgive me, I read it in the newspapers. A charming face, but a little temper, I think. Well, well, there is no harm in that. What a dull place the world would be but for a little temper. You have much to be thankful for, Mr. Cleaver, very, very much. And now this concession, by which you will make two hundred thousand pounds at a very moderate estimate. There will be very little temper when you take home that news. No woman is angry with a man who makes money, but she has a great contempt for him who does not. Even if he made it dishonestly? She does not care a snap of the fingers how he makes it, believe me. And afterwards, when he goes to prison? Pshaw! Only fools go to prison. If your foolish principles were made the test, there would hardly be a free man in Mincing Lane. We should have to lock up the whole city. Come, let me have your signature, and I will do the rest. To refuse is madness. You are offered the chance of a lifetime." Ambrose did not reply to him immediately. It had come to him suddenly that this was the hour of a great temptation, and he sat very still conscious that his heart beat fast because of the evil that was near him. The Count watched him, meanwhile, as a wild beast may watch its prey. The man's eyes appeared to have turned to coals of fire. His fingers twitched, his teeth were on edge. He had even ceased to smoke. Well, he said at last, unable to suffer the silence any longer. Ambrose rose from his chair and went over slowly to the great safe which stood in the corner of his office. He unlocked it and took some documents from a shelf upon the right-hand side. The Count stood at his elbow while he did so, and he could feel the man's breath warm upon his shoulder. Suddenly a violent impulse overcame him. He swung round and seized the fellow by the collar and in an instant, endowed as it were with superhuman strength, he hurled the man into the safe and turned the key upon him. By heaven, he cried, but I have locked up the devil. 2. Ambrose dismissed John, the man, and James, the boy, and told them he would have no need of their services for some days. I am going away for a little holiday, he said. The letters can await my return. You may both go down to Brighton for a week, and I will pay your expenses. It is right that you should have a little change of air more than once a year, so away with you both, and don't let me hear of you until Monday next." James looked at John, and John looked at James. Was their excellent employer demented then, or had they understood him incorrectly? Not, said John, when they were alone together, that I particularly wished to go to Brighton just now, but there you are. 
half the pleasure in life my boy is wanting to do things and when you have to do them without wanting it even though they are pleasant things somehow all the savour has gone out of the salt so to speak but of course we shall have to go seeing that we couldn't tell mr cleaver a lie james was a little astonished at that for he had told thousands of lies in his brief life though now he really had no desire to tell one at all i shall be glad to get away from here for a few days anyhow he said it's so hot and close and when you go near the safe in the other orifice it's just as though you stood by a roaring fire good thing mr john that the thing is fireproof or we might have the whole show burned down as mr ambrose himself was saying very hot for the time of year james says he and burnin hot says i we'll find it cooler at brighton mr john and perhaps we can go to the pictures though i'm fed up with all them rotten stories about crooks and such like and so are you i'm sure mr john said that he was though he was surprised at such an opinion emanating from james when they locked up the inner office their master being gone home they discovered in the fire grate the ashes of what had been a formidable looking document and it really did seem as though the concrete upon which the great safe stood had become quite hot but there was no visible sign of fire and so they went off wondering and contented but by no means in a mood of exhilaration as properly they should have been ambrose had taken a cab at his own door and his first visit was to the bond street jeweller who had sold him the opals he was quite sure that he had shut up the devil in his office safe, and as he drove it seemed to him that he became conscious of a new world round about him, though just how it was new he could not have told you. Everybody wore a look of great content. There was subdued laughter, but no real merriment, nor did any hasten as though he had real business to do, while the very taxicabs drove with circumspection and actually waited for old ladies to cross the street before them. When his own cab stopped, he gave the man half a crown, as usual, but the driver called him back and pointed out his error. "'Excuse me, sir. Eighteen pence is the fare, with three pence for my gratuity. That makes one and nine pence. So I have to give you nine pence back, although I thank you all the same.' Ambrose pocketed the money quite insensible of anything but the man's civility, and entered immediately into the sanctum of the great jeweller. He found that worthy a little distrait and far from any desire to do big business. In fact, his first words told of his coming retirement from an occupation which had enriched him during a good forty years of profit, and rarely of loss. The fact is, Mr. Cleaver, that I foresee the day coming when women will wear no jewellery. Already the spirit of competition has passed, and it is by competition and the pride of competition that this trade has flourished. A woman buys a rope of pearls because another woman wears one. Lady A cannot allow Lady B to have more valuable diamonds than she possesses very few really admire the gems for their own sake and when you think of the crimes that have been committed because of them the envious passions they arouse and the swindles to which they give birth then indeed we may wish that every precious stone lay deep at the bottom of the sea but my dear sir are you not thus banishing much beauty from the world did not the Almighty create precious stones for pretty women to wear? The jeweler shrugged his shoulders, sweeping aside carelessly some priceless pearls that lay on the table before him. The Almighty created them to lie securely in their shells, or deep in the caverns of the earth, for the rivers to wash them with sweet waters, or the lurid fire to shape them in the bowels of the mountains. The beauties given us to enjoy are those upon which our eyes may light in the woodlands or from the heights, the glory of the sunset, the stillness of the sea, the thousand hues of a garden of flowers, 
or the cascade as it falls from the mountain top. These things are common to all, but the precious stone is too often for the neck or the fingers of the harlot and the adventurous. No, sir, I shall retire from this business and seek out some quiet spot where I can await with composure the solemn moment of dissolution we all must face. Ambrose was almost too astonished to speak. I admire your philosophy, he said at length, but the fact is that I want a diamond ring and a rope of pearls, and if— Ah, said the old man, interrupting him, it is odd that you should speak of pearls, for I have just been telling my partner here that whatever he may do in the future, he will find pearls of little profit to him. What with imitations and the cultured article, women are coming already to despise them. But even if you take your fiancé a diamond ring, will she not merely say to herself, An excellent beginning! Now what is the next thing I can get out of him? Be wise, and cultivate no such spirit of cupidity, foreign to a good woman's nature, but encouraged by the men, who for vanity's sake heap presents upon her. Take rather this little cross, set with pure amethysts, the emblem of faith, and so discover, my dear sir, whether she loves the man or the jewel, for indeed but few women love both, as all their story teaches us. Ambrose took the cross and thanked the old man for his words of wisdom. Another cab carried him on his way to Upper Gloucester Place, where Kitty Palmer then lived with her saintly mother, and as he went he reflected upon the jeweller's words. I'll put her to the proof, he said to himself. If she likes this two-penny half-penny cross, she is a miracle among women. But, of course, she won't like it, and there'll be another scene. What a devil of a temper she was in this morning, and how she made the fur fly! If she's like that now, I shall just take her into my arms and kiss her until she's done fighting. After all, I wouldn't give sixpence for a woman who had no spirit. It's their moods that make them so fascinating, little devils that they are at their best. The arrival at the house cut short his ruminations, and he hastened into the well-known drawing-room, and there waited impatiently while the maid summoned Kitty from her bedroom. She came down immediately to his great surprise, for usually she kept him waiting at least half an hour and her mood was strangely changed, he thought. A pretty, flaxen-haired, blue-eyed, cream-and-white English type she was, but her chin spoke also of determination, and the eyes which could look love to eyes that looked again, upon occasion could also speak of anger which resented all control. This afternoon, however, Kitty was as meek as a lamb. She had become so utterly changed in an hour that Ambrose hardly knew her. "'My dear girl,' he began, "'I am so sorry that I lost my temper this morning.' "'Oh, no, not you, Ambrose, dear. It was I. Of course it was awfully silly, and we won't go to Deauville if you don't want to. Let it be Fontainebleau, by all means, though really it does not seem important whether we do get married or don't while you love me.' Love, after all, is what matters, isn't it, Ambrose, dearest? He had to say that it was, though he did not like her argument. When, with some hesitation, and not a little fear, he showed her the little gold cross, she admitted to his astonishment that it was one of the prettiest things she had ever seen. Somehow, she said, I do not seem to care much for jewelry now. It has become so vulgar the commoner the people, the more diamonds they wear. I shall treasure this, darling. I'll wear it now, at lunch. Of course you are going to take me to lunch, aren't you? Suppose we go to the Ritz grill-room. The restaurants are so noisy, and I know that you like grill-rooms, don't you, dear?" Ambrose said yes, and they started off. Somehow he felt rather depressed, and he had to confess that Kitty, usually so smart, looked quite shabby. 
She wore one of her oldest dresses, and obviously had neither powder on her face nor the lightest touch of the rouge which became her so well. Moreover, she was listless beyond experience, and when he asked her if she would go to the Savoy and dance that night, she answered that she thought she would give up dancing altogether. It quite took his breath away. "'Give up dancing? But, Kitty, you're mad about it.' "'No, dear, I was mad to be mad about it. But what good does it do to anybody, just going up and down and round and round with a man you may never see again? Surely we were not sent into the world to do that. Ask the vicar of the parish what he thinks, or Dr. Lanfrey, who is doing such splendid work at the hospitals. I think we have to make good in life, and dancing surely will not help us. So I mean to give it up, and smoking, and all horrid things. I'm sure you'll like me better for that, dear. You know how jealous my dancing used to make you, but now you'll never have any cause to be jealous again." Ambrose did not know what to say. This seemed to him quite the flattest lunch he had ever sat out with her, while, as for the people round about, he thought he had never seen a duller lot. Perhaps, after all, he had been a little hasty in shutting up the devil so unceremoniously, but it made him laugh to think that the fellow would get no lunch anyway, and that his stock of cigars would hardly last him through the day. And, at any rate, he argued, the rascal will do no mischief to-day. He drove Kitty to the King's new hospital when the stupid meal was over. She was visiting some old people there and while he waited for her he met Dr. Lanfrey himself and had a little chat with that benevolent old gentleman. Naturally their talk concerned the hospital, and he was not a little surprised to find the worthy doctor altogether in an optimistic mood. "'Yes,' he said, "'we shall have no need of these costly places. Disease is disappearing rapidly from our midst. I see the day coming when men and women will go untroubled by any ailment from the cradle to the grave. In some ways, I confess, the world will be poorer. Think of all the human sympathy which human suffering awakens, the profound love of the mother for the ailing child, the sacrifice of those who wait and watch by the beds of the sick, the agony of parting leading to the eternal hope in the justice of God. All these things the world will miss when we conquer disease, and the spirit will be the poorer for them. Indeed, I foresee the day when men will forget the existence of God, just because they have no need to pray for those who suffer. The devil will have no work to do in that day, but who knows, humanity may be worse and not better because of his idleness. Ambrose agreed with him though he would never have expressed such sentiments to Kitty. He found her a little sad when she came out of the ward, and it seemed that all the patients were so very much better that they cared but little for her kindly attentions, and when she tried to read to them, most of them fell asleep. So she went back to Ambrose and asked him to drive to the vicarage, where she hoped to see Canon Kinney, her good pastor, and find out if he could tell her of some work of mercy to be done. I feel, she said, that I must find out the sorrow in the world. I must help it. But suppose, my dear, that there isn't any sorrow. Oh, then the world would not be worth living in. I should go out to the islands of the Pacific and become a missionary. Do you know, Ambrose, dear, I've often thought of putting on boys' clothes and going to live in the wilderness. A boy seems so much more active than a girl, and what does it matter since sex no longer counts?" He looked at her aghast. "'Sex no longer counts?' "'No,' she said in the simplest way. "'People will become too spiritual for that. You will have to love me as though I were your sister, Ambrose.' Ambrose gulped down a damn and was quite relieved to find himself presently in the study of the venerable canon, who was just leaving England for a continental holiday. He said that he was not tired, 
but really there was very little work to do, and he added with a laugh, it would almost appear, my children, as though someone had locked up the devil, and there was no more work left for us parsons. But that surely would be a great good thing, exclaimed Ambrose, astonished. In a way, yes, the canon rejoined, but consider, all life depends upon that impulse which comes of strife, strife of the body, strife of the soul. I worship God, believing He has called upon me to take my share in fighting the evil which is in the world. Remove that evil, and what is my inspiration? Beyond the grave, yes, there may be that sphere of holiness to which the human condition contributes nothing, a sphere in which all happiness, all goodness centers about the presence of the Eternal. But here we know that man must strive or perish, must fight or be conquered, must school his immortal soul in the fire of temptation and of suffering. So, I say, it may even be a bad day for the world, could the devil be chained in bonds which even he could not burst. It might even be the loss of the knowledge of the God by whom evil is permitted to live, that good may come. This and much more, he said, always in the tone of one who bared his head to destiny and had a faith unconquerable. When they left him, Kitty appeared to have made up her mind, and she spoke so earnestly that even her lover could not argue with her. Ambrose, dear, she said, I must see you no more. I shall devote my life to good works. Tonight I shall enter the convent of the little sisters at Kensington. It is a long, long good-bye, my dearest." He did not answer her, but calling a taxi, he ordered the man to drive to Throckmorton Street like the deuce. 3. He had told James and John to go home, but to his annoyance he found them still in the office, and busy as though nothing extraordinary had happened. Brushing by them, he dashed into the inner room and turned the key in the lock of his safe. "'Come out!' he cried, but nobody answered him. It was odd, but when he looked inside that massive room of steel, nobody was to be discerned there. At the same instant, however, he heard the Count's voice immediately behind him, and turning he discovered the man at his elbow. "'Well?' asked the fellow. So there he stood exactly in the same attitude as Ambrose had left him when he crossed the room to find the document. Indeed, the very same cigarette was held by his evil-looking fingers, and it was clear that he waited for the word which would signify acceptance of his contract. Good heavens, thought Ambrose, I must have imagined it all. He returned to his chair and tossed the paper across the table. I refuse to sign it, he said curtly. You had better call on Alderman Karlbard. He's a churchwarden, a justice of the peace, and a philanthropist. He's your man, and he's pretty sure to end in prison anyway. Uh, thank you for your introduction, said the Count quietly, and, bowing, he withdrew with the same nonchalant air as he had entered. Trust the devil to know when he is beaten. Ambrose watched him go, and then, calling John, he asked what time it was. A quarter to one, sir, said that worthy. Just in time to lunch with Kitty, Ambrose thought, and then, jumping up as a man who comes by a joyous idea, he cried, By gad, what a row I mean to have with her, the darling. End of Story 18 Story 19 of The Best British Short Stories of 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. The Best British Short Stories of 1922 by Various. 
STORY XIX EMPTY ARMS BY ROLAND PERTWEE FROM THE LADIES' HOME JOURNAL, 1922 There was a maroon wallpaper in the dining room abundantly decorated with sweeping curves unlike any known kind of vegetation. There were amber silk sashes to the Nottingham lace curtains in the huge bow window, and an amber winding sheet was wrapped about the terracotta pot in which a tired aspidistra bore forth a yearly leaf. Upon the Brussels carpet was a massive mahogany dining table, and facing the window a Georgian chiffonier, brass railed and surmounted by a convex mirror. The mantelpiece was draped in red serge, ball fringed. There were bronzes upon it and a marble clock, while above was an overmantel, columned and bemirrored, upon the shelves of which reposed sorrowful examples of Dalton ware and a pair of wrought iron candlesticks. It was a room divorced from all sense of youth and live beings, sunless, grave, unlovely, an arid room that bore to the nostrils the taint and humor of the tomb. From somewhere near the Edgware Road came the clot-clot of a late four-wheeler and the shake and rumble of an underground train. The curtains had been discreetly drawn, the gas turned off at the meter, and an hour had passed since the creaking of the old lady's shoes and the jingle of the plate-basket ascending the stairs had died away. A dim light from the street lamp outside percolated through the blinds and faintly illuminated the frame and canvas of a large picture hanging opposite the mantelpiece. It was a beautiful picture, a piece of perfect painting, three figures in a simple curve of rocks, lit as it were by an afterglow of sunset. In the center was a little Madonna draped in blue and gold. Her elbows were tight to her sides, and her upturned palms with their tender curving fingers were empty. It seemed almost as though they cradled someone who was not there. Her mouth was pulled down at the corners, as is a child's at the edge of tears, and in her eyes was a questing and bewildered look. To her right, leaning upon a slender staff, was the figure of St. John the Baptist, and upon his face also perplexity was written. A trick brushwork had given to his eyes a changing direction, whereby at a certain angle you would say he was looking at the Madonna, and again that he was following the direction of her gaze out into unknown places. His lips were shaped to the utterance of such a word as why or where. It seemed as though the two were in a partnership of sorrow or of search. The third figure was of St. Anne, standing a little behind and looking upward, a strange composition, oddly incomplete, giving an impression of sadness, of unrest, and of loss irredeemable. A clock was chiming the parts of an hour when the little Madonna stepped from the frame and tiptoed across the room. To her own reflection in the mirror opposite, she shook her head in a sorrowful negative. She peeped into a cupboard and behind the draperies of the mantelpiece, but there was nothing there. She paused before an engraving of Raphael's holy family, murmured, Happy Lady, and passed on. On a small Davenport table next to one of the two inexorable armchairs, she found the old lady's work-basket. That was a great piece of good fortune, since nightly it was locked away with the tea and stamps and other temptations that might persuade a soul to steal should opportunity allow. In the many years of her dwelling in the house, but three times only had she found it unguarded. There are glorious possibilities in a work-basket. Once she had found wool there, not carded, but a hank of it, soft, white, and most delicate to touch. To handle it had given her the queerest sensation. She had shut her eyes, and it had seemed to weave itself into the daintiest garments, very small, you understand, and with sleeves no longer than a middle finger. 
But it was a silly imagining, for not many days afterward, looking down from the canvas, she had seen the old lady, with her clicking ivory needles, knit the wool into an ugly pair of bed-socks. Quite a while she played in the basket that night. She liked the little pearl buttons in the pill-box, and the safety pins were nice, too. Kind and trustworthy pins they were, to hide their points beneath smooth round shields. She felt it would be good to take some of them back in one of her empty hands, and hide them in that little crevice of rock under the juniper tree. It was the banging of a front door opposite, and the sound of running footsteps, that moved her to the window. She drew back the curtain and peeped out across the way. There were lights in an upstairs window, and a shadow kept crossing and recrossing the blind. It was a nice shadow, and wore a headdress like her own, except that it was more sticky out. The hall, too, showed a light, and, looking up the street, she saw a maidservant, running very fast, disappear round the corner. After that there was silence for a long time. In the street no one moved. It was deserted, empty as the little Madonna's arms, and dark. A fine rain was falling, and there were no stars. The sound of distant traffic had died away. The last underground train had drilled its way through sulphurous tunnels to the sheds where engines sleep. She could not tell what kept her waiting at the window. Perhaps it was the moving shadow on the blind. Perhaps a prescience, a sense of happenings near at hand, wonderful yet frightening. A thousand other times she had looked across the street in the dead of night, only to shake her head and steal back sorrowfully to her canvas. But to-night it was different. There was a feeling of promise, as though the question that she ever asked with her eyes might at last be given an answer. The front door opened a second time, and a man came out, and though he was quite young, he looked older than the world. He was shaking and very white. His hair was disordered and straggled across his brow. He wore no collar, but held the lapels of his coat across his throat with trembling fingers. Fearfully he looked up the street where the maid had gone, then stamped his foot on the paving stones, and with his free hand rubbed his forehead and beat it with his knuckles. "'Oh, will he never come!' she heard him cry, and the words echoed through her as though they had been her own. If it was a prayer he had uttered, it was swiftly answered, for at the moment the maid and a bearded man came round the corner at a fast walk. The bearded man had a kind face and broad shoulders. She did not hear what passed between them, but the bearded man seemed confident and comfortable and compelling, and presently he and the maid went into the house, while the other man leaned against the railings and stared out before him at a tiny star which had appeared in a crack between the driven clouds. Lonely and afraid he looked and strangely like herself. The misery of him drew her irresistibly. Always before she had shunned the people of every day, having no understanding of their pleasures or sorrows, seeing little meaning in their lives or deaths. But here was a mortal who was different, who was magnetic, and almost without realizing, she passed out of the house, crossed the road, and stood before him, the corners of her cloak draped across her arms. He did not seem aware of her at once, and even when she spoke to him in Italian of the Renaissance he did not hear. So she spoke again, and this time in English. What is it? He started, rubbed his eyes, blinked at her, and answered, Hello, who are you? What is it? she repeated. H have you lost something? Don't, don't, he pleaded, don't even suggest such a thing, little lady. I won't. I only thought, and you look so sad. Be all right directly. It's the waiting. Kind of you to stop and speak to me. His eyes strayed over the gold and blue of her cloak. 
been to a theatre? he asked. She shook her head and looked up at him with a child's perplexity. A play? he amended. I've no one to play with, she answered simply. See? And she held out her empty arms. What's wrong, then? I don't know. She seemed to dwell on the last word. I only thought perhaps you could tell me. Tell you what? Help me to find it, perhaps. It seemed as if you were looking, too. That's why I came. Looking, he repeated. I'm waiting, that's all. Me, too. But it's such a long time, and I get no nearer. Nearer to what? Finding. Something you lost? I think so. Must be. I'll go back now. He put out a hand to stop her. Listen, he said, it'll be hours before I shall know. I'm frightened to spend them alone. Be a friend, little lady, and bear me company. Tisn't fair to ask, but if you could stay a little. I'll stay, she said. And will you talk to me? Yes. Tell me a story, then, just as if I were a kid, a child. A man isn't much more these times. At the word child, her arms went out to him, but dropped to her sides again as he said, a man. Come under the porch, where the rain won't spoil your pretty silk. That's better. Now tell away. They sat side by side, and she began to talk. He must have been listening for other sounds, or surely he would have been bewildered at the very beginning of what she told. It's hard to remember when one was alive, but I used to be, yes, hundreds of years ago. I lived, can't remember very well. There was a high wall all around, and a tower and a bell that rang for prayers, and long, long passages where we walked up and down to tell our beads. Outside were mountains with snow caps like the heads of the sisters, and it was cold as snow within, cold and pure as snow. I was sixteen years old and very unhappy. We did not know how to smile. That I learnt later and have forgotten since. There was the skull of a dead man upon the table where we sat to eat, that we might never forget to what favour we must come. There were no pretty rooms in that house. What would you call a pretty room, he asked, for the last sentence was the first of which he was aware. I don't know, she answered. I think a room with little beds and wooden bars across the window and a high fender would be a pretty room. We have been busy making such a room as that, he said. There's a wallpaper with pigs and chickens and huntsmen on it. But go on. There were iron bars to the window of my cell. He was very strong and tore them out with his hands as he stood up on the saddle of his horse. We rode into Florence as dawn broke, and the sun was an angry red. While we rode his arm was around me and my head upon his shoulder. He spoke in my ear, and his voice trembled for love of me. We had thrown away the raiment of the sisterhood to which I had belonged and as I lay across the saddle, I was wrapped in a cloak as crimson as the sun. "'Been reading Tennyson, little lady?' asked the man. She did not understand, and went on. It was a palace to which he brought me, bright with gold, mosaic, and fine hangings that dazzled my eyes after the grey they had been used to look upon. There were many servants and richly clad friends who frightened me with their laughter and the boldness of their looks. On his shoulder he bore me into the great dining hall, where they sat awaiting us, and one and all they rose to their feet, leaping upon stools and tables with uplifted goblets and shouting toasts. The noise was greater than any I had heard before and set my heart a-beating like the clapper of the convent bell. But one only stayed in his chair, and his looks were heavy with anger. 
At him the rest pointed fingers and called on him derisively to pay the wager and be glad. Whereat he tugged from his belt a bag of gold, which he flung at us as though with the will to injure. But he who held me caught the bag in his free hand, broke the sealed cord at the neck of it, and scattered the coins in a golden rain among the servants. After this he set me by his side at the board, gave me drink from a brimming goblet, and quails cooked in honey from wild bees, and silver dishes of nectarines and passion fruit. And presently, by twos and threes, the guests departed, singing and reeling as they went, and he and I were left alone. Alone, she repeated, shuddering. Did you hear anything? said the young man, raising his head. A cry? A little cry? No. I can hear footsteps moving up and down. Doctor's boots always creak. There! Listen! It was nothing. What were you saying? Twice in the months that followed I tried to run away, to return to the convent, but the servants whom I had counted my friends deceived me, and I was brought back to a beating, brought back strapped to his stirrup iron, as I might have been a Nubian slave. Long since he had ceased loving me. That lasted such a little while. He called me Madonna as though it were a term of shame, and cursed me for coldness and my nunnery ways. He was only happy when he read in my face the fear I held him in and I was always afraid. Afraid, echoed the man. Until tonight I was never afraid. And then my baby came, and I was not afraid any more, but contented all through. I carried him always in my arms by day and night, so pink and little and with a smile that warmed like sunshine. She paused and added plaintively, it's hard to remember when one was alive. My hands, my arms have forgotten the feel of him. I wish, said the man, I'd had a second opinion. It might have frightened her, though. Oh, heaven, how much longer! Oh, don't mind me, little lady. You're helping no end. You were speaking of baby, yes? He killed my baby, said the little Madonna because he had killed my fear of him. Then, being done with me, he threw me out in the streets alone. I thought to end it that night, because my arms were empty, and nothing could be good again. But I could not believe the baby was indeed gone. I thought if I searched I would find him in the course of time. Therefore I searched the city from end to end, and spoke with mothers, and peeped into nurseries, and knocked at many doors. And one day a door was opened by a man with great eyes and bronze hair swept back from his brow, a good man. He wore a loose smock over his doublet, smeared with many colors, and in his left hand he held a palette and brushes. When he saw me, he fell back a pace, and his mouth opened. Mother of mercy, he breathed, a real Madonna at last. His name was Andrea del Sarto, and he was a painter. I am a painter too, said the young man, forgetting his absorption at the mention of a great name. He brought me into his room, which was bright with windows and a fire. He bade me tell my story, and while I spoke, never once did his eyes desert me. When I had ended, he rose and walked up and down. Then he took from a chest a cloak of blue and gold, and draped it round me. Stand upon that throne, Madonna, said he, and I will put an infant in your arms that shall live down all the ages. And he painted me. So, with the child at my breast, I myself had passed into the picture and found contentment there. When it was finished, the great ones of many cities came to look upon it, and the story of how I came to be painted went from mouth to mouth. 
Among those who were there was he who had taken me from the nunnery, and seeing me in perfect happiness, a fury was born in him. I was hidden behind a hanging, and watched the black anger rising up and knotting his brow into ugly lines. He bought the canvas, and his servants carried it away. But since the child was in my arms for all time, it mattered little to me. Then one night two men came to my lodging, and without question took me across the city and led me into the palace where I had lived with him. And he came forward to meet me in the great hall. There was a mocking smile on his lips, and he pointed to a wall upon which a curtain was hanging. I took away that child, he said, because you valued it higher than the love of man. Look now. At a gesture a servant threw back the hanging and revealed the picture. The babe was gone, and my arms crooked to cradle him were empty with the palms upturned. I died then, to the sound of his laughter I died, and looking down from the canvas I watched them carry me away. And long into the night the man who twice had robbed me of my child sat at the long table staring out before him, drinking great draughts and sometimes beating the boards with his bare fists. As dawn broke he clapped his hands and a servant entered. He pointed at me with a shaking hand. "'Take it away!' he cried, "'to a cellar, and let masons brick up the door.' He was weeping as they carried me down to the dark beneath the house. "'What a strange being you are,' said the young man. "'You speak as though these were real memories. What happened to the picture, then?' "'I lay in the dark for so long hundreds of years, I think, and there was nowhere I might look. Afterward I was found, and packed in a box, and presently put upon the wall in the sad room, where everything is so old that I shall not find him there. This is the furthest I have dared to look. Help me find him, please. Won't you help me find him? Why, little lady, he answered soothingly, how shall I help? That's a woman's burden, that heaven isn't merciful enough to let a man share. He stopped abruptly and threw up his head. Did you hear that? There? Through the still early morning air came a faint, reedy cry. The young man was upon his feet, fiercely fitting a key into the lock. The little Madonna had risen, too, and her eyes were luminous like glow-worms in the dark. "'He's calling me!' she cried. "'He's calling!' "'Mine!' said the young man. She turned to follow, but the door closed between them. To the firm of Messrs. Ridgewell, Ridgewell, Hitchcock, and Plum was given the task of disposing of the furniture and effects of the late Sabina Prestwich, spinster, of 22A Cambridge Avenue, Hyde Park West. As Mr. Ridgewell, Jr., remarked to Mr. Plum, while engaged in compiling the sale list and supplying appropriate encomiums to describe an upright grand by Rubenthal, Berlin, Victorian muck! Lucky if we clean up two-fifty on the lot! Mr. Plum was disposed to agree. Though I must say, he added, it wouldn't surprise me if that picture was worth a bit. Half a mind to let old Kinnegy have a squint at it. Please yourself, responded Mr. Ridgewell, Jr., but to my mind it's ten guineas for Nix. It was the chance discovery of an old document, amongst a litter of receipts and papers, that persuaded them to engage an expert opinion. The document stated that the picture had been discovered bricked up in a Florentine cellar some fifty years before, and had been successfully smuggled out of Italy. But the man who found it died, and it passed, with a few other unvalued possessions, to Sabina Prestwich, now deceased. 
the result of Eden Kennedy's visit to the house in Cambridge Avenue was the immediate transference of the canvas to Sotheby's sale rooms, a concerted rush on the part of every European and American connoisseur, a threatening letter from the Italian Foreign Office, some extravagant bidding, and the ultimate purchase of the picture for the nation, after a heated debate on the part of twenty-two royal academicians and five painters of the new school, who would have accepted death rather than the letters R. A. after their names. Extensive correspondence appeared in the leading papers. Persons wrote expressing the opinion that the picture had never been painted by del Sarto, that it was the finest example of his work, that the price paid was a further example of government waste, and that the money would have been better employed repairing the main road between Croydon Town Hall and Sydenham High Street, the condition of which constituted a menace to motorcyclists. For nearly ten days scarcely a single publication appeared that failed to reproduce a comment or criticism upon the subject. But strangely enough, no single leader, writer, or casual contributor remarked upon the oddness of the composition or the absence of the infant from the Madonna's arms. In the course of time, that is to say on the eleventh day, the matter passed from the public mind, a circumstance explainable perhaps by the decent interment of the canvas in the National Gallery, where it affected no one save those mysterious folk who look at pictures for their pleasure, and the umbrella-less refugee who is driven to take shelter from the fierceness of storms. The little Madonna was placed upon a south wall, whence she could look out upon a brave company. And sometimes people would pause to gaze at her, and then shake their heads, and once a girl said, How sad she looks! I wonder why! and once a little old lady with industrious hands set up an easel before her and squeezed little twists of colour upon a palette, then thought a long time and pursed her lips and puzzled her brow and finally murmured, I could never copy it. It's so, so changing. And she too went away. The little Madonna did not dare to step from her frame at night for other mothers were at hand cradling their babies, and the sound of her footfalls might have wakened them. But it was hard to stay still and alone in that happy nursery. She could see through an archway to the right a picture Rubens had painted, and it was all aglow with babies like roses clustered at a porch, fat, dimpled babies who rolled and laughed in aerial garlands. It would have been nice to pick one and carry it back with her. Yet perhaps they were not really mother's children, but sprites and joys that had not learned the way to nestle. Had it been otherwise, surely the very call of her spirit must have brought one leaping to her arms. And then one day came a man and girl who stopped before her. The girl was half child, half woman and the man gray and bearded, but with brave blue eyes. It was seventeen years since the night she had stolen across the way and talked with this man in his hour of terror. But time did not cloud the little Madonna's memory with the dust of forgetfulness. "'That's the new del Sarto,' said the girl, who was reading from a small blue book. "'See, Daddy?' Then the man turned and looked at her fell back a step, came forward again, passed a hand across his mouth, and gasped. "'What is it?' asked the girl. He did not answer at once. Then, "'The night you were born,' he said. "'I'm certain. It's, it's del Sarto, too. And the poor empty arms, just how she looked, and I closed the door on her.' Daddy, what are you saying? There was a frightened tone in the girl's voice. It's all right, dear, don't mind me. I must find the keeper of the gallery. Poor little lady. Run back home. 
tell your mother I may be late. But, Daddy, there are more things in heaven and earth, he began, but did not finish. It seemed as though the Madonna's eyes were pleading to him, and it seemed as if he could still hear her say, Help me find him, please. He told his story to the committee of the National Gallery, and to do them credit it was received with the utmost courtesy. They did not require him to leave them while their decision was made. This was arrived at by a mere exchange of glances, a nod answered by a tilt of the head, a wave of the hand, a kindly smile, and the thing was done. As the chairman remarked, we must not forget that this gentleman was living at the time opposite to the house in which the picture was hanging, and it is possible that a light had been left burning in the room that contained it. Those of us who are fathers, and I regret for my own part that I cannot claim the distinction, will bear me out that the condition of a man's mind, during the painful period of waiting for news as to his wife's progress, is apt to depart from the normal and make room for imaginings that in saner moments he must dismiss as absurd. There has been a great deal of discussion, and not a little criticism on the part of the public, as to the committee's wisdom in purchasing this picture, and I am confident you will all agree with me that we could be responsible for no greater folly than to work upon the canvas with various removers on the bare hypothesis unsupported by surface suggestion that the Madonna's arms actually contain a child painted in the first intention. For my own part I am well assured that at no period of its being has the picture been tampered with, and it is a matter of no small surprise to me, sir, that an artist of your undoubted quality and achievement should hold a contrary opinion. We are greatly obliged for the courtesy of your visit, and trust that you will feel after this liberal discussion that your conscience is free from further responsibility in the matter. Good day. That was the end of the interview. Once again the door was slammed in the little Madonna's face. That night the man told his wife all about it. So you see, he concluded, there is nothing more I can do. But she lay awake and puzzled and yearned long after he had fallen asleep, and once she rose and peeped into the room that used to be the nursery. It was a changed room now, for the child had grown up, and where once pigs and chickens and huntsmen had jostled in happy farmyard disorder upon the walls, now there were likenesses of Owen Ares and uh, Henry Ainley obligingly autographed. But for her the spirit prevailed, the kindly bars still ribbed the windows, and the sense of sleeping children still haunted the air. And she it was who told the man what he must do, and although it scared him a great deal, he agreed, for in the end all good husbands obey their wives. It felt very eerie to be alone in the National Gallery in the dead of night, with a tiny electric lamp in one's buttonhole, and a sponge of alcohol and turpentine in one's hand. While he worked, the little Madonna's eyes rested upon him, and it could hardly have been mere fancy that made him believe they were full of gratitude and trust. At the end of an hour the outline of a child, faint and misty, appeared in her arms, its head, circled by a tiny white halo, snuggling against the curve of her little breast. Then the man stepped back and gave a shout of joy, and remembering the words the painter had used, he cried out, I will put an infant in your arms that shall live down all the ages. He had thought, perhaps, there would come an answering gladness from the Madonna herself, and looked into her face to find it, and truly enough it was there. Her eyes, which for centuries had looked questingly forth from the canvas, now drooped and rested upon the baby. Her mouth, so sadly downturned at the corners, had sweetened to a smile of perfect and serene content but the men will not believe he washed away the sadness of her looks with alcohol and turpentine 
i did not touch the head i am certain i did not he repeated then how can you explain oh heaven he answered put a child in any woman's arms end of story nineteen story twenty of the best british short stories of nineteen twenty two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by david wales the best british short stories of nineteen twenty two by various story twenty lena race by may sinclair from the dial nineteen twenty one nineteen twenty two she arranged herself there on that divan and i knew she'd come to tell me all about it it was wonderful how at forty-seven she could still give that effect of triumph and excess of something rich and ruinous and beautiful spread out on the brocades the attitude showed me that her affair with norman hipsley was prospering otherwise she couldn't have afforded the extravagance of it i know what you want i said you want me to congratulate you yes i do i congratulate you on your courage oh you don't like him she said placably no i don't like him at all he likes you she said he thinks no end of your painting. I'm not denying he's a judge of painting. I'm not even denying he can paint a little himself. Better than you, Raleigh. If you allow for the singular obscene ugliness of his imagination, yes. It's beautiful enough when he gets it into paint, she said. He makes beauty, his own beauty. Oh, very much his own well you just go on imitating other people's gods or somebody's she continued with her air of perfect reasonableness i know he isn't good-looking not half so good-looking as you are but i like him i like his slender little body and his clever faded face there's a quality about him a distinction and look at his eyes your mind doesn't come rushing and blazing out of your eyes my dear no no i'm afraid it doesn't rush and for all the blaze well that's what i'm in love with the rush raleigh and the blaze and i'm in love for the first time she underlined it with a man come i said come oh i know i know you're thinking of lawson young and dicky harper i was well they don't count i wasn't in love with lawson it was his career if he hadn't been a cabinet minister if he hadn't been so desperately gone on me if he hadn't said it all depended on me uh, yes i said i can see how it would go to your head it didn't it went to my heart she was quite serious and solemn. I held him in my hands, Raleigh, and he held England. I couldn't let him drop, could I? I had to think of England. It was wonderful, Lena Race thinking that she thought of England. I said, of course, but for your political foresight and your virtuous action, we should never have had tariff reform. We should never have had anything, she said and look at him now look how he's crumpled up since he left me it's pitiful it is i'm afraid mrs withers doesn't care about tariff reform poor thing no don't imagine i'm jealous of her raleigh she hasn't got him i mean she hasn't got what i had all the same he left you and you weren't ecstatically happy with him the last year or two I dare say I'd have done better to have married you, if that's what you mean. It wasn't what I meant. But she'd always entertained the illusion that she could marry me any minute if she wanted to. 
and I hadn't the heart to take it from her since it seemed to console her for the way, the really very infamous way, he had left her. So I said, much better. It would have been so nice, so safe, she said, but I never played for safety. Then she made one of her quick turns. Frances Archdale ought to marry you. Why doesn't she? How should I know? Frances's reasons would be exquisite. I suppose I didn't appeal to her sense of fitness. Sense of fiddlesticks! She just hasn't got any temperament, that girl. Any temperament for me, you mean? I mean pure cussedness, said Lena. Perhaps, but you see, if I were unfortunate enough, she probably would marry me. If I lost my eyesight, or a leg, or an arm, if I couldn't sell any more pictures. If you can understand Francis, you can understand me. That's how I felt about Dicky. I wasn't in love with him. I was sorry for him. I knew he'd go to pieces if I wasn't there to keep him together. Perhaps it's the maternal instinct. Perhaps, I said. Lena's reasons for her behavior amused me. They were never exquisite, like Frances's, but she was anxious that you should think they were. So you see, she said, they don't count, and Norrie really is the first. I reflected that he would be also probably the last. She had, no doubt, to make the most of him. But it was preposterous that she should waste so much good passion preposterous that she should imagine for one moment she could keep the fellow. I had to warn her. Of course, if you care to take the risk of him, I said, he won't stick to you, Lena. Why shouldn't he? I couldn't tell her. I couldn't say, because you're thirteen years older than he is. That would have been cruel. And it would have been absurd, too, when she could so easily look not a year older than his desiccated thirty-four. It took only a little success like this, her actual triumph in securing him. So I said, because it isn't in him, he's a bounder and a rotter, which was true. Not a bounder, Raleigh, dear. His father's Sir Gilbert Hipsley, Hipsley's of Leicestershire. A moral bounder, Lena, a slimy eel, slips and wriggles out of things. You'll never hold him. You're not his first affair, you know. I don't care, she said, as long as I'm his last. I could only stand and stare at that, her monstrous assumption of his fidelity. Why, he couldn't even be faithful to one art. He wrote as well as he painted, and he acted as well as he wrote, and he was never really happy with a talent till he had debauched it. The others, she said, don't bother me a bit. He's slipped and wriggled out of their clutches, if you like. Yet there was something about all of them. Distinguished. That's it. He's so awfully fine and fastidious about the women he takes up with. It flatters you makes you feel so sure of yourself. You know he wouldn't take up with you if you weren't fine and fastidious, too, one of his great ladies. You think I'm a snob, Raleigh? I think you don't mind coming after Lady Willersley. Well, she said, if you have to come after somebody. True. I asked her if she was giving me her reasons. Yes, if you want them. I don't. I'm content to love out of all reason. And she did. She loved extravagantly, unintelligibly, out of all reason, yet irrefutably, to the end. There's a sort of reason in that, isn't there? She had the sad logic of her passions. She got up and gathered herself together in her somber, violent beauty, and in its glittering sheath, her red fox skins, all her savage splendor, leaving a scent of crushed orris root in the warmth of her lair. Well, she managed to hold him tight for a year, fairly intact. 
I can't for the life of me imagine how she could have cared for the fellow, with his face all dried and frayed with make-up. There was something lithe and sinuous about him that may, of course, have appealed to her. And I can understand his infatuation. He was decadent, exhausted, and there would be moments when he found her primitive violence stimulating, before it wore him out. They kept up the menage for two astounding years. Well, not so very astounding, if you come to think of it. There was Lena's money, left her by old Weinberger, her maternal uncle. You've got to reckon with Lena's money. Not that she, poor soul, ever reckoned with it. She was absolutely free from that taint, and she couldn't conceive other people reckoning. Only, instinctively, she knew. She knew how to hold Hipsley. She knew there were things he couldn't resist, things like wines and motor-cars he could be faithful to. From the very beginning she built for permanence, for eternity. She took a house in Avenue Road with a studio for Hipsley in the garden. She bought a motor-car and engaged an inestimable cook. Lena's dinners in those years were exquisite affairs, and she took care to ask the right people, people who would be useful to Hipsley, dealers whom old Weinberger had known, and journalists and editors and publishers, and all his friends and her own, even friends' friends. Her hospitality was boundless and eccentric, and Hipsley liked that sort of thing. He thrived in a liberal air, an air of gorgeous spending, though he sported a supercilious smile at the fioritura, the luscious excess of it all. He had never had too much, poor devil, of his own. I've seen the little fellow swaggering about at her parties, with his sharp, frayed face, looking fine and fastidious, safeguarding himself with twinklings and gestures that gave the dear woman away. I've seen him, in goggles and a magnificent fur-lined coat, shouting to her chauffeur, giving counter-orders to her own, while she sat snuggling up in the corner of the car, smiling at his mastery. It went on till poor Lena was forty-nine. Then, as she said, she began to shake in her shoes. I told her it didn't matter so long as she didn't let him see her shaking. That depressed her, because she knew she couldn't hide it. There was nothing secret in her nature. She had always let them see, and they were bothering her, the others, more than a bit. She was jealous of every one of them of any woman he said more than five words to. Jealous of the models, first of all, before she found out they didn't matter. He was so used to them. She would stick there in his studio while they sat, until one day he got furious and turned her out of it. But she'd seen enough to set her mind at rest. He was fine and fastidious, and the models were all common. And their figures, Raleigh, you should have seen them when they were undressed. Of course, you have seen them. Well, there isn't, is there? And there wasn't. Hipsley had grown out of models just as he had grown out of cheap burgundy. And he'd left the stage, because he was tired of it. So there was, mercifully, no danger from that quarter. What she dreaded was the moment when he'd take to writing again, for then he'd have to have a secretary. Also, she was jealous of his writing, because it absorbed more of his attention than his painting, and exhausted him more, left her less of him. And that year, their third year, he flung up his painting and was, as she expressed it, at it again, worse than ever, and he wanted a secretary. She took care to find him one, one who wouldn't be dangerous. You should just see her, Raleigh. She brought her in to tea one day for me to look at, and say whether she would do. I wasn't sure. What can you be sure of? But I could see why Lena thought she would. 
She was a little unhealthy thing, dark and sallow and sulky, with thin lips that showed a lack of temperament, and she had a stiffness and preciseness like a board school teacher, just that touch of commonness which Lena relied on to put him off. She wore a shabby brown skirt and a yellowish blouse. Her name was Ethel Reeves. Lena had secured safety, she said, in the house. But what was the good of that, when outside it he was going about everywhere with Sybil Fermor? She came and told me all about it, with a sort of hope that I'd say something either consoling or revealing, something that she could go on. "'You know him, Raleigh,' she said. I reminded her that she hadn't always given me that credit. "'I know how he spends his time,' she said. "'How do you know?' "'Well, for one thing, Ethel tells me.' "'How does she know?' "'She, she posts the letters.' "'Does she read them?' "'She needn't. He's too transparent.' "'Lena, do you use her to spy on him?' I said. "'Well,' she retorted, "'if he uses her—' I asked her if it hadn't struck her that Sybil Fermor might be using him. "'Do you mean as a paravent? Or,' she revised it, "'a parachute?' "'For Bertie Granville,' I elucidated, "'a parachute, by all means.' She considered it. "'It won't work,' she said. "'If it's her reputation she's thinking of, wouldn't Norrie be worse? I said that was the beauty of him, if Letty Granville's attention was to be diverted. Oh, Raleigh, she said, do you really think it's that? I said I did, and she powdered her nose and said I was a dear, and I'd bucked her up no end, and went away quite happy. Letty Granville's divorce suit proved to her that I was right. The next time I saw her she told me she'd been mistaken about Sybil Fermor. It was Lady Hermione Nevin. Norrie had been using Sybil as a paravant for her. I said she was wrong again. Didn't she know that Hermione was engaged to Billy Craven? They were head over ears in love with each other. I asked her what on earth had made her think of her and she said Lady Hermione had paid him thirty guineas for a picture. That looked, she said, as if she was pretty far gone on him. She tended to disparage Hipsley's talents. Jealousy again. I said it looked as if he had the iciest reasons for cultivating Lady Hermione, and again she told me I was a dear. You don't know, Raleigh, what a comfort you are to me. Then Barbara Vining turned up out of nowhere, and from the first minute Lena gave herself up for lost. I'm done for, she said. I'd fight her if it was any good fighting. But what chance have I, at forty-nine against nineteen, and that face? The face was adorable, if you adore a child's face on a woman's body, small and pink, a soft, innocent forehead, fawn-skin hair, a fawn's nose, a fawn's mouth, a fawn's eyes. You saw her at Lena's garden parties, staring at Hipsley over the rim of her plate, while she browsed on Lena's cakes and ices, or bounding about Lena's tennis court with the sash ribbons flying from her little butt end. Oh, yes, she had her there, as much as he wanted and there would be Ethel Reeves in a new blouse, looking on from a back seat, subtle and sullen, or handing round cups and plates without speaking to anybody, like a servant. I used to think she spied on them for Lena. They were always mouthing about the garden together, or sitting secretly in corners. Lena even had her to stay with them. Let him take her for long drives in her car. She knew when she was beaten. I said, why do you let him do it, Lena? Why don't you turn them both neck and crop out of the house? Because I want him in it. I want him at any cost. And I want him to have what he wants, too, even if it's Barbara. I want him to be happy. I'm making a virtue of necessity. 
It can be done, Raleigh, if you give up beautifully. I put it to her it wasn't giving up beautifully to fret herself into an unbecoming illness, to carry her disaster on her face. She would come to me looking more ruined than ruinous, haggard and ashy, her eyes all shrunk and hot with crying, and stand before the glass, looking at herself, and dabbing on powder in an utter abandonment to misery. I know, she moaned, as if losing him wasn't enough, I must go and lose my looks. I know crying simply suicidal at my age, yet I keep on at it. I'm doing for myself. I'm digging my own grave, Raleigh, a little deeper every day. Then she said suddenly, Do you know, you're the only man in London I could come to, looking like this. I said, Isn't that a bit unkind of you? It sounds as though you thought I didn't matter. She broke down on that. Can't you see it's because I know I don't any more? Nobody cares whether my nose is red or not. But you're not a brute. You don't let me feel I don't matter. I know I never did matter to you, Raleigh, but the effect's soothing all the same. Ethel says if she were me she wouldn't stand it to have it going on under my nose. Ethel is so high-minded. I suppose it's easy to be high-minded if you've always looked like that. And if you've never had anybody, she doesn't know what it is. I tell you I'd rather have Nori there with Barbara than not have him at all. I thought and said that would just about suit Hipsley's book. He'd rather be there than anywhere else, since he had to be somewhere. To be sure, she irritated him with her perpetual clinging, and wore him out. I've seen him wince at the sound of her voice in the room. He'd say things to her, not often, but just enough to see how far he could go. He was afraid of going too far. He wasn't prepared to give up the comfort of Lena's house, the opulence, and peace. There wasn't one of Lena's wines he could have turned his back on. After all, when she worried him, he could keep himself locked up in the studio, away from her. There was Ethel Reeves, but Lena didn't worry about his being locked up with her. She was very kind to Hipley's secretary. Since she wasn't dangerous, she liked to see her there, well housed, eating rich food, and getting stronger and stronger every day. I must say, my heart bled for Lena when I thought of young Barbara. It was still bleeding when, one afternoon, she walked in with her old triumphant look. She wore her hat with an air crâne, and the powder on her face was even and intact, like the first pure fall of snow. She looked ten years younger, and I judged that Hipsley's affair with Barbara was at an end. Well, it had never had a beginning, nor the ghost of a beginning. It had never happened at all. She had come to tell me that, that there was nothing in it, nothing but her jealousy, the miserable, damnable jealousy that made her think things. She said it would be a lesson to her to trust him in the future, not to go falling in love. For, she argued, if he hadn't done it this time with Barbara, He'd never do it. I asked her how she knew he hadn't this time, when appearances all pointed that way. And she said that Barbara had come and told her. Somebody, it seemed, had been telling Barbara it was known that she had taken Hipsley from Lena, and that Lena was crying herself into a nervous breakdown. And the child had gone straight to Lena and told her it was a beastly lie. She hadn't taken Hipsley. She liked ragging with him and all that, and being seen about with him at parties, because he was a celebrity, and it made the other women, the women he wouldn't talk to, furious. But as for taking him, why, she wouldn't take him from anybody as a gift. She didn't want him, a scrubby old thing like that. She didn't like that dragged look about his mouth and the way the skin wrinkled on his eyelids. There was a sincerity about Barbara that would have blasted Hipsley if he'd known. Besides, she wouldn't have hurt Lena for the world. 
She wouldn't have spoken to Norrie if she'd dreamed that Lena minded. But Lena had seemed so remarkably not to mind. When she came to that part of it, she cried. Lena said that was all very well, and it didn't matter whether Barbara was in love with Norrie or not. But how did she know Norrie wasn't in love with her? And Barbara replied amazingly that of course she knew. They'd been alone together. When I remarked that it was precisely that, Lena said no. That was nothing in itself, but it would prove one way or another. And it seemed that when Norrie found himself alone with Barbara, he used to yawn. After that, Lena settled down to a period of felicity. She'd come to me, excited and exulting, bringing her poor little happiness with her like a new toy. She'd sit there looking at it, turning it over and over, and holding it up to me to show how beautiful it was. She pointed out to me that I had been wrong, and she right about him from the beginning. She knew him. And to think what a fool, what a damned silly fool I was with my jealousy, when all those years there was never anybody but me. Do you remember Sybil Fermor, and Lady Hermione, and Barbara? To think I should have so clean forgotten what he was like. Don't you think, Raleigh, there must be something in me, after all, to have kept him all those years? I said there must indeed have been, to have inspired so remarkable a passion. For Hipsley was making love to her all over again. Their happy relations were proclaimed, not only by her own engaging frankness, but still more by the marvelous renaissance of her beauty. She had given up her habit of jealousy, as she had given up eating sweets, because both were murderous to her complexion. Not that Hipsley gave her any cause. He had ceased to cultivate the society of young and pretty ladies, and devoted himself with almost ostentatious fidelity to Lena. Their affair had become irreproachable with time. It had the permanence of a successful marriage, without the unflattering element of legal obligation. And he had kept his secretary. Lena had left off being afraid either that Ethel would leave, or that Hipsley would put some dangerous woman in her place. There was no change in Ethel, except that she looked rather more subtle and less sullen. Lena ignored her subtlety as she had ignored her sulks. She had no more use for her as a confidant and spy, and Ethel lived in a back den off Hipsley's study with her Remington, and displayed a convenient apathy in allowing herself to be ignored. Really, Lena would say in the unusual moments when she thought of her, if it wasn't for the clicking, you wouldn't know she was there. And as a secretary she maintained, up to the last, an admirable efficiency. Up to the last. It was Hipsley's death that ended it. You know how it happened, suddenly, of heart failure, in Paris. He'd gone there with Furnival to get material for that book they were doing together. Lena was literally prostrated with the shock and Ethel Reeves had to go over to Paris to bring back his papers and his body. It was the day after the funeral that it all came out. Lena and Ethel were sitting up together over the papers and the letters, turning out his bureau. I suppose that, in the grand immunity his death conferred on her, poor Lena had become provokingly possessive. I can hear her saying to Ethel that there had never been anybody but her all those years, praising his faithfulness, holding out her dead happiness, and apologizing to Ethel for talking about it when Ethel didn't understand, never having had any. She must have said something like that to bring it on herself, just then, of all moments. And I can see Ethel Reeves sitting at his table stolidly sorting out his papers, wishing that Lena'd go away and leave her to her work. And her sullen eyes firing out questions, asking her what she wanted, what she had to do with Norman Hipsley's papers, what she was there for, fussing about when it was all over. 
What she wanted, what she had come for, was her letters. They were locked up in his bureau in the secret drawer. She told me what had happened then. Ethel lifted her sullen, subtle eyes and said, You think he kept them? She said she knew he'd kept them. They were in that drawer. And Ethel said, Well, then, he didn't. They aren't. He burnt them. We burnt them. We could at least get rid of them. Then she threw it at her. She had been Hipsley's mistress for three years. When Lena asked for proofs of the incredible assertion, she had her letters to show. Oh, it was her moment. She must have been looking out for it, saving up for it all those years. Gloating over her exquisite secret, her return for all the slighting and ignoring. That was what had made her poisonous, the fact that Lena hadn't reckoned with her, hadn't thought her dangerous, hadn't been afraid to leave Hipsley with her, the rich, arrogant contempt in her assumption that Ethel would do, and her comfortable confidences. It made her amorous and malignant. It stimulated her to the attempt. I think she must have hated Lena more vehemently than she loved Hipsley. She couldn't then have had much reliance on her power to capture, but her hatred was a perpetual suggestion. Supposing, supposing she were to try and take him. Then she had tried. I dare say she hadn't much difficulty. Hipsley wasn't quite so fine and fastidious as Lena thought him. I've no doubt he liked Ethel's unwholesomeness, just as he had liked the touch of morbidity in Lena. And the spying? That had been all part of the game, his and Ethel's. They played for safety, if you like. They had had to throw Lena off the scent. They used Sybil Fermor and Lady Hermione and Barbara Vining, one after the other, as their paravents. Finally, they had used Lena. That was their cleverest stroke. It brought them a permanent security. For, you see, Hipsley wasn't going to give up his free quarters, his studio, the dinners, and the motor-car, if he could help it. Not for Ethel, and Ethel knew it. They insured her, too. Can't you see her, letting herself go in an ecstasy of revenge, winding up with a hysterical youp? You? You thought it was you? It was me! 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 You thought what we meant you to think. Lena still comes and talks to me. To hear her you would suppose that Lawson Young and Dickie Harper never existed, that her passion for Norman Hipsley was the unique, solitary manifestation of her soul. It certainly burnt with the intensest flame. It certainly consumed her. What's left of hers all shriveled, warped, as she writhed in her fire. Yesterday she said to me, Raleigh, I'm glad he's dead, safe from her clutches. She'll cling for a little while to this last illusion that he had been reluctant, but I doubt if she really believes it now. For, you see, Ethel flourishes. In passion, you know, nothing succeeds like success, and her affair with Norman Hipsley advertised her, so that very soon it ranked as the first of a series of successes. She goes about dressed in stained-glass futurist muslins, and contrives provocative effects out of a tilted nose and sulky eyes, and sallowness set off by a black velvet band on the forehead, and a black scarf of hair dragged tight from a raking backward peak. I saw her the other night sketching a frivolous gesture. End of Story 20 Story 21 of The Best British Short Stories of 1922 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. The Best British Short Stories of 1922 by Various. Story 21, The Dice Thrower, by Sidney Southgate. From Color, 1922. Hunger is the most poignant when it has forced physical suffering to the highest point without impairing the mental functions. Thus it was with Silas Carringer, a young man of uncommonly high spirit, when he found himself a total stranger in a ramshackle Mexican city one rainy night in November. In his possession remained not a single article that he might have pawned for a morsel of food and he had already stripped his body of every shred of clothing except the few garments he was compelled by an inborn sense of the fitness of things to retain bodily starvation as a consequence was added to hunger and his misery was complete it chanced that an extraordinary happening awaited silas carringer that night in mexico otherwise he would either have drowned himself in the river within twenty-four hours or died of pneumonia within three days he had been without food for seventy hours and his mental desperation had driven him far in its race with his physical needs to consume the remaining strength of his emaciated body pale weak and tottering he took what comfort he could find in the savory odors which came streaming up from the basement kitchens of the restaurants in the main streets. He lacked the courage to beg or steal, for he had been reared as a gentleman, and was accordingly out of place in the world. His teeth chattered, his eyes had dark, ugly lines under them, he shambled, stooped, and gasped. He was too desperate to curse his fate. He could only long for food. He could not reason, he could not reflect. He could not understand that there were pitying hands somewhere that might gladly have succored him. He could think only of the hunger which consumed him, of the food that could give him warmth and comparative happiness. Staggering along the streets, he came at last to a restaurant a little way from the main thoroughfares. Stopping before the window, he stared greedily at the steak within, thick and juicy and lined with big fat oysters lying on ice, at the slices of ham as large as his hat, at the roasted chickens brown and ready for the table, and he ground his teeth, groaned, and staggered on. A few steps onward was a drinking saloon. At one side of it was a private door, with the words, Family Entrance, painted thereon. And in the recess of the door, which was closed, there stood the dark figure of a man. In spite of his own agony, Carringer saw something which appalled him in the stranger's face as the street light fell upon it. And yet, at the same time, he was fascinated. Perhaps it was the unspeakable anguish of those features that appealed to the starving man's sympathy, and he came to an uncertain halt at the doorway and stared rudely upon the stranger. At first the man did not notice him, seeming to look straight out into the street with a curious fixity of expression, and the death-like pallor of his face sent a chill through Carringer's limbs chilled nigh to stone, though they were already. The stranger caught sight of him at last. Ah, he said slowly, and with peculiar clearness, the rain has caught you too, without overcoat or umbrella. Stand in this doorway. There's room for two. The voice was not unkind, though it sounded strangely harsh. It was the first word that had been addressed to Carringer since hunger possessed him, and to be spoken to at all gave him cheer. So he took his place in the doorway, beside the mysterious stranger, who at once relapsed into his fixed gaze at nothingness across the street. "'It may rain for a long time,' he said, presently, stirring himself. "'I am cold, and I can feel you trembling and shivering.' 
Let us step inside and drink. He turned and opened the door. Carringer followed, hope slowly warming his chilled heart. The pale stranger led the way into one of the little private compartments with which the place was fitted. Before sitting down, he drew from his pocket a roll of bank bills. "'You are younger than I,' he said to Carringer. "'Will you go to the bar and buy a bottle of absinthe, and bring also a pitcher of water and some glasses? I don't like the waiters hanging round. Here is a twenty-dollar bill.' Carringer took the money and started down the corridor towards the bar. He clutched the sudden wealth in his hand tightly. It felt warm and comfortable, sending a delicious tingling sensation through his arm. How many glorious meals did not the money represent? He could smell an imaginary steak, broiled, with fat mushrooms and melted butter in the steaming dish. Then he paused and looked stealthily backward to where he had left the stranger. Why not slip away while he had the opportunity, away from the drinking saloon with the money, to the restaurant he had passed half an hour ago, and buy something to eat? It was risky, but— He hesitated, and the coward in him—there are other names than this—triumphed. He went straight to the bar, as the stranger had requested, and ordered the liquor. His step was weaker as he returned to the compartment. The stranger was sitting at the little table, staring at the opposite wall, just as he had stared across the street. He wore a wide-brimmed slouch hat, pulled well over his eyes. Carringer could only vaguely take the measure of the man's face. It was only after Carringer had set the bottle and the glasses on the table and seated himself opposite that the stranger noticed his return. "'Oh, you have brought it!' he exclaimed, without raising his voice. "'How kind of you! Now please close the door.' Carringer was counting out the change from his pocket, when the stranger interrupted him. "'I'll keep that,' he said. "'You will need it, for I am going to win it back in a way that may interest you. Let us drink first, though, and I will explain.' He mixed two drinks of absinthe with water, and the two men lifted their glasses. Carringer had never tasted the liquor before, and it offended his palate at first. But no sooner had it passed down his throat than he began to feel warm again, and the most delicious thrills. He had heard of the absinthe drinkers of Paris, and he wondered no longer at the deadly fascination of the liquor not realizing that his extreme weakness and the emptiness of his stomach made him peculiarly susceptible to its effects. "'This will do us good,' murmured the stranger, setting down his glass. "'Presently we shall have more. Meanwhile, tell me if you know how to play with the dice.' Carringer replied that he did not. "'I was afraid that you might not,' said the stranger. "'All the same,' please go to the bar and bring a dice-box. I would ring for it, he explained, seeing Carringer glance towards the bell, but I don't want the waiters coming in and out. Carringer brought the dice-box, closed the door carefully again, and the play began. It was not one of the simpler games, but had complications in which judgment as well as chance played a part. After a game or two without stakes, the stranger said, "'You have picked it up very quickly. All the same, I will show you that you don't understand it. We will throw for a dollar a game, and in that way I shall win the money that you received in change. Otherwise I would be robbing you, and I imagine that you cannot afford to lose. I mean no offense. I am a plain-spoken man, but I believe in honesty before politeness.' Here his face relaxed into a most fearful grin. I merely want a little recreation, and you are so good-natured that I am sure you will not object. On the contrary, replied Carringer politely, I shall enjoy it. Very well, but let us drink again before we start. I believe I am growing colder. They drank again. Carringer took the liquor now with relish, for it was something in his stomach, at least, 
and it warmed and soothed him. Then the play commenced. He won. The pale stranger smiled quietly and opened another game. Again Carringer won. Then the stranger pushed back his hat and fixed his quiet gaze upon his opponent, smiling yet. Carringer obtained a full view of the man's face for the first time, and it appalled him. He had begun to acquire a certain self-possession and ease, and the novelty of the adventure was beginning to pall before the new advances of his terrible hunger, when this revelation of the man's face threw him back into confusion. It was the extraordinary expression of the face that alarmed him. Never upon the face of a living being had he beheld a pallor so chilling, so death-like. The features were more than pale. They were ghastly as sunless frost. Carringer's powers of observation had been sharpened by the absinthe, and after having detected the stranger in an absent-minded effort on several occasions to stroke a beard which had no existence, he reflected that some of the whiteness of the face might be due to the recent shaving and removal of a full beard. The eyes were black, and his lower lip was purple. The hands were fine, white, and thin, and black veins bulged out upon them. After gazing for a few moments at Carringer, the stranger pulled his hat down over his eyes again. "'You are lucky,' he said, referring to the success of his opponent. "'Suppose we try another drink. There is nothing to sharpen a man's wits like absent and I see that you and I are going to have a delightful game. After the drink, the play proceeded. Carringer won from the first, rarely losing a game. He became greatly excited. Color flooded his cheeks, and he forgot his hunger. The stranger exhausted the little roll of bills which he had first produced, and drew forth another, much larger, in amount. There were several thousand dollars in the roll. At Carringer's right hand were his winnings, something like two hundred dollars. The stakes were raised, and the game went on. Another drink was taken, and then fortune turned to the stranger. He began to win easily. Carringer was stung by these reverses, and began to play with all the skill and judgment at his command. He took the lead again. Only once did it occur to him to wonder what he should do with the money if he continued to win. But a sense of honor decided for him that it belonged to the stranger. As the play went on, Carringer's physical suffering returned with increased aggressiveness. Sharp pains darted through him viciously, and he writhed within him and ground his teeth in agony. Could he not order a supper with his winnings, he wondered? No, it was, of course, out of the question. The stranger did not observe his suffering, for he was now completely absorbed in the game. He seemed puzzled and disconcerted. He played with great care, studying each throw minutely. Not a word escaped him. The two men drank occasionally, and the dice continued to rattle, and the money kept piling up at Carringer's hand. The pale stranger suddenly began to behave strangely. At moments he would start and throw back his head, listening intently. His eyes would sharpen and flash as he did so. Then they sank back into heaviness once more. Carringer saw a strange expression sweep over the man's face on several occasions, an expression of ghastly frightfulness, and the features would become fixed in a peculiar grimace. He noticed also that his companion was steadily sinking deeper and deeper into a condition of apathy. Occasionally, nonetheless, he would raise his eyes to Carringer's face after some lucky throw, and he would fix them upon him with a steadiness that made the starving man grow chiller than ever he had before. Then came the time when the stranger produced another roll of bills and braced himself for a bigger effort. With speech somewhat thick, but still deliberate and very quiet, he addressed his young opponent. 
you have won seventy four thousand dollars, and that is the exact amount I have remaining. We have been playing for several hours, and I am very tired, and so are you. Let us hasten the finish. You have seventy four thousand dollars. I have seventy four thousand dollars. Neither of us has a cent beside. Each will now stake his all and throw a final game for it. Without hesitation, Carringer agreed. The bills made a considerable pile upon the table. Carringer threw, and his starving heart beat violently as the pale stranger took up the dice box with exasperating deliberation. Hours seemed to pass before he threw but at last the dice rattled on to the table, and the pale stranger had won. The winner sat staring at the dice, and then he leaned slowly back in his chair, settled himself with seeming comfort, raised his eyes to Carringer's, and fixed that unearthly stare upon him. He did not speak. His face showed not a trace of emotion or even of intelligence. He simply stared. One cannot keep one's eyes open very long without winking, but the stranger never winked at all. He sat so motionless that Carringer became filled with a vague dread. I will go now, he said, standing back from the table. As he spoke, he recollected his position and found himself swaying like a drunken man. The stranger made no reply nor did he relax his gaze. Under that gaze the younger man shrank back into his chair, terrified and faint. A deathly silence filled the compartment. Suddenly he became aware that two men were talking in the next room, and he listened curiously. The walls were of wood, and he heard every word distinctly. Yes, said a voice, he was seen to turn into this street about three hours ago. And he must have shaved? He must have shaved. To remove a full beard would naturally make a great change in the man. His extreme pallor attracted attention. As you know, he has been seriously troubled with heart disease lately, and it has greatly altered him. Yes, but his old skill remains. Why, this is the most daring bank robbery we have ever had. A hundred and forty-eight thousand dollars. Think of it. How long is it since he came out of prison after that New York affair? Eight years. In that time he has grown a beard and lived by throwing dice. No human being can come out winner in a game with him. The two men clinked glasses and a silence fell between them. Then Carringer heard the shuffling of their feet as they passed out, and he sat on, suffering terrible mental and bodily pain. The silence remained unbroken, save for the sounds of voices far off and the clink of glasses. The dice players, the pale man and the starving one, sat gazing at each other with a hundred and forty-eight thousand dollars piled upon the table between them. The winner made no attempt to gather up the money. He merely sat and stared at Carringer, wholly unmoved by the conversation in the adjoining compartment. Carringer began to shake with an ague. The cold, unwavering gaze of the stranger sent ice into his veins. Unable to bear it longer, he moved to one side and was amazed to discover that the eyes of the pale man, instead of following him, remained fixed upon the spot where he had sat. A great fear came over him. He poured out absinthe for himself with shaking fingers, staring back at his companion all the while, watching him, watching him as he drank alone and unnoticed. He drained the glass, and the poison had a peculiar effect upon him. He felt his heart bounding with alarming force and rapidity, and his breathing came in great pumping spasms. His hunger was now become a deadly thing, for the absinthe was destroying his vitals. In terror he leaned forward to beg the hospitality of the stranger, 
but his whisper had no effect. One of the man's hands lay on the table. Carringer placed his own upon it, and drew back quickly, for the hand was as cold as stone. Then there came into the starving man's face a crafty expression, and he turned eagerly to the money. Silently he grasped the pile of bills with his skeleton fingers, looking stealthily every moment at the stark figure of his companion, mortally dreading lest he should stir. And yet, instead of hastening from the room with a stolen fortune, he sank back into his chair again. A deadly fascination forced him there, and he sat rigid, staring back into the wide stare of the other man. He felt his breath coming heavier, and his heartbeats growing weaker, but he was comforted because his hunger was no longer causing him that acute pain. He felt easier, and actually yawned. If he had dared, he would have gone to sleep. The pale stranger still stared at him, without ceasing. And Carringer had no inclination for anything but simply to stare back. The two detectives who had traced the notorious bank robber to the drink saloon moved slowly through the compartments, searching in every nook and cranny of the building. At last they reached a compartment from which no answer came when they knocked. They pushed the door open with a stereotyped apology on their lips. They beheld two men before them, one of middle age and the other very young, sitting perfectly still and in the queerest manner imaginable, staring at each other across the table. Between the two was a pile of money, and near at hand an empty absinthe bottle, a water pitcher, two glasses, and a dice box. The dice lay before the elder man as though he had just thrown them. With a quick movement one of the detectives covered the older man with a revolver and commanded him to put up his hands but the dice-thrower paid not the slightest heed. The detectives exchanged startled glances. They stepped nearer, looked closely into the gamesters' faces, and knew in the same instant that they were dead. End of Story 21 Story 22 of the best British short stories of 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. The best British short stories of 1922 by various. Story 22. The Stranger Woman by G. B. Stern from John London's Weekly, 1922. After Hal Burnham had banged himself with his usual vigor out of the house, Dicky sat quite inconsolably staring in front of him at a favorite picture on his wall, a dim, somber effect of keys and masts and intent hurrying men. His neat little brows were pulled down in a worried frown, his childish mouth was puckered. Was it accurate and just what Hal had said? Or, simpler still, was it true? What you damn well need, Dicky old son, is life in the raw. You're living in a lady's work-box here. It was a bludgeoning return for the courteous attention with which Dicky had that evening listened to his friend's experiences of travel, for Hal was not even a good raconteur. He started an anecdote by its point, and roughly slapped in the scenery afterwards. He had likewise a habit of disconnecting his impressions from any sequence of time. Also, he exaggerated, and forgot names and dates, and even occasionally lapsed into odd silence just when Dicky was offering himself receptively for a climax. And then the inevitable, well, and what have you been doing meanwhile? Dicky was not in the least at a loss. He had refurnished his rooms to begin with, and that involved a diligent search in antique shops and at sale rooms, and one or two trips across country in order not to miss a real gem. 
and they had to be ready for comfortable habitation before the arrival of Monsieur and Mademoiselle St. André for their annual stay with him, a delightful old pair, brother and sister, with peppery manners and hypercritical appreciation of a good cuisine, but so poor, so really painfully poor, that, as Dickie delicately put it, I could not help knowing that it might make a difference to them if I postponed their visit, of less trivial annoyance, but more vital in quality, than with other of my friends, for whom I should therefore have hurried my preparations rather less. This is incompetence, of course, my dear Howe. He had set himself to complete his collection of Watts's literary souvenirs, I have the whole eleven volumes now, and he had been a guest at two charming house-parties in the country, and at one of them had been given the full responsibility of rehearsing a comic opera in the late eighteenth-century style. Amateurs, of course, but I was so bent on realizing the flavor of the period that I'm indeed afraid that I did not draw a clear enough line between the deliciously robust and the obnoxiously coarse. Coarse? You? Hal guffawed, and then out came the accusation, which was so disturbing little Dicky. Life in the raw. Why did the phrase make him want to clear his throat? Raw, yes, that was the association, when you opened your mouth and the fog swirled in. Newsboys scampering along a foggy street that was neither elegant nor squalid, but just a street of mixed shops and mixed traffic and barrels lit with a row of flapping lights, and men and women with faces that showed they worked hard to earn a little less than they needed. Public houses, butcher shops with great slabs of red meat, yes, and a queue outside the picture palace, and a station. People bought the evening papers as they hurried in and out of the station. Here you are, sir, and on the sheets were headlines that blared out all the most sordid crimes of the past twenty-four hours, ignored during a sober morning of politics and commerce, but dragged into bold view for the people's more leisured reading. Newsboys in a foggy street on a Saturday night. Thus was Dickie's first instinct to define life in the raw. Then he discovered that this was only the archway, and that the crimes themselves were life in the raw, and the criminals. But one must get nearer by slow degrees, if at all. Hal had said that he was living in a lady's work-box. Dicky was sensitive, and not at all stupid. His penetration was quite aware that Burnham's remark was not applied to the harmonizing shades of the walls between which he dwelt nor to the soft, mellow pattern of his silky Persian rugs, nor to his collections, heavens, how he collected, of glowing Sevres china, of Second Empire miniatures, of quaint old musical instruments with names that in themselves were a tender tinkle of song, and of the shoes that had been worn by queens. All these things were merely accessories, his soul making neat tiny gestures, shrugging its shoulders, pointing a toe. What Hal meant was that Dicky dared not live dangerously. What am I to do? He raised wistful light brown eyes to the picture which was the one incongruous touch to the dainty perfection of his octagonal sitting-room. He had bought it at a rummage sale. It was unsigned, and the canvas, overcrowded with figures, had grown sombre and blurred. Yet, queerly, Dicky liked the suggestion of powerful, half-naked men, the foreign quayside street, with a slatternly woman silent against a doorway, and the clumsy ship straining to swing out to a menacing sea beyond. All these things that he would never do, strip and carry bales on his back, linger in strange doorways, and love hotly an animal woman who was unaccomplished and without grace and breeding, and then embark on an evil-smelling hulk that would have no human sympathy with his human ills. He had done a little yachting, of course, with the Anstays, the year before last. 
His lips bent to a small ironical smile as he reflected on the difference between "a little yachting" and the sinister fascination of that ugly, uninspired painting. Slowly he got up and went out. That is to say, he very precisely selected the hat, gloves, coat, and silk muffler suitable to wear, and as precisely put them on. Then he blew up the fire with an old-fashioned pair of worked brass bellows, turned out the lamp, told Mrs. Derrick, who would have died in his service every day from eight to eight o'clock, but would not crook a finger for him a minute before she entered the house, nor five seconds after she left it, that he was going for a walk and would certainly be back at a quarter to seven, but probably before, and then went out. For this was the natural way for Dickie Mayberry to behave. At twenty to seven he returned with a sheaf of newspapers, raucous, badly printed papers with smudged lines and a sort of speckled film over the illustrations, and startlingly intimate headlines to every item of news. Dickie was trying to get into touch with Life in the Raw. At first he was merely bewildered. He had read his daily newspaper, of course, though not with the stolid regularity with which the average man does so. And besides, it was preeminently a journal of dignity and good form, with an art column and a curio column, and a literary page, and a chess problem, and rather a delicately witty causerie by Rapier. It is to be feared that Dickie absorbed himself in these items first and altogether left out most of the topical and sensational news. Now, however, he read it, and out of it the horror of the underworld swayed up at him, a twilit world where cisterns dripped, and where homely familiar things like gas brackets and braces and coal shovels were turned to dreadful weapons of death. The coroner and the broker's man and the undertaker sidled in and out of this world, dispassionately playing their frequent parts. Stunted boys and girls died for love, like Romeo and Juliet, leaving behind them badly punctuated cries of passion and despair that made Dickie wince as he read them. Pale but fascinated, Dickie turned over a page and came to the great sensation of the moment. Is Ruth Oliver guilty? Dramatic developments. I wish you were dead, Lucas. The account of the first day of the trial filled the entire page and dribbled excitedly over on to the next. There was a photograph of Ruth Oliver accused of murdering her husband. You could see that she had gay eyes and a small oval face and a child's wistful mouth. This must have been taken while she was very happy. Dickie had never read through a murder trial before, but he did so now, every line of it, and the next day, and the next, until the woman who had pleaded not guilty was acquitted. And then he wrote to her and asked her to marry him. And who would dare say of him now that he had feared to meet life in the raw? He did not know, of course, that his offer was one among fifty, did not know that the curious state of mind he was in, between trance and hysteria, was a very common one to the public after a trial in which the elements are dramatic or the central figure in any way picturesque. He did not even know how Ruth Oliver was being noisily besieged by pressmen and editors anxious for her biography, by music hall and theatrical managers willing to star her, by old friends curiously proud of association with her notoriety, by religious fanatics with their proofs of a strictly localized deity whose hand has clearly been outstretched to save you by unhealthy flappers who had believed in her all along. Autograph, please. But not knowing, yet his letter, chivalrous, without ardor, promised her a cool, quiet retreat from the plague of insects which was buzzing and stinging in the hot air all about her. My house is in a little square with trees all around it. 
It is shady, and you cannot hear the traffic. I wonder if you are interested in old china and Japanese watercolors. Finally, I shall be very proud and happy if you can trust me to understand how deeply you must be longing for sanctuary after the sorrowful time you have been through. Sanctuary. She saw it open for her like a cloistered aisle between cold pillars. He offered her not the emotional variations, intolerable to her weariness just then of a new devotion, but green shaded rooms and the beauty of old things and a little old-fashioned gentleman's courtesy. So, ignoring the fifty other offers of marriage which had assailed her, she wrote to Dickie Mayberry and asked him to come and see her. He went, still in a strangely exultant mood, in which his will acted as easily and yet as fantastically as though it were on a slippery surface. And if he had met Hal Burnham on his way back from his visit to Ruth Oliver, he would undoubtedly have swaggered a little. Nevertheless, he was thinking of Ruth, too, as well as of his own daredevilry in thus seizing reality with both hands. Ruth's face, much older and more tormented than it had been in the photograph, had still that elusive quality which had from the beginning and through all the period of her trial haunted him. It outraged his refinement that any woman with the high looks and the breeding of his own class should have been for any space of time the property of a coarse public. As his wife the insult would be tenderly rectified. The poor child, the poor sweet child! He felt almost godlike with this new power upon him of acting on impulse. As for the peril of death which for a short while had threatened her, that was a fact too stark and hideous for contemplation, even with Dickie's altered appetite for primitive adventure. They did not leave town after their quiet, matter-of-fact wedding at the registrar's. A journey, in Dickie's eyes, would have seemed too blatant an interruption to his everyday existence, as though he were tactlessly emphasizing to his wife the necessity of a break and a complete change. She might even think, and again, poor child, that events should have rubbed into such super-sensitiveness that he was slightly ashamed of his act, and was therefore hustling her and himself out of sight. So they went straight home, and Mrs. Derrick said, Indeed, sir, when informed that her new mistress was the Ruth Oliver who had recently been acquitted of the charge of murdering her husband. She neither proffered a motherly bosom to Ruth, nor did she tender a haughty resignation from Mr. Maybury's service but said she hoped it wouldn't be expected of her, under the new circumstances, to arrive earlier, nor to leave later, because she couldn't do it. As for Dickie's friends, most of them were of the country-house variety, whom he visited once a year. Next autumn would show whether Ruth would be included in those week and weekend invitations. Meanwhile, those few dwelling in London, marveled in a detached sort of way at Dickie's feet, liked Ruth, and pronounced it a shame that she should have been accused. Hal Burnham, the indirect promoter of the match, had returned to China. Nobody was unkind. No word jarred. Life was padded in dim brocade. Ruth drew a long breath and was at peace. She was perfectly happy watching Dickie, and Dickie was at play again, enjoying his collection and his objets d'art, and even his daily habits, with the added appreciation of a gambler who had staked but miraculously not lost them. Because, after all, anything might have resulted from his tempestuous decision at all costs to get into contact with naked actuality. 
All that had resulted was the presence in his house of a slim, grave woman, who dressed her hair like a very skilful and not at all unconscious Madonna, whose taste was as fastidious as his own, and whose radiantly human smile had survived in vivid contrast to something quenched from her voice and shadowed in her eyes. A woman who, with a may I of half-laughing reverence, discovered that she could slip on to her exquisite feet one pair after another from his collection of the shoes of dead queens. It sounds like a ballade, Austin Dobson's, I think, except that they're not all powder-and-patch queens. For she had an excellent feel of period, the texture of it, the fine shades of language, the outlook. Dickie hated people who had a blunt sense of period, and in a jumbled fashion referred to old Venetian lace, and the early Spanish school, and Louise de la Vialliere, and a play by Wycherley indiscriminately, as historical. Yes, Dickie had certainly been lucky, and, like a wise man, he did not strain his star to another effort. The big thing, well, he had squared up to it, and, truth to say, he had been fearfully shaky and uncertain about his capacity to do so when Hal had first roused his pride in the matter. Now the little things again, the little beautiful things, he had earned them. Anyway, he could not have a newspaper in the house nowadays, for Ruth's sake. He owed it to Ruth to shut out forever those cries of horror and fear and violence from the battering underworld. What I love about the way we live, Dicky, is that the just rightness of it all flows on evenly the whole time. One can be certain of it. Most people's get it set aside for them in stray lumps, picture galleries and churches and a holiday on the continent, and all the rest of their time is just wrongness. Dickie wondered how much of her existence with Lucas Oliver had been just wrongness, or indeed all wrongness, but he never disturbed her surface of creamy serenity by referring to the husband who had been murdered by some person or persons unknown. He and Ruth were the most harmonious of comrades, but never, so far, confidential. Perhaps Dickie overdid tact and non-intrusiveness, or perhaps Ruth, in her very passion of gratitude to him, was yet checked for ever from passionate expression by the memory that her innermost love and her innermost hate, wrung into words, had once, and not so long ago, been read aloud and commented upon in public court and in half the homes of England. One evening, sitting together in front of the fire, they drifted into talk of their separate childhoods. There was a garden in mine, said Ruth and in mine, a casino garden. His eyes twinkled. Palm trees like giant pineapples, and flower beds in a pattern, and a fountain. Oh, you poor little continental kitty! He shrugged his shoulders. The ways of the Lord are thoughtful and orderly. Why should he have wasted a heavenly wilderness of gnarled old apple trees on a small boy who hated climbing? You can't have hated climbing, if you hang that on your wall. She nodded towards the quayside picture. Surely you must have played pirates in South Seas with your brothers. I had none. A sister, that's all, who carried a sunshade. I had no sisters, but there was a girl next door, and her brother. I note in jealous anguish of spirit, remarked Dickie, that you do not simply say a girl and a boy next door. Ruth's mischievous laugh affirmed his accusation. The wall was not very high. I kicked a foothold into it halfway up, and Tommy gave me a pull from the top. Tommy was ungallant enough to leave the wall to you? There were cherries in his garden sweet black cherries, 
and only crab-apples in ours. He might have filled his pockets with cherries, and then climbed. No, I reject Tommy. He was unworthy of you. I may have been a horrid little casino brat. I may even have worn a white satin sailor suit with trousers down to my ankles. Oh, Ruth winced. I may have danced too well, and I understood too early the art of complimenting ladies whose hats were too big and whose eyes were too bright. But once, after Annunziata Madalena's nose had bled over this same sailor suit, I said it was my own nose, because I knew how bitterly she was ashamed of her one bourgeois lapse. Tommy would have disowned her, instead of owning the nose. Oh, I grant you the nobler nature, but it breaks my heart that you didn't have the wild English garden and the cherries and the grubby old dark blue jersey. If we have a kitty, Dicky began softly, his mouth puckered to its special elvish little smile. Then he met her eyes lapping him round with such velvet tenderness that Dicky suddenly knew he was loved, knew that impulsively she was going to tell him so and breathlessly happier than he had ever been before, waited for it. I did kill my husband. They acquitted me, but I was guilty. It was an accident. I was so afraid. They would never have believed it could have been an accident. But I had to, in self-defense. And now she had told him she loved him. Only Dickie was too numb to recognize the form her confession of love had taken. Love, as always, was clamoring to be clearly seen, naked if need be, blood guilty if need be, but seen, and then swept up, sin and all, by another love big enough to accept this truth also as essentially part of her. Ruth waited several seconds for Dicky to speak. Then she got up and strolled over to the picture and said, examining intently, as though for the first time, the woman in the doorway, I'm not sorry, Dicky. That is to say, I'm sorry, of course, if I've shattered an illusion of yours, but I can't be melodramatic, you know, not even to the extent of using the word murderous on myself. If I hadn't killed Lucas, he would have killed you? So he was able to utter quite natural and coherent sounds. Dicky was surprised. Yes, but Ruth found that after all she could not tell Dicky much about Lucas. Lucas had not been a pleasant gentleman to live with, and there were things that Dicky was too fine himself and too innocent to realize. The only comprehension in this thoroughly well-groomed atmosphere of soft carpets and dim silken panels and miniatures and rare frail china might have come from the woman in the doorway of that incongruous picture, a woman sullenly patient, brutalized, but, yes, her man might quite easily have been another Lucas. For that which Dickie had always thought of as mysterious, elusive, was, to Ruth's eyes, only sorrowful wisdom. Come here, Ruth. She dragged her eyes away from the picture, crossed the room, broke down completely, her head on his knees, her shuddering body crouched closely to the floor. When you've been frightened, and have to live with it, and it doesn't even stop at night, for weeks and months and, and years. One's nerves aren't quite reliable. They've no right to call that murder, have they? Have they, Dicky? When you've been afraid for a long time, and there's no one you can tell about it except the person who makes the fear? But Dicky was all that she had perilously dared to hope he would be at this crisis. He soothed her and healed her by his loyalty, promised, without her extorting it, that he would never tell a soul what she had just told him. Pixie shy, yet he spoke of his personal need of her, 
and more than anything else she had desired to hear this. He mentioned some trivial, intimate plans for their unbroken, unchanged future together, so as to reassure her of its continuance. He even made her laugh. In fact, for a last appearance in the role of a gallant little gentleman, Dickie did not do so badly. He woke in the night from a bad dream, with terror clinging thickly about his senses. But it did not slowly dissolve and release him, as nightmare is wont to do. It remained, so that he lay still as a man in his winding-sheet, afraid to move, remembering. I did kill my husband. Yes, that was it. In the room with him was a strange woman who had killed her husband. Not Ruth, but a strange woman. How had she got into the room with him? She had killed her husband, and now he was her husband. He lay motionless, but his imagination began to crawl. What might happen to a man shut up alone in a house with a woman who murdered? His imagination began to race, and he lost control of it. Murder! With dry, sandy throat and a kicking heart, Dicky had to pay for his audacity in imagining he was big enough to claim life in the raw. Not big enough! Not big enough! The goblins of the underworld croaked at him in triumphant chorus. They capered, they snapped their fingers at him, they spun him down to where fear was. He had delivered himself to them by not being big enough. Mrs. Bigger had a baby. Which was bigger, Mrs. Bigger or the baby? The silly conundrum sprang at him from goodness knows what void, and over and over again he repeated it to himself, trying to remember the answer, trying to forget fear. Mrs. Bigger had a baby. He dared not fall asleep with the woman who had killed her husband alone in the room with him alone in the house with him. A stir from the other bed, and one arm flung out in sleep. Dickie's knees jerked violently. His skin went cold and sticky with sweat. You fool! It's only Ruth. But she did it. She did it once. There are people who can't kill, and a few, just a very few, who can and because they can, they are different, and have to be shut away from the herd. But, but, this woman, they've made a ghastly mistake. They've let her go free, and I can't tell anyone. Nobody knows except me and Ruth. Ah, yes, a, a quivering sigh of relief here. Ruth knows, too. Ruth, my wife. Ruth means pity. There is no Ruth. There never was. Quite alone, except for a strange, strange woman, the kind that gets shut away and kept by herself. To this bondage had Dickie's nerves delivered him. The custom of punctilious courtesy, so deeply ingrained as to mean in his case the impossibility of wounding another, decreed that some pretense must be kept up before Ruth but with one shock she divined the next morning the significant change in him, and bowed her head to it. What could she do? She loved him, but she had overrated the capacity of his spirit. There had never been any courage, only kindness and sweetness and chivalry, all no good to him now that courage was wanted. She had made a mistake in telling him the truth. Suffering she thought she had suffered fiercely with Lucas, she thought she had suffered while she was being ignominiously tried for her life. But what were either of these phrases compared with the helpless bitterness of seeing Dicky, whom she loved, afraid of her? Even her periodic fits of wild, arrogant passion, which usually, when they surged past restraint, wrecked and altered whatever situation was hemming her in, and left gaps for a passage through to something else, 
even these had now to be curbed. Useful in hate, they were impotent in love. So Ruth recognized in her new humility. But when, one day, seized by panic at having spoken irritably to her, Dickie hastily tried to propitiate her, to ingratiate himself so that she might spare him, might let him live a little longer, then Ruth felt she must cry aloud under the strain of this subtle torture. Why, he was her lover, her man, her child. In thought, her arm shaped itself into a crook for his head to lie there. Her fingers smoothed out the drawn perplexity of his brows. Her kisses were cool as snow on his hot, twitching little mouth. Her voice hushed to a lullaby croon, promised him that nobody would hurt him, nobody, while she was there to heal and protect. Sleep, baby, sleep, the hills are white with sheep. Over and over again she lulled herself with the old rhyme, for comfort's sake. But Dickie she could not comfort, since irony of ironies she was the cause of his pitiful breakdown. Why, if she spoke, he started. If she moved towards him, he shrank. Yet still Ruth dreamt that if he would only let her touch him, she could bring him reassurance. But meanwhile his appetite was meagre, the rare half-hours he slept were broken with evil dreams from which he awoke whimpering. He did not care any more about the little beautiful things he had collected and grouped about him, but sat for hours listless and blank, his appearance a grotesque parody of the trim and dapper Dicky Mayberry of the past. What could it matter how he looked with death slicing so close to him? The master seems poorly of late, don't he, ma'am? His digestion ain't strong. Perhaps something is disagreed with him. Thus Mrs. Derrick, taking her part in the drama as the simple character who makes speeches of more significant portent than she was aware of. Something had indeed disagreed with Dicky. In the slang phrase, he had bitten off more than he could chew. And the goblins were hunting him, whispering how she would creep up to him stealthily from behind, this woman who killed, and put her arms round him, and put her fingers to his throat. That was one way. Other ways there were, of course. He must learn about them all, so as to be watchful and prepared. Self-defense accident. Of course, they always said it was accident. He knew that now, for the evening crime sheets began to appear in the flat again, and Dicky studied them in place of the villanelles, the graceful essays, the belles of his former choice. Ruth saw him with his delicate shaking hands, clutching the newspapers, his mild eyes bright with sordid fascination. He was ill, certainly, and brain-sick and oppressed, and she yearned for his illness to show itself a tangible, serious matter, a matter of bed and doctor and complete prostration and unwearied effort on the part of his nurse. My darling, my darling, he did everything for me when I most needed it, and now I can do nothing. It isn't fair. She stood by one of the open windows of the pretty Watteau sitting-room. The lamps had just sprung to fiery stars in the blue, glamorous twilight of the square. The fragrance of wet lilac blew up to her, and a blackbird among the bushes began to sing like mad. The fist which was cruelly squeezing Ruth's spirit seemed slowly to unclench, and suddenly it struck her that things might be made worth while again for her and Dicky. After all, how insane it was for him to be huddling miserably, as she knew he would be, in the armchair of his study, gazing with forlorn eyes at the squalid columns which it had grown too dark for him to decipher. She had a vision of what this very evening might yet hold of recovered magic, 
if only she had the courage to carry out her simple cure of his head drawn down on to her left breast, just where her heart was beating. Dickie, it's all right, you know. It's only Ruth. I, you've been sitting with your bogies all the time. The white lilac has been coming out. A faint smile lay at last on Ruth's mouth, and in the curve of her tired eyelids. She went softly into the study. The door was open. Dicky sprang to his feet with a yell of terror as her hands came round his neck from behind. He clutched at the revolver in his pocket and fired, at random, backwards. In the wall behind them was the round, dark mark of a merciful bullet and dicky oh dicky when you've been frightened and have to live with it and it doesn't even stop at night do you understand now how it happens they've no right to call that murder have they dicky and now indeed understanding that the awful act of killing could be in a rare once or twice a human accident for the frightened little human to commit Understanding, Dickie was shocked back to sanity. Dear, dear Ruth! Why, this stranger woman was no stranger after all, but Ruth, his own sweet wife. Dickie was tired, and he knew he need not explain things to her. He laid his head down on her left breast, just where the heart was beating. End of Story 22 Story 23 of the Best British Short Stories of 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. The Best British Short Stories of 1922 by Various. Story 23 The Woman Who Sat Still by Perry Truscott from Color. 1922. When he went, when he had to go, he took with him the memory of her that had become crystallized, set for him in his own frequent words to her, standing at her side, looking down at her with his keen, restless eyes, such words as, It puzzles me how on earth you manage to sit so still. Then, enlarging, it is wonderful to me how you can keep so happy doing nothing, make of enforced idleness a positive pleasure. I suppose it is a gift, and I haven't got it, not a bit. It doesn't matter how tired I am, I have to keep going. People call it industry, but its real name is nervous energy, run riot. I can't even take a holiday peacefully. I must be actively playing if I cannot work. I'm just the direct descendant of the girl in the red shoes, they were red, weren't they, who had to dance on and on until she dropped. I shall go on and on until I drop, and then I shall attempt a few more useless yards on all fours. Come now, in answer to the way she shook her head at him, smiled at him from her sofa, you know very well how I envy you your gift, your power of sitting still happily still, your power of contemplation. And one day, more intimately still, with a sigh and a look, oh, a look she understood, to me you are the most restful person in the world. Why he went, except that he had to go, why he stayed away so long, so very long, are not really relevant to this story. The facts, stripped of conjecture, were simply these. She was married, and he was not, and there came the time, as it always comes in such relationships as theirs, when he had to choose between staying without honor and going quickly. He went. But even the bare facts concerning his protracted absence are less easily stated, because his absence dragged on long after the period when he might, with impeccable honor, have returned. 
The likeliest solution was that setting her aside when he had to, served so to cut in two his life, so wrenched at his heartstrings, so burnt and bruised his spirit, that when, in his active fashion, he had lived some of the hurt down, he could not bring himself easily to reopen the old subject. Fresh wounds for him might still lurk in it. How could he tell? Although it had been, at the call, the insistence of honor, still hadn't he left her, deserted her? Does any woman, even his own appointed woman, forgive a man who goes speechless away? Useless, useless speculation. For some reason, some man's reason, when another's death made her a free woman, yet he lingered and did not come. He knew afterwards that it was from the first his intention to claim her. He wanted her, deep down he wanted her, as he had always wanted her, meant to come, some time, knew all the time that he could not always keep away. And then, responding to a sudden whim, some turn of his quickly moving mind, a mind that could forcibly bury a subject and as forcibly resurrect it, hot-foot and eager he came. He had left her recovering slowly and surely from a long illness, an illness that must have proved fatal but for her gift of tranquillity, her great gift of keeping absolutely, restfully still in body, while retaining a happily occupied mind her books, and her big quiet room, and the glimpse of the flower-decked garden from her window, with just these things to help her, she had dug herself into the deep heart of life where the wells of contentment spring. Bird song in the early morn, and the long still day before her in which to find herself, to take a new, firmer hold on the hidden strength of the world and, just to keep her in touch with the surface of things, visits from her friends. Then later, more tightly gripping actuality, with a new, keen, sharp, growing pleasure, the visits of a friend. While those lasted, there was nothing she would have changed for her quiet room, her sofa, the room that he lit with his coming, where she rested and rested, shut in with the memory of all he said, looked, thought in her presence, until again he came. While they lasted, she had been content, never strong, never able to do very much, with seclusion before. During the time of his visits she reveled, rejoiced in it, asking nothing further. While they lasted, sitting still, oh, so still, hugging her joy, she didn't think, wouldn't think, how it might end. Sometimes, just sometimes, by a merciful providence, things do not end. She lived for months on the bare chance of its not ending. Yet, as we know, the end came. At first, while the world called her widowed, she sat with her unwidowed heart waiting for him in the old room, in the old way. Surely now he would come? She had given good measure of fondness and duty and friendship, that was only that, under another name, to the one who until now had stood between her and her heart's desire, and parting with him, and all the associations that went with him, had surprisingly hurt her always frail, she was ill, torn with sorrow and pity, and then very slowly again she recovered, and while she recovered, lying still in the old way, she gave her heart wings, wild surging wings, at last, at last, sped it forth, forth to bring her joy, to compel it. While she waited in this fashion, a sweet, recaptured sense of familiarity made his coming seem imminent. She had only to wait, and he would be here. She couldn't have mistaken the looks that had never been translated into words, that hadn't needed words. 
Though she had longed and ached for a word, then, she was quite content now. He had wanted her just as she was, unashamed and untainted. And to preserve her as she was, he had gone away. And now, for the very first time, she was truly glad he had gone in that abrupt, speechless fashion, in spite of the heartache and the long years between them, really and truly glad. Nothing had been spoilt. They had snatched at no stolen joys. And the rapture, what rapture, of meeting would blot out all that they had suffered in silence the separation, all of it. As she waited, getting well for him, she had no regrets, growing more and more sure of his coming. It was not until she was well again, not until the months had piled themselves on each other, that, growing more frightened than she knew, she began her new work of preparation. Suddenly, impulsively, when she had reached the stage of giving him up for days at a time, when hope had nearly abandoned her, then he came. He had left a woman so hopeful in outlook, so young and peaceful in spirit, that with her the advancing years would not matter. On his journey back to her, visualizing her afresh, touching up his memory of her, he pictured her going a little gray. That would suit her. Gray was her color, blending to lavender in the clothes she always wore for him. A little gray, but her clear, pale skin unfaded, her large eyes full of pure, guarded secrets, secrets soon to unfold for him alone. A haven, a haven. So he thought of her, and now, ready for her, coming to her, he craved the rest she would give him, rest more than anything in all the world. She with her sweet white hands, when he held them, kissed them, would unlock the doors of peace for him, drawing him into her life, letting him potter and linger, linger at her side. Even when long ago he had insisted to her that for him there was no way of rest, he had known that she, just she, meant rest for him when he could claim her for his own. Other women, other pursuits, offered him excitement, stimulation, and then a weariness too profound for words. But rest, bodily, spiritually, was her unique gift for him. She, he smiled as he thought it, would teach him to sit still. And tired, so tired, he hurried to her across the world as fast as he could go. Waiting at her door, the door opened, crossing the threshold. Oh, he had never thought his luck would be so great as to be taken direct to the well-remembered room upstairs. Yet, with only a few short inquiries, he was taken there. She for whom he asked, the mistress of the house, would be in her sitting-room, he was told, and if he was an old friend, he explained that he was a very old friend, following the maid upstairs. But the maid was mistaken. Her mistress was not in her private sitting-room, not in the house at all. She had gone out, and it proved an investigation that she had left no word. The maid, returning, suggested, however, that she would not be long. Her mistress had a meeting this evening. She was expecting someone before dinner. No, she would certainly not be long. So, so, if he would like to wait? He elected to wait, a little impatiently. He knew it was absurd, that coming without warning. After how many years was it? he should yet have made so sure of finding her at home. Absurd, unreasonable, and yet he was disappointed. He ought to have written, but he had not waited to write. He had pictured the meeting, how many times? Times without number, 
and always pictured her waiting at home. And then the room. Left alone in it, he paced the room. But the room enshrined in his heart of hearts was not this room. Was there? Surely there was some mistake. There could be no mistake. There could not be two upstairs rooms in this comparatively small house, of this size and with this aspect, westward and overlooking with two large windows the little walled garden into which he had so often gazed, standing and talking to her, saying over his shoulders the things he dare not say face to face, that would have meant so much more, helped out with look and gesture face to face. The garden, as far as he could see, was the same, except that he fancied it less trim, less perfect in order. In the old days it would be for months at a time all the outside world she saw. There had been object enough in keeping it trim. Now it looked, to his fancy, like a woman whose beauty was fading a little because she had lost incentive to be beautiful. He turned from the garden, his heart amazed, fearful, back to the room. The room of the old days. With closed eyes he reproduced it. Its white walls, its few good pictures, its curtains and carpet of deep blue. Her sofa by the window, the wide armchair on which he always sat, the table where, in and out of season, roses, his roses, stood the little old gilt clock on the mantelpiece that so quickly, cruelly, ticked away their hour. Books, books everywhere, the most important journals, and a medley of the lighter magazines, those with her work-basket, proving her feminine and the range of her interests, her inconsistency. A woman's room, revealing at a glance her individuality, her spirit. But this room. He looked for the familiar things, the sofa, the bookshelves, the little table dedicated to flowers. Yes, the sofa was there, but pushed away as though seldom used. On the bookshelves new, strange books were crowding out the old. On the little table drooped a few faded flowers in an awkward vase. On the mantelpiece, where she would never have more than one or two good ornaments, and the old gilt clock, were now stacks of papers, a rack bulging with packing materials, something like that, an ink bottle, and a candlestick, the candle trailing over with sealing wax, and an untidy ball of string. And right in the center of the room, a great clumsy writing table an office table, piled with papers again, ledgers, a portable typewriter, and a litter of cigarette ends. Like a mistress on the track of a much-doubted maid, he ran his finger along the edge of a bookcase and then the mantelpiece. He looked at his fingers. There was no denying the dust he had wiped away. She must have changed her room. Why had she done it? But the maid had said, in her sitting-room, he waited, now frightened, now fuming, and still she did not come. Should he not wait? Should he go, if this was her room? But he had come so far, and he needed her so, he must stay. For some dear foolish woman's reason, she must have lent her room for the use of a feminine busybody a political higher thought, pseudo-spiritualistic friend. He must weed out her friends. The trend of the work done in this room, now his quick mind had seized upon it, titles of books, papers, it was enough. Notices stuck in the Venetian mirror, the desecration for meetings of this and that society, and all of them, so he judged, just excuses for putting unwanted fingers into unwanted, dangerous pies. He thought of it like that. He could not help it. He saw too far into motive and internal action, 
was too impatient of the little storms, the paltry teacup things. She, with her unique gift of serenity, her place was not among the busybodies grinding axes that were better blunt, interfering with the slow, slow working of the mills of God. Her gift was example, rare and delicate, her light, the silver light of a soul, that through suffering and patience and contemplation knows itself and is unafraid. For such fussing, unstable work as it was used for now, she ought not even to have lent her room, the room he had looked on as a temple of quietness, the shrine of a priceless temperament. He smiled, his first smile. She would not lend it again. Then the door opened. Suddenly, almost noisily, she came in. She had heard downstairs his name. So far she was prepared with her greeting. She came with hands outstretched. He took her hands and dropped them. When he could interrupt her greeting, he said, forcing the words, So now you are quite strong and busy. She told him how busy. She told him how, but not why, she had awakened from her long selfish dream. She said she had found so late, but surely not too late, the joy of action, constant unremitting work for the world's sake. Do you remember how you used to complain you couldn't sit still? I am like that now. And he listened, listened, each word a deeper stab straight at his defenseless heart. Of all the many things he had done since they met, he had nothing to say. Having just let her talk, how she talked, as soon as he decently could, he went. Of all he had come to tell her, he said not a word. Tired, so bitterly tired, he had come seeking rest, and now there was no more a place of rest for him anywhere. Yes, he had come across the world to find himself overdue, to find himself too late. He went out again, as soon as he decently could, taking only a picture of her that in sixty overcharged minutes had wiped out the treasured picture of years. Sixty minutes! After waiting for years, she had kept him an hour, desperately, by sheer force of will, keeping a man too stunned at first to resist, to break free. Then at last he broke free of that room and that woman, and went. For years he had pictured her sitting still as no other woman sat still, tranquil and graceful, her hair going a little gray above her clear pale skin, her eyes of a dream-ridden saint. And now he must picture her forced into life, vivaciously, restlessly eager, full of plans, futile plans, how he knew those plans, for the world's upheaval, adding unrest to unrest. And now he must picture her with the gray hair outwitted by art, with paint on her beautiful, ravaged face. At first he had wanted to take her in his arms, with his strength to still her, with his tears to wash the paint off. But he couldn't, he couldn't. He knew that his had been a dream of such supreme sweetness that to awaken was an agony he could never hide, knew that you can't re-enter dreamland once you wake. So he went. He never knew, with the door shut on him, how she fell on her sofa, her vivacity quenched, her soul spent. He never knew that having failed, as she thought, to draw him to her with what she was, she had vainly, foolishly, tried a new model, himself. He did not know how inartistic love can be when love is desperate. End of Story 23story 24 of the best british short stories of 1922 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. The Best British Short Stories of 1922 by Various. Story 24. Major Wilbraham by Hugh Walpole. From the Chicago Tribune, 1921. I am quite aware that in giving you this story, just as I was told it, I shall incur the charge of downright and deliberate lying. Especially I shall be told this by any one who knew Wilbraham personally. Wilbraham was not, of course, his real name, but I think that there are certain people who will recognize him from this description of him. I do not know that it matters very much if they do. Wilbraham himself would certainly not mind, did he know. Does he know? It was the thing above all that he wanted those last hours before he died, that I should pass on my conviction of the truth of what he told me to others. What he did not know was that I was not convinced. How could I be? But when the whole comfort of his last hours hung on the simple fact that I was, of course I pretended to the best of my poor ability. I would have done more than that to make him happy. It is precisely the people who knew him well who will declare at once that my little story is impossible. But did they know him well? Does anyone know anyone else well? Aren't we all as lonely and removed from one another as mariners on separate desert islands? In any case, I did not know him well, and perhaps for that very reason was not so greatly surprised at his amazing revelations. Surprised at the revelations themselves, of course, but not at his telling them. There was always in him, and I have known him here and there, loosely in club and London fashion, for nearly twenty years, something romantic and something sentimental. I knew that, because it was precisely those two attributes that he drew out of me. Most men are conscious at some time in their lives of having felt for a member of their own sex an emotion that is something more than simple companionship. It is a queer feeling, quite unlike any other in life, distinctly romantic, and the more that, perhaps, for having no sex feeling in it. Like the love of women, it is felt generally at sight, but unlike that love, it is, I think, a supremely unselfish emotion. It is not acquisitive, nor possessive, nor jealous, and exists best, perhaps, when it is not urged too severely, but is allowed to linger in the background of life, giving real happiness and security and trust, standing out, indeed, as something curiously reliable just because it is so little passionate. This emotion has an odd place in our English life, because the men who feel it, if they have been to public school and university, have served a long training in repressing every sign or expression of sentiment towards any other man. Nevertheless, it persists, romantically and deeply persists, and the War of 1914 offered many curious examples of it. Wilbraham roused just that feeling in me. I remember with the utmost distinctness my first meeting with him. It was just after the Boer War, and old Johnny Beeminster gave a dinner party to some men-pals of his at the Phoenix. Johnny was not so old then. None of us were. It was a short time after the death of that old harpy, the Duchess of Rex, and some wag said that the dinner was in celebration of that happy occasion. Johnny was not so ungracious as that, but he gave us a very merry evening, and he did undoubtedly feel a kind of lightness in the general air. There were about fifteen of us, and Wilbraham was the only man present I had never seen before. He was only a captain then, and neither so red-faced nor so stout as he afterwards became. He was pretty bulky, though, even then, and with his sandy hair cropped close, his staring blue eyes, his toothbrush moustache, and sharp alert movements, looked the typical traditional British officer. 
There was nothing at all to distinguish him from a thousand other officers of his kind, and yet from the moment I saw him I had some especial and personal feeling about him. He was not in type at all the man to whom at that time I should have felt drawn. My first book had just been published, and although, as I now perceive, its publication had not caused the slightest ripple upon any water, the congratulations of my friends and relations, who felt compelled, poor things, to say something, because they had received copies from the author, had made me feel that the literary world was all buzzing at my ears. I could see at a glance that Kipling was probably the only decent author about whom Wilbraham knew anything, and the fragments of his conversation that I caught did not promise anything intellectually exciting from his acquaintanceship. The fact remains that I wanted to know him more than any other man in the room, and although I only exchanged a few words with him that night, I thought of him for quite a long time afterwards. It did not follow from this, as it ought to have done, that we became great friends. That we never were, although it was myself whom he sent for, three days before his death, to tell me his queer little story. It was then, at the very last, that he confided to me that he, too, had felt something at our first meeting, different to what one generally feels, that he had always wanted to turn our acquaintance into friendship and had been too shy. I also was shy, and so we missed one another, as I supposed in this funny, constrained, traditional country of ours, thousands of people miss one another every day. But although I did not see him very often, and was in no way intimate with him, I kept my ears open for any account of his doings. From one point of view, the club window outlook he was a very usual figure, one of those stout, rubicund, jolly men, a good polo player, a good man in a house-party, genial-natured, and none too brilliantly brained, whom every one liked and no one thought about. All this he was, on one side of the report, but on the other there were certain stories that were something more than the ordinary. Wilbraham was obviously a sentimentalist and an enthusiast. There was the extraordinary case, shortly after I first met him, of his championship of X, a man who had been caught in an especially bestial kind of crime and received a year's imprisonment for it. On X leaving prison, Wilbraham championed and defended him, put him up for months in his rooms in Duke Street, walked as often as possible in his company down Piccadilly, and took him over to Paris. It says a great deal for Wilbraham's accepted normality and his general popularity that this championship of X did him no harm. It was so obvious that he himself was the last man in the world to be afflicted with X's peculiar habits. Some men, it is true, did murmur something about birds of a feather. One or two kind friends warned Wilbraham in the way kind friends have, and to them he simply said, if a feller's a pal, he's a pal. All this might, in the end, have done Wilbraham harm had not X most happily committed suicide in Paris in 1905. There followed a year or two later the much more celebrated business of Lady C. I need not go into all that now, but here again Wilbraham constituted himself her defender although she robbed, cheated, and maligned him, as she robbed, cheated, and maligned every one who was good to her. It was quite obvious that he was not in love with her. The obviousness of it was one of the things in him that annoyed her. He simply felt, apparently, that she had been badly treated, the very last thing that she had been, gave her any money he had, put his rooms at the disposal of herself and her friends, and, as I have said, championed her everywhere. This affair did very nearly finish him socially and in his regiment. It was not so much that they minded his caring for Lady C. After all, any man can be fooled by any woman. But it was Lady C.'s friends who made the whole thing so impossible. Such a crew! 
such a horrible crew. And it was a queer thing to see Wilbraham with his straight blue eyes and innocent mouth and general air of amiable simplicity in the company of men like Colonel B. and young Kenneth Parr. There is no harm, considering the later publicity of his case, in mentioning his name. Well, that affair luckily came to an end just in time. Lady C. disappeared to Berlin and was no more seen. There were other cases into which I need not go when Wilbraham was seen in strange company, always championing somebody who was not worth the championing. He had no social tact, and for them at any rate no moral sense. In himself he was the ordinary normal man about town, no prude, but straight as a man can be in his debts, his love affairs, his friendships, and his sport. Then came the war. He did brilliantly at Mons, was wounded twice, went out to Gallipoli, had a touch of Palestine, and returned to France again to share in Foch's final triumph. No man can possibly have had more of the war than he had, and it is my own belief that he had just a little too much of it. He had been always perhaps a little queer, as we are most of us queer somewhere, and the horrors of that horrible war undoubtedly affected him. Finally he lost, just a week before the armistice, one of his best friends, Ross McLean, a loss from which he certainly never recovered. I have now, I think, brought together all the incidents that can throw any kind of light upon the final scene. In the middle of 1919 he retired from the army, and it was from this time to his death that I saw something of him. He went back to his old home at Horton's in Duke Street, and as I was living at that time in Marlborough Chambers in German Street, we were in easy reach of one another. The early part of 1920 was a queer time. People had become, I imagined, pretty well accustomed to realizing that those two wonderful hours of Armistice Day had not ushered in the millennium any more than those first marvelous moments of the Russian Revolution produced it. Everyone has always hoped for the millennium, but the trouble since the days of Adam and Eve has always been that people have such different ideas as to what exactly that millennium shall be. The plain facts of the matter simply were that during 1919 and 1920 the world changed from a war of nations to a war of classes, that inevitable change that history has always shown follows on great wars. As no one ever reads history, it was natural enough that there should be a great deal of disappointment and a great deal of astonishment. Men at the head of affairs who ought to have known better cried aloud, How ungrateful these people are after all we've done for them! And the people underneath shouted that everything had been muddled and spoiled, and that they would have done much better had they been at the head of affairs, an assertion for which there was no sort of justification. Wilbraham, being a sentimentalist and an idealist, suffered more from this general disappointment than most people. He had had wonderful relations with the men under him throughout the war. He had never tired of recounting how marvelously they had behaved, what heroes they were, and that it was they who would pull the country together. At the same time, he had a naive horror of Bolshevism and anything unconstitutional, and he watched the transformation of his brave lads into discontented and idle workmen with dismay and deep distress. He used sometimes to come around to my rooms and talk to me. He had the bewildered air of a man walking in his sleep. He made the fatal mistake of reading all the papers, and he took in the Daily Herald in order that he might see what it was these fellows had to say for themselves. The Herald upset him terribly. Its bland assumption that Russians and Shane Feiners could do no wrong, but that the slightest sign of assertion of authority on the part of any government was wicked tyranny, shocked his very soul. 
I remember that he wrote a long, most earnest letter to Lansbury, pointing out to him that if he subverted all authority and constitutional government, his own party would in its turn be subverted when it came to govern. Of course, he received no answer. During these months I came to love the man. The attraction that I had felt for him from the very first, deeply, underlay all my relation to him. But as I saw more of him, I found many very positive reasons for my liking. He was the simplest, bravest, purest, most loyal and most unselfish soul alive. He seemed to me to have no faults at all, unless it were a certain softness towards the wishes of those whom he loved. He could not bear to hurt anybody, but he never hesitated if some principle in which he believed was called in question. He had not, of course, a subtle mind. He was no analyst of character, but that did not make him uninteresting. I never heard any one call him dull company, although men laughed at him for his good nature and unselfishness and traded on him all the time. He was the best human being I have ever known or am ever likely to know. Well, the crisis arrived with astonishing suddenness. About the second or third of August I went down to stay with some friends at the little fishing village of Raphael in Glebeshire. I saw him just before I left London, and he told me that he was going to stay in London for the first half of August, that he liked London in August, even though his club would be closed and Horton's delivered over to the painters. I heard nothing about him for a fortnight, and then I received a most extraordinary letter from Box Hamilton, a fellow clubman of mine and Wilbraham's. Had I heard, he said, that poor old Wilbraham had gone right off his knocker? Nobody knew exactly what had happened, but suddenly, one day at lunchtime, Wilbraham had turned up at Gray's, the club to which our own club was a visitor during its cleaning, had harangued everyone about religion in the most extraordinary way, had burst out from there and started shouting in Piccadilly had, after collecting a crowd, disappeared and not been seen until the next morning, when he had been found, nearly killed, after a hand-to-hand -hand fight with the market men in Covent Garden. It may be imagined how deeply this disturbed me, especially as I felt that I was myself to blame. I had noticed that Wilbraham was ill when I had seen him in London, and I should either have persuaded him to come with me to Glebeshire, or stayed with him in London. I was just about to pack up and go to town when I received a letter from a doctor in a nursing home in South Audley Street saying that a certain Major Wilbraham was in the home dying and asking persistently for myself. I took a motor to Drymouth and was in London by five o'clock. I found the South Audley Street nursing home and was at once surrounded with the hush the shaded rooms, the sense of medicine and flowers, and some undefinable cleanliness that belongs to those places. I waited in a little room, the walls decorated with sporting prints, the green-beige table gloomily laden with volumes of Punch and the Tatler. Wilbraham's doctor came in to see me, a dapper, smart little man, efficient and impersonal. He told me that Wilbraham had, at most, only twenty-four hours to live, that his brain was quite clear, and that he was suffering very little pain, that he had been brutally kicked in the stomach by some man in the Covent Garden crowd, and had there received the internal injuries from which he was now dying. His brain is quite clear, the doctor said. Let him talk. It can do him no harm. Nothing can save him. His head is full of queer fancies. He wants everyone to listen to him. He's worrying because there's some message he wants to send. He wants to give it to you. When I saw Wilbraham, he was so little changed that I felt no shock. Indeed, the most striking change in him was the almost exultant happiness in his voice and eyes. It is true that after talking to him a little I knew that he was dying. He had that strange peace and tranquillity of mind that one saw so often with dying men in the war. 
I will try to give an exact account of Wilbraham's narrative. Nothing else is of importance in this little story but that narrative. I can make no comment. I have no wish to do so. I only want to pass it on as he begged me to do. If you don't believe me, he said, give other people the chance of doing so. I know that I am dying. I want as many men and women to have a chance of judging this as is humanly possible. I swear to you that I am telling the truth, and the exact truth in every detail. I began my account by saying that I was not convinced. How could I be convinced? At the same time, I have none of those explanations with which people are so generously forthcoming on these occasions. I can only say that I do not think Wilbraham was insane, nor drunk, nor asleep, nor do I believe that someone played a practical joke. Whether Wilbraham was insane between the hours when his visitor left him and his entrance into the nursing home, I must leave to my readers. I myself think he was not. After all, everything depends upon the relative importance that we place upon ambitions, possessions, emotions, ideas. Something suddenly became of so desperate an importance to Wilbraham that nothing else at all mattered. He wanted everyone else to see the importance of it as he did. That is all. It had been a hot and oppressive day. London had seemed torrid and uncomfortable. The mere fact that Oxford Street was up annoyed him. After a slight meal in his flat, he went to the promenade concert at Queen's Hall. It was the second night of the season, Monday night, Wagner night. He bought himself a five-shilling ticket and sat in the middle of the balcony overlooking the floor. He was annoyed again when he discovered that he had been given a ticket for the non-smoking section of the balcony. He had heard no Wagner since August 1914, and was anxious to discover the effect that hearing it again would have upon him. The effect was disappointing. The music neither caught nor held him. The Meistersinger had always been a great opera for him. The third-act music that Sir Henry Wood gave to him didn't touch him anywhere. He also discovered that six years' abstinence had not enraptured him any more deeply with the rushing fiddles in the Tannhäuser Overture, nor with the spinning music in the Flying Dutchman. Then came suddenly the prelude to the third act of Tristan. That caught him. The peace and tranquillity that he needed lapped him round. He was fully satisfied, and could have listened for another hour. He walked home down Regent Street, the quiet melancholy of the shepherd's pipe accompanying him, pleasing him and tranquilizing him. As he reached his flat, ten o'clock struck from St. James' Church. He asked the porter whether anyone had wanted him during his absence, whether anyone was waiting for him now. Some friend had told him that he might come up and use his spare room one night that week. No, no one had been. There was no one there waiting. Great was his surprise, therefore, when, opening the door of his flat, he found someone standing there, one hand resting on the table, his face turned towards the open door. Stronger, however, than Wilbraham's surprise was his immediate conviction that he knew his visitor well, and this was curious because the face was undoubtedly strange to him. I beg your pardon, Wilbraham said to him, hesitating. I wanted to see you, the stranger said, smiling. When Wilbraham was telling me this part of his story, he seemed to be enveloped. Enveloped is the word that best conveys my own experience of him, by some quite radiant happiness. He smiled at me confidentially, as though he were telling me something that I had experienced with him and that must give me the same happiness that it gave to him. "'Ought I to have expected? Ought I to have known?' he stammered. Oh "'No, you couldn't have known,' the stranger answered. "'You're not late. I knew when you would come.' 
Wilbraham told me that during these moments he was surrendering himself to an emotion and intimacy and companionship that was the most wonderful thing that he had ever known. It was that intimacy and companionship, he told me, for which all his days he had been searching. It was the one thing that life never seemed to give. Even in the greatest love, the deepest friendship, there was that seed of loneliness hidden. He had never found it in man or woman. Now it was so wonderful that the first thing he said was, And now you're going to stay, aren't you? You won't go away at once. Of course I'll stay, he answered, if you want me. His visitor was dressed in some dark suit. There was nothing about him in any way odd or unusual. His face was thin and pale, his smile kindly. His English was without accent. His voice was soft and very melodious. But Wilbraham could notice nothing but his eyes. They were the most beautiful, tender, gentle eyes that he had ever seen in any human being. They sat down. Wilbraham's overwhelming fear was lest his guest should leave him. They began to talk, and Wilbraham took it at once as accepted that his friend knew all about him, everything. He found himself eagerly plunging into details of scenes, episodes that he had long put behind him, put behind him for shame, perhaps, or for regret, or for sorrow. He knew at once that there was nothing that he need veil nor hide, nothing. He had no sense that he must consider susceptibilities nor avoid self-confession that was humiliating. But he did find, as he talked on, a sense of shame from another side creep towards him and begin to enclose him. Shame at the smallness, meanness, emptiness of the things that he declared. He had had always behind his mistakes and sins a sense that he was a rather unusually interesting person. If only his friends knew everything about him, they would be surprised at the remarkable man that he really was. Now it was exactly the opposite sense that came over him. In the gold-rimmed mirror that was over his mantelpiece, he saw himself diminishing, diminishing, diminishing. First himself, large, red-faced, smiling, rotund, lying back in his chair. Then the face shriveling, the limbs shortening. Then the face small and peaked, the hands and legs little and mean. Then the chair enormous about and around the little trembling animal cowering against the cushion. He sprang up. No, 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 I can't tell you any more, and you've known it all so long. I am mean, small, nothing. I have not even great ambition. Nothing. His guest stood up and put his hand on his shoulder. They talked, standing side by side, and he said some things that belonged to Wilbraham alone that he would not tell me. Wilbraham asked him why he had come and to him. I will come now to a few of my friends, he said, first one and then another. Many people have forgotten me behind my words. They have built up such a mountain over me with the doctrines they have attributed to me, the things that they say that I did. I am not really, he said laughing, his hand on Wilbraham's shoulder, so dull and gloomy and melancholy as they have made me. I loved life. I loved men. I loved laughter and games and the open air. I liked jokes and good food and exercise, all things that they have forgotten. So from now I shall come back to one or two. I am lonely when they see me so solemnly. Another thing he said, they are making life complicated now. To lead a good life, to be happy, to manage the world, only the simplest things are needed. Love, unselfishness, tolerance. Can I go with you and be with you always? Wilbraham asked. Do you really want that? he said. Yes, said Wilbraham, bowing his head. Then you shall come and never leave me again. 
in three days from now. Then he kissed Wilbraham on the forehead and went away. I think that Wilbraham himself became conscious, as he told me this part of his story, of the difference between the seen and remembered figure and the foolish inadequate reported words. Even now, as I repeat a little of what Wilbraham said, I feel the virtue and power slipping away. And so it goes on. As the figure recedes, the words become colder and colder, and the air that surrounds them has in it less and less of power. But on that day, when I sat beside Wilbraham's bed, the conviction in his voice and eyes held me so that although my reason kept me back, my heart told me that he had been in contact with some power that was a stronger force than anything that I myself had ever known. But I have determined to make no personal comment on this story. I am here simply as a narrator of fact. Wilbraham told me that after his visitor left him, he sat there for some time in a dream. Then he sat up, startled, as though some voice, calling, had wakened him with an impulse that was like a fire suddenly blazing up and lighting the dark places of his brain. I imagine that all Wilbraham's impulses in the past, chivalric, idealistic, foolish, had been of that kind, sudden, of an almost ferocious energy and determination, blind to all consequences. He must go out at once and tell everyone of what had happened to him. I once read a story somewhere about some town that was expecting a great visitor. Everything was ready, the banners hanging, the music prepared, the crowds waiting in the street. A man, who had once been for some years at the court of the expected visitor, saw him enter the city, somberly clad, on foot. Meanwhile his chamberlain entered the town in full panoply, with the trumpets blowing and many riders in attendance. The man who knew the real thing ran to every one, telling the truth, but they laughed at him and refused to listen, and the real king departed quietly, as he had come. It was, I suppose, an influence of this kind that drove Wilbraham now. Suddenly something was of so great an importance to him that nothing else, mockery, hostility, scorn, counted. After all, simply a supreme example of the other impulses that had swayed him throughout his life. What followed might, I think, have been to some extent averted, had his appearance been different. London is a home of madmen, and casually permits any lunacy, so that public peace is not endangered. Had poor Wilbraham looked a fanatic with pale face, long hair, ragged clothes, much would have been forgiven him, but for a stout, middle-aged gentleman, well-dressed, well-groomed, what could be supposed but insanity, and insanity of a very ludicrous kind? He put on his coat and went out. From this moment his account was confused. His mind, as he spoke to me, kept returning to that visitor. What happened after his friend's departure was vague and uncertain to him largely because it was unimportant. He does not know what time it was when he went out, but I gather that it must have been about midnight. There were still people in Piccadilly. Somewhere near the Barclay Hotel he stopped a gentleman and a lady. He spoke, I am sure, so politely that the man he addressed must have supposed that he was asking for a match, or an address, or something of the kind. Wilbraham told me that, very quietly, he asked the gentleman whether he might speak to him for a moment, that he had something very important to say. That he would not, as a rule, dream of interfering in any man's private affairs, but that the importance of his communication outweighed all ordinary conventions. That he expected that the gentleman had hitherto, as had been his own case, felt much doubt about religious questions, but that now all doubt was once and forever over, that I expect that at that fatal word religion the gentleman started as though he had been stung by a snake, 
felt that this mild-looking man was a dangerous lunatic and tried to move away. It was the lady with him, so far as I can discover, who cried out, Oh, poor man, he's ill, and wanted at once to do something for him. By this time a crowd was beginning to collect, and as the crowd closed around the central figures, more people gathered upon the outskirts, and, peering through, wondered what had happened, whether there was an accident, whether it were a drunk, whether there had been a quarrel, and so on. Wilbraham, I fancy, began to address them all, telling them his great news, begging them with desperate urgency to believe him. Some laughed, some stared in wide-eyed wonder, the crowd was increasing, and then, of course, the inevitable policeman, with his move on, please, appeared. How deeply I regret that Wilbraham was not there and then arrested. He would be alive and with us now if that had been done. But the policeman hesitated. I suppose to arrest anyone as obviously a gentleman as Wilbraham, a man, too, as he soon perceived, who was perfectly sober, even though he was not in his right mind. Wilbraham was surprised at the policeman's interference. He said that the last thing that he wished to do was to create any disturbance, but that he could not bear to let all these people go to their beds without giving them a chance of realizing first that everything was now altered, that he had the most wonderful news. The crowd was dispersed, and Wilbraham found himself walking alone with the policeman beside the Green Park. He must have been a very nice policeman, because before Wilbraham's death he called at the nursing home, and was very anxious to know how the poor gentleman was getting on. He allowed Wilbraham to talk to him, and then did all he could to persuade him to walk home and go to bed. He offered to get him a taxi. Wilbraham thanked him, said he would do so, and bade him good night, and the policeman, seeing that Wilbraham was perfectly composed and sober, left him. After that the narrative is more confused. Wilbraham apparently walked down Knightsbridge and arrived at last somewhere near the Albert Hall. He must have spoken to a number of different people. One man, a politician apparently, was with him for a considerable time, but only because he was so anxious to emphasize his own views about the coalition government and the wickedness of Lloyd George. Another was a journalist who continued with him for a while because he scented a story for his newspaper. Some people may remember that there was a garbled paragraph about a religious army officer in the daily record. One lady thought that Wilbraham wanted to go home with her, and was both angry and relieved when she found that it was not so. He stayed at a cabman's shelter for a time and drank a cup of coffee and told the little gathering there his news. They took it very calmly. They had met so many queer things in their time that nothing seemed odd to them. His account becomes clearer again when he found himself a little before dawn in the park and in the company of a woman and a broken-down pugilist. I saw both these persons afterwards and had some talk with them. The pugilist had only the vaguest sense of what had happened. Wilbraham was a proper old bird, and had given him half a crown to get his breakfast with. They had all slept together under a tree, and he had made some rather voluble protests because the other two would talk so continuously, and prevented his sleeping. It was a warm night, and the sun had come up behind the trees surprise and quick. He had liked the old boy, especially as he had given him half a crown. The woman was another story. She was quiet and reserved, dressed in black, with a neat little black hat with a green feather in it. She had yellow fluffy hair and bright childish blue eyes and a simple innocent expression. She spoke very softly and almost in a whisper. So far as I could discover, she could see nothing odd in Wilbraham nor in anything that he had said. She was the one person in all the world who had understood him completely and found nothing out of the way in his talk. She had liked him at once, she said, 
I could see that he was kind," she added earnestly, as though to her that was the most important thing in all the world. No, his talk had not seemed odd to her. She had believed every word that he had said. Why not? You could not look at him and not believe what he said. Of course, it was true. And why not? What was there against it? It had been a great help for her, what the gentleman had told her. Yes, and he had gone to sleep with his head in her lap, and she had stayed awake all night thinking, and he had waked up just in time to see the sunrise. Some sunrise that was, too. That was a curious little fact that all three of them, even the battered pugilist, should have been so deeply struck by that sunrise. Wilbraham, on the last day of his life, when he hovered between consciousness and unconsciousness, kept recalling it as though it had been a vision. The sun and the trees suddenly green and bright like glittering swords, all shapes, swords, plowshares, elephants, and camels, and the sky pale like ivory. See, now the sun is rushing up, faster than ever, to take us with him, up, up, leaving the trees like green clouds beneath us, far, far beneath us. The woman said that it was the finest sunrise she had ever seen. He talked to her all the time about his plans. He was looking disheveled now and unshaven and dirty. She suggested that he should go back to his flat. No, he wished to waste no time. Who knew how long he had got? It might be only a day or two. He would go to Covent Garden and talk to the men there. She was confused as to what happened after that. When they got to the market, the carts were coming in, and men were very busy. She saw the gentleman speak to one of them very earnestly, but he was busy and pushed him aside. He spoke to another, who told him to clear out. Then he jumped on to a box, and almost the last sight she had of him was his standing there in his soiled clothes, a streak of mud on his face, his arms outstretched and crying, It's true! Stop just a moment! You must hear me! Someone pushed him off the box. The pugilist rushed in then, cursing them, and saying that the man was a gentleman and had given him half a crown, and then some hulking great fellow fought the pugilist, and there was a regular melee. Wilbraham was in the middle of them, was knocked down and trampled upon. No one meant to hurt him, I think. They all seemed very sorry afterwards. He died two days after being brought into the nursing home. He was very happy just before he died, pressed my hand, and asked me to look after the girl. Isn't it wonderful, were his last words to me, that it should be true after all? As to truth, who knows? Truth is a large order. This is true, as far as Wilbraham goes, every word of it. Beyond that, well, it must be jolly to be so happy as Wilbraham was. This will seem a lying story to some, a silly and pointless story to others. I wonder. End of Story 24 End of The Best British Short Stories of 1922 by Various